What time are we starting, Pankaj? Pankaj, yes. we have to start in time. Yes, sir. Nine we start in five, nine o'clock. Nine o'clock we start, but the program, the scientific program will start by 9.15. Yes. Yeah. So the initial introduction, everything will start at nine o'clock. Okay? Yes, sir. I'll wind up fast. I always have one minute. So the one personal question, eh? you had such a beautiful hair. Why you chopped it off? During, during lockdown, it was such a... Yeah, it was coming in the way of my uh, surgeries. Okay. I had to cut it. That's all. They are playing it. I know. Uh -huh. You can play it non copyright. Mm -hmm. Okay. Manisha, you tell us the exact time. What is the time? Huh? Manisha. Hello. Yeah. Please let us know what is the exact time because it might be different here and different there. So exact time we should know. We should uh, start the introductions by 9.5. Okay. So how many minutes we have? We have uh, seven minutes. Ten minutes. Seven minutes or ten minutes? If we are starting at nine five, it's eight fifty eight right now. Okay, fine. Fifty eight. So you give us the countdown, okay? Sure. So uh, Rishikesh, after. And the yes. plan would be first I will uh, introduce, I will uh, welcome, okay? okay, I will not introduce, I will welcome everybody, welcome the moderators and the uh, speakers, I will welcome the uh, uh, MMC observer and then uh, Dr. Pankaj will introduce our moderators Okay. and then uh, you have to... Uh, uh, then it will be the Saraswati Vandana and uh, then you uh, invite each moderator to uh, introduce the speaker. Okay. Suppose the speaker is not around, then you'll have to take uh, him uh, after he comes. Okay, Conti uh, Start the other speaker if he's ready. So okay. please send them messages okay. that your session is going to start. Manisha, you'll have to... Uh, Send a message to all the speakers and moderators that the session will start at 9.15, first sure. session. Sure. Manisha, are you there? Yes, Hello. sir. I'm here. I heard you. Yeah, so please send the messages of the speakers and moderators of the first session. That the session would be starting by 9.15, sharp. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. That you have given to 
ठीक है हाय वर्णन सुरेश यू आर लुकिंग नाइस एंड वेल फेड नाउ थैंक यू नो आई हैव टू सिट हियर होल डे लिसनिंग टू यू एंजॉय लिसनिंग टू यू यस Uh, who is the first presenting? Uh, Dr. Matthew Abraham. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Mishra has also joined us. Ha ha ha. Okay, that's very nice. Hello, sir. Good morning, Matthew. Yeah, morning. Morning, Matthew. Morning, sir. Ah, uh, all well. Hello. Hello. Yeah, all well. Yeah, am I am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm fine. Good. You are opening batsman. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing your opening. I'm doing the Manisha give us a countdown when to start in 1 minute sir okay so tell give us a countdown
dinner today. So. अभी चेक मत करा चालू It should start now. Should I start? Give yes, me the please. countdown. Yes, please. And you have recorded, started recording? Yes, sir. Should I wait for a countdown or should I start? You start, sir. Okay. Good morning, dear friends. On the behalf of Department of Neurosurgery, the NSSA, MCNS, the BNSA, and the Goa Association of Neurological Surgeons, I welcome you all to this unique session called as the Cranial and the Spinal Operative Video Sessions. So we have lined up a galaxy of uh, many stars today, including the speakers and the moderators, who would be sharing to you the different operative procedures in cranial as well as spinal surgery. And they would be also discussing their techniques and their styles of uh, the surgical procedures. I'd like to welcome our speakers, the line of speakers today. We have around 22 speakers who would be showing their various techniques. And I also like to welcome our moderators who are our senior faculty neurosurgeons who would be introduced later by Pankaj Jha. I also like to welcome our MMC observer for today, Dr. Rahul Chakor, who is the MMC observer. And the MMC has uh, given us two credit hours for the CME program. So without any, wasting any time, I like to invite Septalis Pankaj Jha to introduce our moderators for the day. Over to you, Pankaj. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, good morning, all of you. So it has been it is second of the year of our program. I have we are doing this operative program. I would like to thank all the faculty members and delegate those who are joining us today at the cranial spinal operative video session seminar. So it is kind of overwhelming so having such eminent faculty across the globe at such platform all together, and impossible for me all the time to do justice to <clears throat> talk about them in such a such a span small span of time. So still, I'll try my level best to do justice, whatever time I have got. Today, we have Dr. B.K. Mishra, sir, Chairman of WFNS Foundation, Chief of Surgery, Hinduja Hospital. Dr. K.K. Turel, Chairman, WFNS Committee on Complication Neurosurgery. Dr. Harshad Parekh, sir, Consultant Neurosurgeon, HL Hospital and Nanavati Hospital and Saifi. Dr. Arvind Natelkar, Consultant Neurosurgeon, Manipal Goa Hospital. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Medica Vice Chairman Rachi, Dr. Selvan Rajendra, Professor HOD Kanyakumari Government Medical College, Dr. Deepak Kumar Singh, Professor and Head of Department Neurosurgery, Ram Manohar Loya Lucknow, Dr. Amit Ghosh, Consultant Neurosurgeon, Institute of Neuroscience, Kolkata, Dr. Sain Sudarshan, Neurosurgeon, Pulse Hospital, Rachi, Dr. Alok Sharma, Director, Neuro Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute, Dr. C. Dev Pujari, Professor and Head Neurosurgery, Bombay Hospital. Dr. Santos Lart, Senior Consultant, Neurosurgeon, Muscat, Private Hospital, Muscat. Dr. Anil Karpurkar, Former Professor, Neurosurgery, KEMH, GSMS, Endovascular, NSBC, Mumbai. Dr. Rahul Mali, Consultant, Neurosurgery, NMC Hospital, Abu Dhabi, UAE. Dr. Nitin Range, Cons Cons Consult Neurosurgeon, Leela Vati. And I guess Dr. D.A. Palande, I don't have his more credentials, so I'm not saying Dr. D.A. Palande sir is there with us as a moderator and Dr. Ramin, uh, Ramandim Dang sir from Delhi. These are the, these people are there with us as a moderator for today's program and I would like Manisha to continue from here on. Sure. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, the VP of Septilis to say a few words. Mr. Shyam Sundar. Is he around? Is to just Hello. Pankaj, is he around? 
y es Well, if he's not around, then I think uh, we shall move on with the scientific session. We will. Uh, so we uh, still but... yet to do the Saraswati Vanna. <coughs> yes. So we will be we will be doing it now. Okay, and then yeah. I will hand over the session to to start the session to our associate professor, Dr. Rishikesh Karosekar, and Dr. Harish Naik, who would be handling the show. So uh, please go ahead with the Saraswati Vandana before Dr. Rishikesh takes over and introduces the first session. Yeah. Singh Sundar is there, so we can just have a few words from him before we start the program. Sham, over to you. He's the VP of Septilist who is supporting this program today. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Benjamin Franklin has rightly said that investment in education is the best, pays you the best interest. And I must appreciate and congratulate everyone present today that we have decided to devote and invest this Sunday to the cause of education. I would like to thank the organizing committee, Dr. Vernon Mello, Dr. Rishike, Dr. Harish, for giving us this opportunity to become part of this great academic event. 
I would like to thank all the delegates who have taken out their valuable time on this Sunday for their gracious presence and making this, making this adding vibrancy to this event. I am Sham Sundar Singh, MD and CEO of Septless Life Sciences. It's a Mumbai-based super specialty company focusing on nephrology, neurology, and critical care. Just a brief about the company. We are ranked among the top five nephrology companies of India. In neurology, we are relatively new, but it's a matter of great pride pleasure to share with you all that we have been awarded as the fastest growing company in neurology segment for the year 1920 at the Times Healthcare and Leadership Award. As a company, we are dedicated towards quality and innovation. We are one of the few companies which have full-fledged R&D setup and we are working aggressively in nephrology and neuro segment. In the last two years, we have filed nine patents in both these segments. We have already been granted five patents, including two patents in the new CNS segment. The first one is Cobacar, which is a unique combination of L-carnosine and Jingo biloba, which is supposed to be very effective in post-stroke recovery. The second product is a unique combination of neurospecific bacterial strains or probiotic strains, which, is, which are very effective in reducing anxiety, stress, and depression. So it's our commitment that will bring a lot of new products. We are seriously working on R&D in these two specific fields. We as a company are very dedicated towards the cause of education and we are committed towards medical fraternity. Any kind of educational program, academic event, awareness campaign, you can count on us. We'll be there. We will never disappoint you. It's my commitment to the fraternity. This event for the second consecutive year is happening online. I hope and I wish that from next year, we will have this event offline in a face-to-face -face mode. And it's our commitment. We'll be there as, and we'll continue taking this lineage forward. In the end, once again, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. And I must thank all the delegates once again for gracing this occasion, gracing this event with your magnanimous presence. And thank you, Dr. Vernon Mello, once again. With these words, I will pass on the virtual stage back to you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sham Sundar. And now over to Dr. Rishikesh to start the scientific session. We are right in time, 9.15. So please go ahead and start the scientific session. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I welcome all the moderators and speakers to this wonderful video webinar. And I would like to invite uh, BK Mishra, sir, uh, head of department of neurosurgery and uh, radi gamma uh, radio surgery at PD Induja Hospital to introduce the first speaker of the session, which will be a cranial session. We have divided this into two cranial sessions and sp two spinal sessions. So over to you, uh, BK Mishra, sir. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Vernon, for this uh, outstanding meeting. You've been doing tremendous amount of work and the pandemic actually has not stopped the education program uh, all over the world, as well as in Mumbai and India. Um, Congratulations for getting all these people on board. And let's start without further delay. Uh, the, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Matthew Abraham, Professor of Neurosurgery at the uh, Institute of National Importance, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Sciences and Technology, Trivandrum. Um, he's a gifted surgeon. Uh, and I think he joined after I left Sri Chitra, so I actually have not seen him operating, but I know from my colleagues and friends that he is a fantastic surgeon and does all kinds of very complex surgery. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, and call Matthew to talk about uh, cerebral 
arterial venous malformation microsurgery. Matthew, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. You are a motivation for us all. Uh, first of all, um, let me thank the organizers, particularly Dr. Vernon, for giving me this opportunity and for conceptualizing this unique and wonderful academic feast. I hope my screen is visible. Uh, I shall be demonstrating the surgery. No, 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 no your screen is not visible. Your screen is not visible. I cannot see your screen. I don't know whether others can see it. Anybody can see the screen? No, no, yeah, now no. it's coming. Yeah, now it's coming. Now it's coming. It's yeah. come. Okay. Go ahead, Matthew. We can yeah. hear you. We can see I should be demonstrating the surgery of five different high grade aviums. Um, each of them have a different degree of difficulty and location. The first is uh, SM grade three AVM. Matthew, we can't uh, see. This your is screen. a basic frontal AVM, grade three. A nidus, compact nidus of 4.5 centimeters size, deep venous plane is through the ambient cistern into the vein of the Your screen is gone. Your screen is again gone. You have to say that your screen, it came and it went away. Yes, sir. We can hear you, but I don't see at least your screen. It did come once. Yeah, now it come again. Yes. Now it's come. Go ahead. Okay. The video is playing. Yeah. Now this is the... Uh, a basic frontal labium, a grade 3, the nidus of 4.5, deep venous drainage into the uh, vein of Gyalin. Uh, this patient had presented with a single episode of a bleed, and the radiologist has pointed out also yeah, that the there timer is a comes. Uh, 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 yeah, Vernon, the timer comes over it. I think that's the problem. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, actually, the first step, I am uh, exposing the ACOM, ACOM artery aneurysm. I'm just... My purpose is only to see it. I have just removed the, uh, the gyrus rectus. This is the ACOM. It is an unplanned ACOM. The entire AVM is actually lateral to the uh, olfactory nerve and is fed almost exclusively by the ACOM, by the uh, ACA. However, there is steel from the MCA as well as from the opposite uh, ACA. These are some feeders which seem to be coming from the MCA side actually. This AVM, if you see, is confined to the basal region and it has feeders from two different directions. One from the base as well as one from the medial surface. The first step is to disconnect the, uh, the base from lateral. The AVMs, most AVMs are actually segmental. They have uh, uh, multiple arterial feeders uh, and sometimes these feeders may share the same common uh, venous outflow. So it's, particular, it's particularly important to remember to disconnect the arteries and to keep off from the veins. Uh, now the AVM is being dissected off the olfactory nerve. You can see most of it is lateral. I mean, uh, the entire AVM is lateral to the olfactory nerve. So we have actually reached, disconnect the whole lateral aspect and we've reached the, um, the medial aspect. And these are the last feeders arising in the medial and now we are left with the, um, yeah, we are left with the draining vein. The draining vein has now collapsed. This is actually a quite a large draining vein going through the, as you have seen the angiogram, going into the vein of Gallen through the ambient cistern. This has been secured with a clip, coagulated and divided. Now we have the aneurysm left. The AVM is out. Probably the brain is a little more pliable and easier to handle with the AVM out. And we have the echomartry aneurysm here.
the the comments again matthew is matthew again gone is gone the your video is gone again Oof. has it reappeared yeah yeah it's reappeared we went up to the aneurysm uh, yeah now we are seeing everything yeah you clipped the aneurysm we can see that one yes yeah i just clipped the aneurysm and uh, we um, can see the olfactory is preserved this is a immediate post op scan this is a 25 year old fellow he had just one episode of bleed not from the aneurysm only from the avm the bleed was particularly small childhood seizures in his childhood this is the immediate post op scan and um my policy is to take an angiogram in the same sitting uh, in the before the patient is discharged the patient did not have any residual this 12 year old boy sorry this 12 year old boy had refractory seizures he did not have a bleed refractory seizures with sensory aura and falls an electrical ox sensation followed by a fall lag good function is still in the left hemisphere It's an SM grade three uh, um, uh, in the eloquent with a lesion that is around four and a half centimeters in size, mainly fed by the PCA. However, there is some steel from the MCA also. So you can see this is the AVM. This is a, a reasonably high flow eloquent area one. The language is some aspects of the language are nearby. This is on the parasite. This craniotomy is on the parasitary surface. Majority of the AVM is on the parasitical area, so it's not in the main language area. But however, some subtle language functions remain there. The overlap is mainly on the sensory uh, gyri, and this patient has sensory seizures. Again, as in the last case, one of the principles of AVM surgery is to tackle one face of the AVM, one and one side of the AVM first, make it mobile, turn it over. there must be constant geometric progression as you tackle you must have greater and greater control on the avm and uh, one should in one should have a combination of micro as well as a macro approach when it comes to a grade 3 avm most of them will have multiple uh, arterial supplies and it will reach two surfaces of the brain most probably now when compared to the last avm this is actually on the eloquent and on the convexity surface technically it can seem easier but the challenge here is to keep very close to the avm you cannot do any uh, adventure outside because the uh, eloquent gray matter as well as white matter is all around there's a fine glyotic plane uh, a fine grayish plane not often glyotic sometimes it's abnormal cortex also very much around the avm we have done uh, histopathological as well as uh, molecular studies from around an avm we have found that there's a lot of gray matter abnormal gray matter which is a potential seizurogenic area around avms now we can see we have gone across and we have reached the uh, surface of the fox so one whole side is controlled and now the medial part is being disconnected an avm shrinks as we remove and very often the amount of cortex and white matter that is likely to be injured is significantly less than what we predict on a pre op scan even if you remove flush to an eloquent area most often you may not have any deficit You can see there is some surprise bleed from one of the feeders from the MCA side. The AVM has been disconnected. This patient became seizure free. This is a little bit of a fistulous, uh, abnormal looking area that is being removed. the hemostasis has been achieved
the patient became seizure free and there was no residual area. You can see the large feeders which are remaining cut off here. This is the third case. This is a 38 year old housewife. She had multiple episodes of small bleed. The needles were 64 millimeters in size. There was deep venous drainage and there was overlap with the sensory cortex. The patient had uh, an aborted embolization due to bleed. We, at the very early stage of the embolization, the patient had a bleed. She had sensory deficits and a superior quadrant anopia. You can see that there is steel from all other vessels, even from the opposite side. Every arterial territory seems to be uh, supplying this in the form of a steel. Now, this is a very turgid area. I would have loved to have it embolized partially, but the bleed had aborted the embolization and not keen on another attempt. So this grade five AVMs are uh, reasonably hard work. We have a very extensive surface to dissect. And a fine technique in the early stage of surgery is absolutely essential because if you produce a bleed in this early stage, it will become a, a very effortful thing. So the, the of all AVMs, for a grade five AVM, extensive uh, arachnoid dissection is a must, as the larger feeders have to be disconnected initially. Now, uh, a constant effort to mobilize the AVM should be there. The larger feeders. Now, this is actually on the parasitical, more towards the tendorial surface. I mean, the surface of the parasitical region. And an arachnoid knife is very useful. It reduces your strain of arachnoid dissection. It can be moved in either direction that, uh, uh, and has some advantages over a uh, insulin needle. So the lateral aspect is being disconnected now. This is one of the larger, larger feeders. Many of these larger feeders do not get coagulated very easily. Sometimes they may only coagulate partially and may require recoagulation after uh, partial cutting. In such circumstances, a prior clipping is useful. You can see it is not easily occluding. I have a feeling that one should be liberal in using a fenurism clips during AVM uh, uh, resections. This is a fine glyphotic plane. This AVM is a very thick AVM. It's uh, one dimension is 64 millimeters, another dimension is around 54 millimeters, and the third dimension is again around 50 millimeters. We have reached the fox. This principle actually holds. We have mobilized one side and now we have reached the other surface of the avium. And this is one of the larger PCA feeders into the avium. And now there is some venous coagulation. We have mobilized most of it. The veins have become blue. However, there is one large drainage vein to the uh, superior cervical sinus, which is still preserved. A great challenge is to control the small feeders that come in through the white matter. 
this patient had dense glyoptic tissue all around the ADM. So this QSA has become very useful. Baby is nearly mobilized. There's a little more of attachment left. And now this is the last draining vein into the superior circle sinus. This become lax. These sort of high flow AVMs require very meticulous control of blood pressure in the post-operative period. quite a bulky section specimen. So that is the completion of the excision. This patient had a no residual. She developed a hemianopia and had subtle left-sided weakness which improved over, um, over six weeks. The next patient, I'm showing a different aspect actually. This patient has a, uh, an avian inside the parenchyma of the cerebellum. This is a 19-year-old nursing student presenting with refractory trigeminal neuralgia. Impaired, we found that she had impaired non-verbal memory function and executed dysfunction. All AVMs undergo neuropsychology. Uh, since last five years. Uh, this three centimeter nidus in an eloquent region extending up to the um, up to the fifth nerve with deep venous strains. So the feeders are from the superior cerebellar as well as from the uh, some degree from the ICA. The, the, the pica does not seem to participate. There is steel from the uh, both PCAs and probably this is the reason for the neuropsychological dysfunction that this patient is having. This AVM is deep inside the parenchyma on the superior surface, nearing to the superior surface of the AVM. Sometimes you may have to sacrifice a vein, but it should be done with great caution to make sure that there are other draining veins. No surface is presenting. So we have made a cut on the lateral aspect, we have gone down to the tent on the lateral aspect of the avian. We are flush on the medial surface, we are flush to the avian. And we have completed the dissection on that surface. Few are, few feeders are still present. This is the tendoral surface. Now we're going on the superior surface. You can see there are some feeders from the superior surface. Most of the venous drainage of this patient is towards the midline. Now the lateral part is disconnected. The avian is present in with this small chunk of cerebellum. When it is deep intraprime parenchyma, it is difficult to make a, a dissection right on the avian. You may have to cut through the parenchyma. See, it's already turning blue. These are some of the venous drainage to the medial side. It's already turning blue. Now, finally, the last vein is disconnected.
now what is left is we have to I am going to search for the session uh, i'm going to search for the trigeminal nerve the trigeminal nerve is here you can see there is a few vessels around and the superior cerebellar are on the under surfaces significantly compressing the cell if you this do not disconnect it is possible that the uh, pain may return sometimes the avm removal itself may be enough but definitely since you have a king and a large compressing vessel you have to decompress that also so the trigeminal nerve is actually kinged and lying curved and we have a small uh, part of it lying separate so this is a little bit of teflon going between the uh, superior cerebellar and the and the nerve so this is we have removed a small patch of cerebellum here this patient became painfully and uh, she had no deficits trigeminal nor cerebellar this is a 43 year old shopkeeper i am going to show you another aspect of an avm where it does not look very smooth at certain stages of the surgery this patient presented with headache basically with steel apathy reduced attention span memory impairment neuropsychology showed uh, executive dysfunction as well as uh, um, reduced attention span this is a grade 4 avm this is around 5 and a half 5 cm in the uh, in the basal region and yeah there is a, a deep venous drainage as well as as well as the uh, the lesion extends into the eloquent frontal operculum it is on the frontal base and then coming into the cilia and into the frontal operculum so this is the avm actually this is the frontal base and this is the cilia the frontal base the majority of the avm is in the frontal base but there is some extension on to the cilia in the eloquent opercular uh, region it is in somewhat similar to the first avm that we saw but uh, it is slightly larger and it has extension into the eloquent area we have disconnected the lateral surface and reached the medial the fox is visible the sylvian is here most of the venous drainage is in the sylvian so i am boldly disconnecting the uh, feeders on the base the sylvian the avm has actually become significantly lax this is the olfactory nerve and those feeders coming from the aca side on that side are being disconnected now i have only this patch left this avm looks lax i find it difficult to dissect through this bundle it's all firm i dissect the sylvian i find that most of the veins have become blue they are all lax so i decide i can Uh, further disconnect by coagulating through because it's only I thought there was only a small patch. It's a small error of judgment. We can see the AVM is actually swelling up a little, but my impression is that there is only a very small feeder. I disconnect the surface. This is very difficult to coagulate these large baggy structures. So I and they do not fall into a clip well. So I just open that surface and I find that there is brisk bleeding. Good morning, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. Last one minute. One minute. Yeah. I have completed nineteen minutes. Okay. Yes, sir. Nine forty-five. Yes, we do last time. Mm. This uh, area has been disconnected, and. okay the finally we have achieved after the some brisk bleeding we have achieved uh, uh, most cases so the post op angiogram you can see the there is no residual avm patient had improved in executive function by 20 percentile since started working
So this is my series. I have 130 AVMs operated. 107 have full of 100%. I'm more of grade 2, grade 3, and grade 4 AVMs. My mortality is 2. One for a grade 4 and one for a grade 5 aneurysm. Long-term deficits have only been visual. Uh, no patient had any water deficit long-term. My complication rate is approximately 1.8%. This is 5% uh, for grade 4 and 25% for grade 5. Overall needle subliteration has been 97% and a rebleed of 0.3 per 100 patient years. Thank you. Uh, remarkable, Matthew. You are uh, continuing the, the legacy of uh, Sri Chitra of AVMs. Uh, these are very complex AVMs, uh, which Matthew has shown looks so easy. Uh, when he's showing it, but believe me, these uh, patients can die on the table. Uh, especially the last uh, two AVMs uh, are high flow AVMs. Uh, uh, Matthew, just a couple of uh, one question and a couple of comments. Number one, so, I mean, Sri Chitra is known to have a very good uh, neuroradiology unit and they used to embolize and then followed by surgery. I, I see that you are not a fan of embolization anymore because all your patients were uh, without no, embolizing. Is that? Uh, yeah, the, the, the videos I've shown are actually the non embolized ones because I wanted to show the high-grade AVMs. Uh, um, actually, I may not embolize up to grade 3, but grade 4 and 5, I would prefer embolization. Uh, one of them is actually a failed embolization, but one is okay. not an embolization. The patient is not keen. Uh, and the radiologist is also not keen on embolizing because of a large venous sac. Okay. Uh, the next thing is, you know, obviously, the, there is a lot of discussion about the... the uh, whether to treat or not to treat microsurgery or any 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 form of intervention for uh, grade four five and now for even grade three uh, post Aruba, uh, has your practice changed any way at all? Doesn't seem really. so. Actually, I am selecting more of AVMs. I am having one more facet that I have noticed, and uh, we are in the process of publishing it. Now there is significant neuropsychological improvement in a patient who undergoes even a section of even a small AVM. And uh, this same improvement is not seen with the partial embolization. And uh, clearly some patients have very marked improvement. Even a grade one AVM sometimes leaves a patient up to 10 to 20 percentile elevation of almost all parameters. And you have shown actually pure microsurgery. You have not uh, uh, wasted your time on, uh, you know, kind of advances, technological, technical uh, monitoring and so on. So pure, uh, hardcore microsurgery. Would you do any monitoring for your cup, uh, patients? Yeah, uh, sir, I, have, I have done monitoring for some patients, but there are two uh, aspects I just wanted to say. One is um, the uh, radiology, the uh, functional MRI is not perfect on a, uh, an area. We get overlap, but uh, ultimately it may not be there. And uh, there is seems to be a significant plasticity at the border of even if you have hitchhiked a little into the gray matter onto an eloquent area, ultimately the patient does not have a deficit. There seems to be, nature seems to be moving out function from near an avian. And um, uh, many of the aspects that we utilize for routine surgery during epilepsy surgery or for tumors, does not exactly strictly apply in avian. So you don't do electrophysiological monitoring so much? Uh, not very frequently, except uh, maybe... Um, Around five cases, I have done electrophysiological monitoring, and I don't thank you, think thank you, Matthew. Much. I think I think time is short. I will move away. I don't want thank to take much you. time. You, tremendous, uh, tremendous experience. Uh, I, I must say that it is remarkable. Please do publish it because the, these are difficult AVMs. Thank you very much. And only one one point about the 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 bipe. I saw your instruments such short instruments, very very appropriate for. Uh, surface AVM is very important to have the length of uh, instrument appropriate for that type of AVM you're operating. One of the, the instrument which I'm very big fan is, is a, uh, is a uh, non-stick bipolar. I, I wouldn't do a, a, a AVM if I did not have. We are disposable. The bi, uh, we don't want to tell the company. The many companies are doing it. But uh, I have found the non-stick bipolar is a tremendous uh, uh, help. Uh, in operating these AVMs. But anyway, thank you very much. It was a, a pleasure listening to you. Over to the organizer, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mishra, sir. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. And now uh, we move on to the second talk of the session. And for that, I would like to invite 
the moderator uh, who needs no introduction uh, dr ps ramani sir the stalwart in neurospine surgery the consultant neurosurgeon at leelawati hospital and i would like to in, uh, invite ramani sir to introduce the next speaker for the session over to you ramani sir thank you thank you very much uh, dr varnan valyo i think the sessions are going excellent although it had just started and i welcome i can see dr yadav there yadav welcome sir sir uh, yeah the next session is by minimally invasive by dr yadav and yadav again yes dr varnan say he requires no introduction he is now very very well known everywhere throughout india and he recently held at mp neurocon conference also in jabalpur he is the head of the super specialty uh, department and of course at what he at the um, uh, nscb medical college and hospital without wasting much time but we have already at uh, lost about 6 minutes already within the first video session i am not going to do that dr yadav please note 10 15 minutes 10 15 we have to finish it please dr yadav please start thank you sir thank you Uh, so are you able to see my uh, presentation please yes 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 sir uh, so i am thankful to professor varnan uh, good morning professor ramani sir seniors and friends i am going to present uh, endoscopic excision of colloid cyst using tubular retractor then nitacha phone na we all know that colloid cysts are benign lesions they should not remain asymptomatic for long time some may have par paroxysmal headache gait disturbances nausea vomiting behavioral changes weakness of lower limb impaired memory new learning disability and even sudden death the ct scan shows a well defined round uh, oval non enhancing lesions and if the lesions are hyper dense they, these are difficult to aspirate in mri uh, the mri signal intensity may be variable with combination of t1 t2 signal intensity most uh, common appearance is uh, hyper intensity on t1 weighted image Uh, and uh, iso or hypo on t2 but if you have a uh, uh, low to weighted the uh, m since it has been suggested that patient with um, uh, low signal uh, um they are difficult to operate by endoscopic approach so maybe open approach is advisable for such patients um and uh, so either you go for open approach because the dissection by manual dissection is difficult um or you use other methods in endoscopic surgery or some help from something like tubular retractor so there are subset of patients in which pure endoscopic in form of channel uh, retractor is difficult regarding the treatment options uh, observations may be done in asymptomatic patients of less than 7 mm size without hydrocephalus uh, such patient requires a very close observations uh, radiologically and clinically uh, and uh, if the lesion especially is in zone 2 it has been said that the, the lesion near the foramen monro or near the aqueduct that is zone 1 and zone 3 are likely to have sudden deteriorations but the patients which have retro forensis um, location without pedicle they and if they are of small size can be observed the the other options are um, microsurgical and endoscopic and other treatment which which i'll be endoscopically i'll i'll be dealing with 
So surgery is indicated if the risk score is uh, four or more, and the score is if the age is um, less than 65 years, if the patient has a headache, and if the lesion is more than seven mm, and if there is a, a flare hyperintensity, such patients have been shown to enlarge compared to those who do not have. Or if th there is a risk zone like um, uh, the one and three risk zone. So if, if a score is four and more, then these patients should be operated. If there is any doubt, it is better to operate. Um, regarding the endoscopic surgery, which is uh, my topic of discussion today, is um, we have mainly two types of endoscopic surgery. Each have some limitations and advantages. Uh, one is channel endoscopic surgery in which um, uh, the examples are ETV and some of the interventional oh, surgery. The, these are pure endoscopic surgery. Uh, microscopic assistance may not be required. But the instruments are passed through the working channel. So you cannot uh, do any further angulation. And most of the time there is only one single working channel. So there is a difficult in bimanual dissection um, and difficulty in passing two instruments. So this is one great advantage of uh, channel endoscopic surgery. Um, these are done in liquid media. So if there is any bleeding, the visualization becomes very difficult. So this is another another disadvantage of channel endoscopic surgery. Uh, so because of these two things, there is a difficulty in control of bleeding. If you have bleeding uh, while removing the, choroid, uh, the colloid cyst, it is difficult. One is because of the liquid media, because everything becomes red in a liquid media, you are not able to see anything. The other disadvantage of channel endoscopy is that the bimanual dissection is difficult. So if there is a dense adhesion of the cyst wall with the roof of third ventricle, uh, it is um, very difficult to remove. Uh, so it is indicated only for very small lesions of less than two centimeter and avascular lesions. Larger lesions which are vascular or if there is a dense adhesion are difficult sometimes. So, um, uh, if you take help of uh, port uh, system or tubular retractor, all these disadvantages which are there of channel endoscopic surgery have gone. So this is again a pure endoscopic surgery. The instruments are passed uh, by the side of the endoscope. This is a tubular retractor or a port system. There is no difficulty in uh, instrument manipulation. So bimanual dissection is very easy. Um, it is done in the air media, therefore um, there is no uh, dis, uh, I mean, uh, difficulty in visualization if there's a bleeding. So control of bleeding is, is um, simple and by manual dissection is possible. Therefore you can treat large tumors and vascular lesions using endoscopic surgery by channel endoscopic surgery by uh, port system, sorry. So the port or the tubular retractors have the advantage over the conventional retractor because the pressure distribution is in all the direction as against the uh, typical Lela retractor where the pressure is uh, centered over a very small area. Uh, therefore, it is less likely to produce uh, brain injury or contusions. Uh, we have devised also a tubular retractor, which is, which is simple. And I can say that possibly it is the best and it is inexpensive, it does not cost anything. And, and the unique feature of this tubular retractor has come because of the longitudinal cut given on the tube. If you give a longitudinal cut, this tubular retractor can be folded onto itself and therefore you can you can put it through a very small opening. So the advantage of our retractor is that it is inexpensive, simple, helps in stopping bleeding. It is effective and safe, uh, requires very small opening. There's hardly any uh, brain damage because of the soft nature, uh, light weighted can be moved in any direction and you don't require any holder. 
this is a short video of collide cyst um, uh, which we have operated ct scan showing a lesion in the third ventricle uh, and last bar hole or a small craniotomy uh, and then you put in a nasal speculum in closed limb position gently enlarge it and then you push the uh, tubular retractor folded tubular retractor um, inside and take out the nasal speculum. After that, uh, you can either use a microscope or endoscope. I use endoscope. Uh, we put in uh, these gauze pieces all around uh, just to prevent any trickling of blood in the ventricle. So the endoscope has been stationed um, at 12 o'clock position. You can see the, the uh, cyst in at the Foreman Monroe, the uh, choroid plexus on to the cyst should be coagulated using a bipolar forcep. And after that, you cut it so that um, there is no traction on the choroid plexus when you dissect the cyst. So after cutting the choroid plexus separate, uh, then we need to uh, we need to rupture the cyst and decrease the uh, I mean aspirate the content so that it becomes small. After that, one can uh, I mean uh, you hold the cyst and try to dissect it from the adhesions, uh, especially the choroid plexus attachment, which should be separated using a bimanual dissection using scissor or a suction as shown here. And all small little uh, adhesions which are present should be, should be removed. The cyst, when it becomes light, you can deliver it into the uh, lateral ventricle and do the dissection. A small little adhesions from the roof of uh, third ventricle should be dissected and cut using sharp dissection scissor. And in the end, you can remove the uh, the cyst wall. Complete excision has been achieved, and after that. Um, go for irrigation, there's absolute hemostasis and uh, close this. So uh, usually, although in uh, this tubular retractor, you can uh, just in front of coronal suture, you can make a, uh, I mean, the bar hole or enlarged craniotomy, but it is slightly anterior to the ETV, which, which we, perform normally. Um, I go through the superior frontal gyrus rather than the mid middle frontal gy gyrus because there are studies which shows that when you go from the superior frontal gyrus, the chances of white matter damage are much less compared to when you go through the middle frontal gyrus and it is easier to operate. There are less chances of seizure also, although it is a transcortical approach because it is a minimally invasive technique and many authors have, have, have suggested this. So important points uh, in the uh, colloid cyst surgery is that one should coagulate and cut the choroid plexus. Otherwise, uh, it is difficult to separate it from the cyst wall. Empty the cyst wall so that it becomes membrane-like thin. Uh, and after that, you can place the cyst in the lateral ventricle where the dissection becomes a little easier. If the cyst is very heavy, then this will float back in the third ventricle um, and the dissection through the foramen monroe. Um, if you do, then there are chances of injury of fornix. Uh, dissect it from the surrounding structure. You should not pull it. If you pull, then there may be chances of bleeding. Um, you can go transforaminal in most of the situations if the cyst is near the foramen 
Monroe only. But if there is a retroforaminal location, then you can go transchoroidal. You can uh, uh, that I'll be shortly discussing the approach or transepto interforaminal uh, technique. If there is a coexistence uh, septum cavum pellucidum. Uh, uh, so, uh, trans uh, foraminal transchoroidal approach. If you suspect that the uh, cyst is uh, very thick um, and uh, it is T2 hypo intense and firmly attached to the roof in such location and the other indication is if the cyst is um, in the uh, middle or the posterior third ventricle, uh, in such cases, you have to uh, take a transchoroidal approach. Uh, and a short uh, I mean, comment is that you coagulate, dissect and coagulate the uh, septal vein. This can be done using endoscope and tubular retractor very well, um, and then cut this uh, septal vein. Uh, in between the choroid plexus uh, and dissect in between the choroid plexus and the fornix. Um, and you go in between two internal um, cerebral veins. This is uh, another short video of a colloid cyst um, operated through the tubular retractor. I think I fast forward this. Sir, you can stop me if my time is over. I think I'll finish in time. So introduction of uh, tube, the bimanual dissection, coagulation of the choroid plexus, same steps and uh, then making a nick on the wall so that you can aspirate the content of the cyst, make it uh, small. And then go for uh, a separation of cyst wall from rest of the surrounding structures. Coagulate those uh, attachment and uh, remove it, and then go for hemostasis. So the results out of uh, total over uh, around 150 colloid cysts. Initially, we did microscopic surgery. Later on, I started with the channel endoscopic surgery, means through the working channel. But when I found that the bleeding is a problem and dissection, bimanual dissection is not possible using this endoscopic surgery. Then I converted it into the port or tubular retractor surgery in last about 50 cases. Um, the complications or total excision was done in all those uh, cases which were done through the port surgery. Hydrocephalus occurred in about uh, 13 patients. There were two deaths one in the initial learning curve uh, because of the uh, vessel damage, um, the infarction in the thalamus, maybe because of the thrombosis of the um, thalamostyte vein. Um, and yeah. One case because of the bad state. <laughs> the time has been significantly reduced. Uh, as the learning curve increased. Microscopic <laughs> technique is safe and also effective. <laughs> One of the cases, <laughs> the operative cyst uh, and total <laughs> Other case uh, with total excision. Another <laughs> case. Colored 
बिहाइंड द लॉन्ग टर्म फॉलो अप इन सच केसेस सब टोटल एक्सीजन हैज बीन डन एंड द पॉपुलेशन ऑफ द सिस्ट वॉल हैज बीन डन इट हैज बीन सीन इट इन ओवर 10 इयर्स टाइम द रिकरेंस डज नॉट हैपन एंड द चांसेस ऑफ कॉम्प्लिकेशंस आर लेस सो द टाइम ऑफ रिकरेंस मे बी डिलेड और इट मे नॉट अकर एट ऑल if you coagulate the residual cyst wall there have been studies uh, who have combined the endoscope with the tubular retractor and they found it very effective half of them uh, were reported by us um, so the results have been found to be very effective the endoscopic technique also can be done even if there is no hydrocephalus associated so even without hydrocephalus this can be done but there are there are some complications may be difficult if there is no hydrocephalus because the space is less there is a steep learning curve maybe epilepsy uh, associate post operative one may get hydrocephalus which was around um, less than 10% decrease memory if you injure the fornix maybe hemiparesis because uh, the genu of the internal capsule is around it or there may be venous in fact if you injure the 5 uh, minutes vessel. left for the talk uh, okay yadav uh, please uh, conclude sir, sir i have done sir right thank you conclude yeah. so yeah. the channel endoscopic technique is effective alternative to microscopic technique there there are difficulty in bimanual dissection if the cyst wall um, and hemorrhage in pure channel endoscopic surgery and if this cyst is lying posteriorly and if it is t2 hypo intense uh, cyst in a channel endoscopic surgery in such cases port or tubular retractor um, assistance um, in endoscopic surgery helps in total excision of uh, the cyst and control of bleeding although total excision should be aimed but the residual cyst wall um if if it is risky then you can coagulate the cyst wall and usually it remains asymptomatic for very long period even after subtotal excision and coagulation of cyst wall but there is a steep learning curve associated with this thank you very much sir thank you priyada it was a wonderful uh, demonstration you have shown all the approaches by which you can approach the colloid c you have also shown all the development that has happened in this surgery and you have shown various approaches tubular retractor endo uh, microscopic endoscopic everything so it is a in nutshell the whole knowledge of this uh, 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 surgery on the colloid cyst that you have given i would like to just cite one example i had one patient i had operated 35 years ago remember at that time there was no mri no zone were identification of zone to where is the colloid is lasting transnasal surgery had not much developed and even microscopes were very mediocre the microscope that i was using at that time was very mediocre my only tool was fortunately for me i had a good bipolar coagulator my approach was standard cortical in front of the corona suture superior frontal gyrus go to the ventricle approach the third ventricle take out the colored cyst and excise it that was my standard approach that time he came to this patient whom i had operated 35 years ago he came to see me last week for some back pain and other problem he was a commercial artist working in sharja very young just married he had two he had very very young kids he was extremely worried what will happen i only took care of the fornix not to damage the fornix at all while doing this procedure and uh, 
he went back to sharja did his work his children are grown they have their children and now he is retired and settled in bangalore that is my story transcortical approach without any sophisticated investigation the retractor that i used for transcortical approach those days we had a very narrow copper metal uh, sort of a spatula available in neurosurgery which i used to retract the brain till i reach the lateral one of the ventricle which i opened and then went straight to the foramen magnum any comment on that dr yadav last and then we will conclude this session sir sir excellent sir you are we know i have learned all spinal surgery especially fixation things in my residency we in pgi there was no fixation no surgery were so um, seeing your surgery we have learned this thing and i agree sir it is possible with the pure microscopic technique it is very well possible sir thank you thank you very much and i to conclude this session over to the organizers for the next video session please thank you thank, thank you, you yadav sir for the wonderful demonstration of endoscopic technique and thank you ramani sir for moderating the session so now we move on to the next talk and for that i would like to invite uh, dr kk turel sir needs no introduction he is a professor emeritus and consultant neurosurgeon at bombay hospital mumbai and i would like uh, turel sir to introduce the next speaker for the talk over to you turel sir thank you thank you very much wonderful organization as usual um, nice uh, sunday morning well spent so far uh, my uh, great pleasure to introduce and to invite ganshyam singhal who is an associate professor of uh, neurosurgery at gb pant in delhi and he'll be talking about uh, treatment of medulloblastomas over to you please thank you very much good morning sir good morning to all and uh, very very thanks to giving me opportunity because uh, and can i start the case sir i am today i am presenting a case of four year male child with uh, one month history of headache association go into slide show please go into slide show you are showing your slides go into slide show yeah am i audible no no slide show click on slide show and click on the icon slide show manisha is it okay is it okay no no it's still in the slide mode go to slide show mode dr ganesha so on the top left screen so click on the top left screen uh, top left of the screen left corner uh, uh, corner corner yes from the beginning left yes click on that right so resume slide show yeah yeah get it no it has yeah. you have to go on top first and click you have clicked slide show on top get it no no it's not it. it's okay now let us let us not waste time okay just go ahead let's continue <laughs> Am I audible? You are audible. You are yes, visible. Sir. Visible. I am presenting a case of four-year male child presenting with chief complaint of headache associated with vomiting for one month and difficulty in walking for fifteen months, fifteen days. Sorry, there is no history of trauma, seizure, or LOC. On examination, patient was conscious, oriented, following command. No cranial deficit uh, elicited. No motor sensory deficit. Only cerebellar signs are present. an mri so, so the uh, huge mass in fourth ventricle and creating a hydrocephalus creating a hydrocephalus and uh, we plan for definitive surgery routinely we uh, don't use uh, bp shunt for hydrocephalus we just believe in the primary surgery can i show the video
Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. I am connecting. Get it? Get it, sir, video? No, sir, your video is not visible yet. Video not visible. Stop sharing the screen, sir, and then start the video and share screen. Stop sharing. Just yes, and now play your video and share screen. Yeah. Share it. Yes. It? Yes, sir. After positioning, we routinely do in prone position. And uh, after uh, suboccipital keratomy, which is extending from the uh, inion to C1. And uh, we are trying to remove the C1 arch next. In the C1 arch, there is a upper border of vertical, uh, there, in the C1 arch, upper border related to the vertical artery. That's why I am safeguarded and Install the mic uh, and using the microscope on this step. We had we are very much careful around the Stephen Arch. Extension of suboccipital keratomy is from the transfer sinus upper border and laterally emissary veins. And between the C1, C2, there is a uh, sort of venous plexus is there and very much careful around it. Just removing the C1 arch. After removing the C1 arch, we are making a planning to open the dura in Y shape person.
the placing the st st switcher on the do the tumor uh, is visible tumor is visible <coughs> सिस्टम ना मैंगना आज बिजी बल एंड टीमर We open the system now, Magna. And dissect the correct node over the tumor. and try to dissect the tonsils from the tumor <laughs> Mm, I am. Yes, sir. Mm. 
you may have had you may have had very little time to edit your videos because you came as a replacement for dr srivastava yeah so yeah you, uh, because we can't edit. so can you not fast forward it so that yeah 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 have some more attention to more details because you wasted a lot of time on just the exposure yeah yeah i am just doing a fast forward yes please so we are can you can slow down at the critical point which you want to yeah. yeah 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 thank you i um, just uh, internal decompression of the tumor while uh, i am doing this yes and there is a uh, tumor is a little bit adherent to the surroundings and free from the floor of the fourth ventricle and so in here Do so. Do so. I am uh, sharing a next video also. Mm -hmm. The, this almost uh, tumor has almost uh, little bit ninety percent tumor has been removed and flow of CSF is seen. At, this is visible through aqueduct. This is aqueduct. At the end of the procedure, CSF flow through aqueduct. Next to the one. Next slide. Slide the one. Slide. Okay. We know. This is the post-op scan of this patient. Tumor has been removed completely. And you, there is no and hydrocephalus subsided already. 
and uh, on histopathology, this tumor turned out to be a medulloblastoma. Can can I share next slide, uh, next presentation of the literal literally placed medulloblastoma on cerebellum in a fifty year old male? But video is not edited. Uh, okay. I am doing. Then I am doing fast forwarding. Yes, go This is a 50 year male patient presented with a headache and vomiting associated with difficulty in walking, especially on the left side, turning and on five minutes remaining. Yeah, yeah. On MRI. Patient is having a, and this is uh, on T2 image, XGL images. This is having a lateral, left lateral side, hyper intense region is showing and associated with some hydrocephalus is there. We are not seeing the images of that, of that, that second case of yours. This is still the post op image of the first patient. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I am sharing. It. Get it, sir? Yes. A 50 year male patient presented with a headache, vomiting, and associated with difficulty in moving, especially in turning on the left side. And on T2 beta, uh, this is an MRI of this, this patient and showing a hyper intense region on the left cerebellum associated with some hydrocephalus is there. Uh, I am showing uh, other images also. This is T1 beta in hyper intense region. And on next image, I will show. Uh, on contrast image, there is no con uh, contrast enhancing region. This is this is a not enhancement of. On flare, just edemize there. On DWI images, there is a restriction of diffusion is there on the left cerebellum. I am showing a video of this. Video. Thank you. Gansham, have you are you showing your video or what are you showing? No, I am showing, I am showing. We have to rush a little bit because we, we need to learn something more from you. Just a minute. The problem is there, sir. My video is not edited. I am just uh, informed uh, last night. Okay, then just summarize it, please. If I understand your difficulty. 
But if you can even summarize what you have observed and what is the uh, message that you want to give us by these two operations that you have shown. Yeah, uh, just metalloblastoma, after uh, as far as cranotomy is concerned, cranotomy is from the uh, um, vertex to C1 arch and C1 arch removed, number one. And uh, number two is uh, uh, laterally uh, try to complete the removal of the whole tumor, gross total resection. And third is, sir, after finishing the operation, uh, aqueduct should be seen in the last of the uh, free flow of the CSF. And uh, in the second slide, I, uh, I am showing the laterally placed medulloblastoma, which is having a good plan. Usual blastoma is free from the flow of the foot ventricle. Okay. All right. Is there any way you want to conclude with your? Is there any concluding statement you want to give, or these are the conclusions that you have already given? Or uh, shall I summarize it for you? Yeah, yeah. Conclusion or take-home message is there uh, because uh, at the end of the operation, you should be visible the uh, aqueduct of the sylvius. That you already said. Whatever you have not said. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, what I would do, so I will make your job easier. I would say that the approaches to the fourth ventricle, uh, as you have shown, are two uh, types. And two, yes, sir. One is the one is their the traditional uh, <clears throat> old-fashioned transverbial approach to the fourth ventricle, and yeah. the other is the low wheeler approach, as you know. Uh, yeah, I, I am using a wheeler approach. That's right. So, in that telovelar approach, you have what is called as a telacoroidia. Telacoroidia is a very thin web-like membrane, which arises from and the inferior medullary bellum. So, that is a cerebellum medullary fissure through which you dissect and you get into the, um, into the telovelar membrane and then you dissect it. It's a natural anatomical passage to the fourth ventricle without yeah. damaging any structures. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, yes, sir. Yes, only, sir. Problem is, only problem is that when you have a very rostral attachment. So I was concerned to see your first case, how rostral was the attachment of your tumor? How high was it? Sometimes uh, a very rostral attachment is a little difficult for uh, telovelar approach to reach uh, compared to the transvermian approach. But we all know that now transvermian approaches are pretty uh, dangerous in terms of producing what is called as cerebellar mutism. Cerebellar mutism is a... Is more, more common in transvermian approach. Yes. So, have you noticed any patients with transvermian approach? Have you done any cases with transvermian approach? No, sir. No, sir. My, in, in my unit, only we use the telovelar approach most commonly. Oh, we have removed the C1, uh, C1 arch uh, cautiously and uh, we go through the. You always remove the uh, arch of atlas? Yeah. Have you uh, remove the arch of atlas in every case? Routinely, sir. Routinely. In the tubular approach. I would say you may be able to preserve it uh, if the tumor is in a lower part of the fourth ventricle. If it is in the upper part of the fourth ventricle, then you uh, in, the, in the government. In the government. Listen to what I am. Only one person can speak. So, okay, you can explain and then I will comment. In the government hospital, we usually get a large tumor and uh, just uh, slow down the uh, below the foramen magnum. And sometimes reaching up to the C1. Yes. And yeah, that's why we are routinely using the uh, removal of the C1 arch routinely to get yeah. the look. Yeah, but not all of them are attached to the floor of the fourth ventricle. My point is, if your tumor attachment is very high in the fourth ventricle, what I call as rostral, in that case, arch of atlas gives you an advantage. But if the tumor is lower down, and if it is not going beyond the foramen magnum or beyond the arch of atlas, then you can save or preserve the arch yeah, of yeah, yeah, yes, yes, And sir. even when you have cut the arch of atlas, I would advise, <laughs> what I do at least, is that yeah. I don't nibble it out. I made cuts on the arch of atlas and then replace the arch of atlas by putting titanium plates. So that is a way of reconstructing the arch of atlas. So, and the last one on cerebellar mutism. Have you seen any cases of cerebellar mutism so far? 
and that's the something know. that I need to emphasize, and it is very typical a uh, problem. Well, sometimes you are forced to go transvernian. In cerebellar mutism is a, a, a condition which occurs classically one or two days after surgery, and yes. uh, it, it results in uh, a person progressively losing his speech and becoming mute, and there is emotional lability, and there is also hypotonia and disruption. What what it does is there is a disruption of the efferent cerebellar pathways to the supratentorial brain, and that is why you get this cerebellar mutism, and which yes. is an unfortunate thing. The damage to dented nucleus and vermis, um, which is uh, which happens by the vermian approach. So, okay, I don't know if the organizers feel it's uh, time is up, then we should stop. Otherwise, I can make some more comments. Yes, sir, time is up. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you sir. so much. Thank you. I'm sorry that you had very little time, but anyway, you did a great job. Uh, at least you could trigger off some kind of a debate. And thank you for being so supporting us to come on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One thing, sir. One thing, sir. Uh, even if we go telovilla, sometimes by retraction of the vermis, also we get cerebral mutism. So, uh, how do we prevent that? So, so even if we... prevent by removing the tonsil laterally. Okay. You don't. You don't touch. You go to the midline. Okay. And you cut the membrane between in the cerebellar medullary fissure. You cut the membrane laterally and retract the tonsil laterally, okay. and lift it off the floor. Okay, okay, okay. That way you will completely not touch the vermis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Time, later on, we will show uh, surgery for medulloblastomas again because uh, since it was from a GB Pant presentation, we had to honor the presentation. So if there is time later on, we will show uh, the video session for medulloblastomas. Let me know. Message me. So then I'll like yes, to... Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vernon. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Dhanasham, for the quick presentation. And now we we move on to next talk. And for that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Harshad Parekh, sir, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at uh, HN Reliance Hospital, Leelawati Hospital, Saifi Hospital, and Nanavati Hospital in Mumbai. So I invite uh, Harshad Parekh, sir, to introduce the next speaker for the session. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Rushikesh and Dr. Vernon to giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. I invite Dr. Ali Asghar Mohedi, who is a consul, who is the head of the department at Tata Home Memorial Hospital. And he will be speaking on transopercular approach, uh, approach to the insular gliomas. Very difficult approach and very difficult to remove these tumors because of the anatomy involved. Dr. Ali Asghar, floor is yours. We are here to learn from you. Thank you. Are you all able to hear me? Yes. Yes, Dr. Ali. Please go yes. ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vernon, for this uh, wonderful session. Uh, yes, Dr. Harshad Parekh rightly said, insular gliomas in general are actually um, quite challenging and uh, maybe the ultimate frontier for gliomas. And uh, they unfortunately make up almost 20 to 30 percent of all gliomas that a neurosurgeon would encounter, especially the low-grade glioma. And we all agree that extent of resection matters. And therefore, uh, attempts to improve and optimize the extent of resection are uh, very, very critical, especially for challenging tumors like insula. In order to address these, uh, I think it's very important to have a good understanding of uh, the microsurgical anatomy, the microvascular anatomy, within the insula. The insula is probably innocuous, appears to subserve no critical function, but is surrounded by a complex maze of critical neurovascular substrates. And that makes it even more challenging to access and to remove tumors over here. Um, important to understand the subcortical anatomy, which uh, lies within the bed of the insula including the various associative tracts such as the uncinate and the IFOF, as well as the optic radiation over here that you can see. 
And a lot of this can be gained, knowledge can be gained by studying neuroanatomy and preferably by doing fiber dissection. An important concept to understand is uh, to know what the temporal isthmus and the stem of the temporal lobe is because uh, this is actually um, the funnel through which a lot of important white matter tracks go through from the frontal to the temporal under the bed of the insula. The microvascular anatomy also is very critical, not only the MCA complex within uh, the, on the insular surface, but also the perforators which lie at the depth and some of them, especially the long M2 perforators which emanate from the M2s on the surface of the insula and supply the corona radiator, which often is a source of post-operative deficits, not just the uh, ischemia from the lenticular striates which supply the internal capsule, but the long M2 perforators which go through and supply the corona radiator and are often actually neglected. In order to optimize surgery for these, um, so um, I just wanted to tell uh, you that I will go through a few slides and then show two videos, one for a dominant hemisphere and one for a non-dominant hemisphere giant insular glioma. So in order to optimize uh, the resection, I think it's important to have a good mental imagery and correlation with the intraoperative anatomy. And for example, in this kind of a giant frontoinsular tumor, you need to understand and superimpose the cortical anatomy onto the surgical field. And this is again important because there are a few landmarks which you could use during surgery, such as the central sulcus, the sylvian fissure, and the surface projection of the insula. This may be distorted by the tumor and depending on the pattern of growth, but it is important to know the gyral sulcal anatomy and to be able to extrapolate it onto the intraoperative uh, patient. Most importantly is to understand the functional role of various cortical, subcortical and deep structures, which are actually very critical in insular surgery. I won't go through each of these, but suffice it to say that all of them have functions which need to be preserved there is a lot of argument and counter argument about what kind of function and how much of the function needs to be preserved. It depends on the endpoint that you're looking at. If you're looking at uh, motor, sensory motor uh, deficits at the end of surgery, you might uh, say that all of these probably may not be important except perhaps the pericentral, perirolandic cortex and the internal capsule. However, if you're looking at other cognitive function and it's important to understand and preserve these higher mental functions, including language, but not restricted to language. Executive function, attention span, and working memory are all critical and in fact have a bearing on even the performance of language for patients. And not only are they important on the left or the dominant side, so-called, because we usually call dominant hemisphere based on language, but you must understand that there is a lot of important cognitive function, which is bilaterally represented and often dominant on the right hemisphere. Also important to understand is tumor growth pattern. And this is uh, the basis of um, the development of Yasargil's classification, like 3A purely insular tumors, 3B front insular opercular tumors, where the neocortex also gets involved. The insula is actually uh, um, allocortex, paralympic, and the neocortex gets involved in 3B. In 5A, besides the insula, there is temporobasal and frontobasal involvement, again, paralimbic areas, with 5B there being mesial temporal involvement, that is the limbic areas of the hippocampus. However, this is good for cytoarchitectural understanding, but from a surgical point of view, another classification proposed by Berger and Sanai, which divides the insula into four zones, one, two, three, four clockwise, uh, depending on its location, anteroposterior to the foramen Monroe line and superior inferior to the Sylvian fissure line. Zone two seems to be the most difficult to access and generally remains the site for residual tumor in most cases. Another uh, interesting classification is based on the direction of spread of the tumor along the white matter tracts. We said there are many associative tracts and depending on which fasciculus the tumor spreads along, you would have different orientations of tumor growth. And this actually will determine your plan of surgery, including the mapping that you will do. It's no wonder because of the critical location and multiple substrates involved that often resections are suboptimal, even in the best of hands. And this is a paper which puts out resection probability maps. As you can see that over a large number of insular gliomas, all were poor 
for registered and warped onto a common brain template. And the green areas show areas where it was easily resectable. Probability of resection was one, which means 100%. And the red one shows that the probability of resection of tumor in these areas was less than 0.1. That means less than 10%. And these include on both sides, right and left side, a lot of the areas of the insula, especially the posterior insula. So with that prelude, I'd like to put in why a transopercular approach may be actually a good approach for insular tumors. There has been a debate about transfilian and transopercular approach. We could use that in the discussion. But what I'd like to say here is that the transopercular approach provides far more surgical freedom and angles for approach. And this has been shown in cadaveric dissection. This is a paper by the group from uh, UCSF, Burgers Group, where they compared the accesses between transcranial, uh, sorry, transcortical or transopocular, transylvian, and the transylvian where the veins are cut, bridging veins are cut. And they showed that for most zones, the transcortical, transopocular approach is better. For zone two, all of them seem to have limitations. And that is, a, that is probably the last frontier in insular gliomas. Also, the transopercular approach avoids over-attraction of the opercular, avoids working between vessels and prevents vasospasm. And recent large series comparative studies as well as meta-analysis have shown that the rates of postoperative deficits are much lower in the transopercular group than the trans group. You must realize that almost 70% of insular gliomas will involve the opercular and therefore removal of the opercular becomes inevitable in all of them. And you may need mapping even in the transylvian approach. So mapping has to be done whether, regardless of whether you're doing transylvian or transopercular. And the mapping can be done asleep or it can be done awake. What we do is with awake, and we use a sleep-wake sleep, -wake sleep uh, type of approach where the patient is put to sleep because these are long surgeries. For other awakes, we do them awake-awake. But for insulas, because they are long surgeries, we do them sleep awake, sleep or sleep awake, awake. We can keep them awake. Patient is positioned first on the horseshoe, good, comfortable position. The LMA is inserted after confirming the comfort. Then we replace the horseshoe with pins, putting the scalp block. And once the scalp block is put, patient is draped, ensure good line of sight. And then once the craniotomy is completed and dura is about to be opened, we would remove the LMA and awaken the patient. This takes around 15 to 20 minutes, by which time we set up our mapping uh, uh, equipment and the mapping procedure. So this is the test that we use intraoperatively with the patient awake to map the different functions. And I will show them in the two videos. Most of them are standard tests. Uh, we add the pyramids and palm tree test, which is a semantic association test, both on the left and more so on the right side, where this is important. The basic steps of surgery include, um, we prefer using navigation where we have DTI and 3D ultrasound also. These act as guides. And we also use the ultrasound for resection control. We also do MEPs. Uh, we set up the recording electrodes. These are not transcranial. These are cortical strip MEP, which we insert the strip later, but the recording electrodes are put. A wide frontotemporal craniotomy is done, as I showed you. And then the patient is awakened. LMA is removed. Cortical mapping is, is performed. We use a customized battery, which I showed you in the earlier slide. Then we resect the negatively mapped inferior frontal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus and the pole if required. Now the mapping is important to identify that these are the areas in the cortical windows that you can use and also develop a stimulation threshold, which you will use for your subcortical mapping. Then we identify the superior, inferior, and anterior limiting sulci of the insula going around it from the extra pile side, and then define the subcortical boundaries of the tumor where we need subcortical mapping. These need to be done early on so that, and when the patient is awake, sometimes patients become fatigued for long surgeries towards the end, and you should be able to define your functional boundaries early on so that you have all the relevant information that you need. Once you have that, we do the subpile resection of the insula, preserve the MCA complex in the fold of the pia on the surface of the insula, preserve the perforators, and then we also constantly keep monitoring both with neuropsychological testing and the strip MEP, especially in the posterior inferior part of the insula. In the end, the temporal lobectomy and if required, amygdala hippocampectomy may be completed. Patient may remain asleep at this time because you really don't need to map anything at this point of time. Now I'll show you the two videos for the two cases. 
This is a giant left side dominant frontoinsular glioma, which we operated awake transopercular. She was a young lady. We had a history of one uh, uh, generalized tonic clonic seizure and intermittent headache. She was right handed and illiterate. She had no obvious neurological deficits. But the neuropsychological assessment, and this is something I'd like to also highlight, is that uh, it's important in such cases and probably for all gliomas to have a preoperative neuropsychological evaluation because it is very often we see that patients with no obvious neurological deficits will have severe neurocognitive deficits preoperatively. This patient had a screening ACE done and it showed severe cognitive impairment with a lot of domains affected, but picture naming was intact and therefore we could customize our battery restricting to picture naming, number counting and the alternate movement tasks for this patient. This is a, a video showing uh, the tumor. The tumor was a frontoinsular tumor involving the pars triangularis. You can see that in the SAG images as they're scrolling and involving the entire insula. And going a little bit into the superior temporal pole. On the actual images also, you can appreciate uh, the tumor. It's a giant tumor. It involves probably the entire insula and going a lot into the frontal lobe and seems to be involving the head of the caudate and some of the deep white matter and the gray matter connections between the caudate and the uh, basal ganglia. Uh, a volumetric uh, uh, preoperative imaging is very important and all three planes need to be studied to understand the growth pattern of the tumor. Because, uh, as I said, that the growth pattern is very important. There are certain areas which you cannot probably remove tumor. And one of them is the anterior perforated substance and the basal forebrain. Now, this is something which uh, all of us uh, uh, know of, but we rarely uh, see that or encounter uh, during the surgery. And it is, it is this part of the brain uh, uh, just under the septum, which, which is made up of the septal nuclei, nucleus accumbens, and the basal nucleus of Maynard, and even the ventral striatum. And it's just there that you have the anterior perforated substance, which is actually the site where all the lenticulostrites and the perforators get in. Tumor involvement, I mean, this is left and right, so please uh, uh, excuse that. But is this area here, and you can see that this is the area of the perforators and the anterior perforating substance, which is actually just abutting the tumor border, where you have to be very careful and probably leave a little bit of the tumor. We also do functional MRI where patients uh, cooperate in order to get an orientation of where the different uh, cortical areas would be, but we don't completely uh, uh, go by that because we perform intraoperative mapping. Now, in the interest of time, I think I can skip this video or I'll go through it quickly, is to show you that the depth relationships of the tumor are very important. Now, this is DTI with anatomical segmentation of various uh, uh, areas that we have done. And you can see that uh, cortically, the Buta strip, ventral premotor cortex, and Broca's are associated with this tumor. At the depth, in the bed of the tumor, you have the external capsule. Uh, before that is the extreme capsule and the claustrum, and then comes the basal ganglia. And at, at the far depth, and this is somewhere where you would not go, that would be your basal ganglia, the lentiform would be the limit of your resection. But deeper to that are the basal forebrain structures, including the nucleus accumbens and the other ventral striatum. Uh, this patient uh, was operated awake, and this is the plan of surgery with the test that we use. And I'll just skip on to the video. We also use intraoperative ultrasound to identify the tumor, make multiple cortical windows through preserving all the vessels and remove the tumor. So this is an edited video, and I will... Uh, Start with, yeah. So this is that lady who has a left-sided or a dominant hemisphere, large frontoinsular tumor. We have positioned the patient uh, asleep, done a craniotomy and awakened the patient. And once the patient is awakened, we do bipolar cortical mapping. So this is the surface exposed and we are doing bipolar mapping. We first establish the cortical threshold, finding the ventral premotor cortex. These red uh, stickers uh, indicate the ventral premotor cortex. You get anarthria on a speech arrest. And then we map out the dysarthria of facial twitches, which is the M1 
And using that threshold, we map other potential language areas. So we got some semantic paraphasias here, and we got semantic paraphasias here. Remember that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or the middle frontal gyrus, has a lot of important uh, multimodal associative functions, including semantics, both on the right and the left. And it's very important if you're going to preserve semantics to be able to preserve this and map it out. And this will actually be our limit for transcortical exposure in this case. So once we've done that, then we will do the transcortical exposure of the inferior frontal gyrus, that, uh, this being the margin. We'll also put in the strip for continuous MEPs, which we'll use later. Multiple cortical windows are made. And at this point of time, we will, as I said, we establish the subcortical boundary early, the functional boundary. So this was the ventral premotor cortex. That means you'll have subcortical fibers terminating there. We check for anarthria, and that is our functional limit. And at this border, because this was the semantics area, we check for semantic paraphasias or delay. This will also be the site where the frontal Aslan tract will come in into the ventral premotor cortex. And therefore, mapping this and establishing this limit is important. Once you've done that, we subpiley resect the inferior frontal gyrus from the middle frontal gyrus. And below the viral depth, we will enter the white matter. Patient is awake, patient is being monitored by a neuropsychologist, and intermittently we do MEPs, though at this point here, MEPs are not that important. Now you see this is the inferior frontal gyrus being peeled off from the insular surface, which is covered by pia, preserving all the vessels underneath the pia. And then you reach the superior limiting sulcus, at which point of time you strip the pia back up outwards, this is all the expanded insular tumor. We are debulking the tumor there and lifting up the pia as we go. We prefer doing uh, end block resection, but because of the sheer uh, uh, size of the tumor, we will uh, remove some part of it. Then we go to the frontal orbital uh, operculum and we, uh, we find out the anterior insular sulcus. Now this is the tumor from the anterior surface of the insula. Here, our aim is to reach the limen and connect it to the temporal pole, temporal pole. And there, at the depth, we will find the IFOF, which we will stimulate for language picture naming and semantics. And also, we will have uh, uh, the landmark for uh, seeing the lenticular striate vessels. Working alternately between these windows, we will uh, debulk the tumor and separate it off the pia of the insula from inside out, not handling the MCA vessels at all. In this case, the tumor was slightly soft and more uh, amenable to suction. We make a small cortical window in the superior temporal gyrus, and here we are extra piled to the insula. This is important because uh, uh, often remnants of tumor are missed, and you may think that the tumor is not extending into the temporal lobe, but you would probably miss a significant part of the tumor if you don't make that temporal window. And therefore, it's important to map the cortex to understand how much window you can develop. Five can minutes that... left. Okay. So the tumor is being debulked. Here, what we are looking for is actually the we are stimulating for the IFOF uh, and going towards the limen. That's the limen. In the interest of time, I will skip that. And then you trace the entire IFOF uh, as it crosses the insula into the isthmus of the temporal lobe. Now that the entire tumor is dissected off, we peel it off from the basal ganglia and that's the lentiform from which the tumor is being peeled. And the entire tumor is then removed. Here we would do MEPs continuously and that's a uh, uh, monitoring for the motor. That is the end of surgery. The patient post-op had mild word finding difficulties, which we expected because we were close to the IFOF. And this is the post-op scan, which I'd like to show you. Uh, 
where we left a little bit of tumor near the caudate, but uh, most of the tumor in the insula and the frontal part was removed. These are the post-op and this is the pre-op MRI. This was the tumor which we have left, which was going into the caudate. And you can see that the patient had no motor deficits, but mild word finding difficulties. And just to show you the relationship for uh, with the basal forebrain structures. This is the nubbin of the tumor and we were just short of the anterior perforating substance, which was intended. And uh, we would say that this is more than 95% resection of the tumor. Okay, so in the interest of time, I think I will not show the second case unless the chairperson wants me to show that, but we can have a discussion, whatever way I'm fine with that. That's another five and a half, six minute video. Please go ahead. Okay, so uh, this was another case. This is a non-dominant, right-sided, a young male. He was actually an IT professional. He had a very good uh, neuropsychology, not much defects. And I will just show you this. Um, so this is a giant temporal insula. The previous one was a frontal insula. This was significant temporal component and uh, insular uh, involvement. So you can see on this scan. And this was the functional MRI and uh, the introp, I'll skip to this. So this was our surgical plan. We did it awake uh, with uh, cortical mapping and MEPs. And in this case, we identified the ventral premotor cortex with anarthria, and that was the only cortical site. So we had a freedom of going in at multiple places and we did a temporal approach and this one did not require a, a frontal exposure. So uh, this is uh, the patient who has been uh, awakened. We're just identifying landmarks. This is anarthria. He developed complete uh, arrest of speech and that was the ventral premotor cortex. And then we put in the strip electrode. Next, uh, we went ahead and did a temporal exposure. So the temporal exposure starts with uh, identifying the superior temporal sulcus. Remember that the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula is actually on the surface projection is at the superior temporal sulcus. If you want to reach that, it's best to go down there and then remove the superior temporal gyrus by uh, subpile resection. Uh, next, we are trying to find the posterior uh, uh, limit of the tumor and that's the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula under which tumor is going into the insula. Once we've identified that, we will remove the superior temporal gyrus, which has already been negatively mapped. And this is what we are doing, exposing the insular surface with the pia intact and the vessels underneath there. This is carried on anterior. So. Okay. Should I stop? Yes. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to show one second of this video of a few seconds where we are stimulating the IFOF in the non-dominant hemisphere and the patient is having a, a PPT disturbance. Can I just show that? Yeah, okay, okay. good. So this is the roof of the temporal horn and this is where you would get the isthmus. So we are doing the pyramid and palm tree test, which is a semantic association test. And on stimulating, you can see that the patient is not able to identify, indicating that that's the, uh, that's the location of the IFOF. Okay. The, mo the moment we stop stimulating, he's all right. So then we go ahead and we resect the tuber. I'm sorry for shooting over the time. Thank you very much. I'll just go to my last slide, which is the take home message. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to um, say that the transopical approach to the insula is safe. 
Uh, of course, it requires mapping in both hemispheres. It provides a greater surgical freedom and possibly an opportunity for extended resections, but understanding microsurgical vascular anatomy and the functional structure is it's crucial. And of course, like most things in neurosurgery, there is a learning curve with that. And we are still in our learning curve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Excellent video presentations you have shown. Wonderful demonstration of uh, transopercular surgery for the glioma, insular glioma. It's a very tricky area. And I agree with you. We have to be very, very careful and use this kind of a gadgets to save the functions, whether it is a dominant hemisphere or it is non-dominant non hemisphere. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ali Asghar, sir, and uh, Harshad Parikh, sir. Now we move on to next talk. So I would like to introduce, uh, ask Professor Atul Goel, sir, who needs no introduction. He is the ex-head of the department at KEM Hospital and consultant neurosurgeon at Lilawati Hospital to introduce the next speaker for the session. Okay. Over to Atul Goel, sir. I will introduce my dear friend, Suresh Dugani. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Needless <laughs> to say, Suresh is a very enthusiastic. I'm not sure whether I should say a very young man or what. I, sh I am not sure what to say, but he's young at heart, young in uh, ambitiousness, young in the way he operates, the way he presents, and the way he deals with his patients, and the enthusiasm that he has is absolutely fantastic and infectious. And he's a fantastic surgeon in a smallish town. He has built an empire of neurosurgery. I have visited him. I know his work. I know his hospital. I know his, the people he works with. And indeed, it is a great credit to him that he has been able to develop and nurture neurosurgery in a small town in a massive way. And I think, and also the instrumentation, the technology, that he has developed and accumulated in this hospital is absolutely fantastic, showing his real love for the work, love for neurosurgery. And I'm sure we will we are game to see a wonderful presentation from him. Suresh. Thank you, sir. Only one word I can say, what we are doing or what we are doing now, we're all following you. You are our role models and you are our guides, sir. And we'd like to reach your stage sometime in future. Thank you very much for your kind words and excellent encouragement. Hope to live up to your expectations. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, at the outset, I thank uh, uh, my good friend, Professor Vernon, and the Department of Neurosurgery, Grant Medical College, and the team and Maharashtra Neurosurgical Association and Goa Neurosurgical Association for the excellent opportunity given to us uh, to share and learn uh, in, the, in the excellent scientific uh, meeting and that to more of a practical aspects. That is the uh, practical aspects of neuro neurosurgical problems where each one of us are called upon to treat in our day-to-day -day work. As a part of this ongoing scientific program, I thought I'll discuss with you a few of our work and experience in the management of complex intracranial epidermoids with the help of endoscope and navigation and how best we can treat these patients. Epidermal, I think, aside, I don't want to, because all of us as neurosurgeons, we know the things very well. Only thing is that they are highly challenging to treat because they are majority of the time, they're multi compartmental in location, extending into crevices, arachnoidal spaces, involving very vital neurovascular structures, involve all 12 pairs of cranial nerves, sometimes surgical inaccessibility and post-operative aseptic meningitis are the real challenges to treat this. I think I'll skip this a short of time, you know all of us the principles of the surgery. Applications of endoscope and navigation are of great help here in the endoscope, minimizes the retraction of the brain, cranial nerves and vessels when necessary, can increase total resection rate, reduce the surgery-related trauma in these patients, better visualization of deeper parts, and corners and crevices which are not seen with a microscope or beyond microscope vision 
we can see through the endoscope. That's the greatest advantage. Navigation helps us to access, plan the access craniotomy, defines the borders of the tumor and prevents the injury to the vital neurovascular structures, shows the extent of removal and reduces the surgical time. These are the great added advantages. What do we need to treat these lesions better? We need a cool surgeon, most important, because they are long-term surgeries and one need to be very smooth, soft and gentle. High-end operating microscope, ultrasonic aspirate, neuroendoscopes, high-speed drills, osteotomes, intraoperative electrophysiological monitoring, neural navigation, and microplastic reconstruct. When these things are called complex epidermoids, when they involve multi-compartmental, supratentorial, infratentorial, and again, in, 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 the, in, in the compartments itself, many, many areas they may involve. Large lobar epidermoids, supracellular regions, cerebral ponta and angle regions, intraventricular regions, and posterior third ventricle, pineal, and cerebellar. Each one of them, I'll try to show you a few of the of our work and experience. For the last 30 years, we have treated nearing about 220 epidermoids at all locations in the intracranial cavity as well as spinal ones. Microsurgical removal, as all of us know, is a gold standard. We started in 1994, endoscope since 2006 application, and navigation we started using in 2009. Now, I'll take you through a few of our work and, uh, and the practical management of these lesions in the supratentorial compartment, first starting with a bifrontal epidermoid in an adult male presenting with the seizures and progressive weakness. These are the CT scan showing the location of the epidermoid in the midline going on to the both sides. He presented, as I mentioned to you, uncontrolled seizures, and this is the one. We planned a bifrontal craniotomy and first bifrontal and cross the midline so that if there's a difficulty, we have to access it from both the sides. Taking on one side itself is of no use. We have to decompress on both sides. So we cross the midline, and that's the superficial sinus. The bone is separated, and that is the, the opposite side on the right side. First, we access it from the right side. The, 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 the dura mater is open. And most important, as of all, all of us know, when you go to interhemispheric approach, the preservation of cortical veins is of utmost importance, which can make and break the surgery in such cases. The dura is retracted, the arachnoidal bands and adhesions are resected, and the frontal lobe is gently pushed opposite side, and it is protected with wet cottons all along the length which are exposed, and the veins are protected with wet cottons. Now we expose the interhemispheric lesion. The most important the next step is to open the arachnoid. Unless you open the arachnoid, we cannot access these lesions. So take our own time and open the of the tumor. And the most important issue, I'm sure all of us are aware, we have treated in our, our work. These are absolutely vascular structures. There are absolutely no, no vessels inside. But one thing is to be sure, they may engulf, they may encircle the nerves and vessels. So one has to be very smooth here when you are resecting the chest because the vascular structure don't be able to take off the lesion. Gentle, smooth separation and dissection and extraction. They come out easily provided we are like to treat your girlfriend. And that's what our professor used to say. Once we take it out from the other one side, now we use an endoscope to see if there is a tumor, how big it's on the other side. Now, we felt that through the same approach, without going to the craniotomy on the opposite side or opening the skull, we can make a window into the fox as shown here. We make a window of about two inches by one inch in the fox, center of the fox, and access to the opposite side also. Now, you again, the same step follows. You open the arachnoid and gently start dissecting the epidermoid through the window and push it towards the main operating site and separate it and try to try to be in the boundary of the epidermoid and bring it to your operating field and take it out of the tumor. This is a very smooth and slow dissection, a gentle dissection. It comes out very easily, but one must have a good patience in extracting these lesions. At every stage of dissection, keep washing 
And if you are not very certain, keep using the endoscope again and again to see the extent of resection because as I mentioned to you earlier, there is a crevices. We don't know how much you have taken out unless you visualize which cannot be done through the microscope. The lesion is taken out completely now. Absolutely most diseases achieved and secured. Both dura is replaced, bone is placed. Craniotomy is reconstructed and that is the patient postoperatively on, on, on follow-up, absolutely no neurological deficits. And this is a CT scan postoperatively. There is a small clot, surgical retraction of the frontal lobe, but a small one without any problem. Next, intraventricular epidermoid in a young individual. The large epidermoid here, you can see starting from the skull base, going into the temporal lobe and involving the ventricles. We it to the left a pedicle flap. The most important issue here is to reach the, the base of the skull and drill the base of the skull as we approach the, the petroclival regions or, or you reach the base of the skull regions. So drill the temporal bone well so that your temporal lobe retraction becomes less. The mastoid air cells, petrous air cells are waxed. Now, once you do that comfortably, you can go inside. And as soon as you enter inside, you can see the tumor there. And as I mentioned to you earlier, same steps of dissection are started. The more important uh, initial step would be the core decompression of the tumor. One must remember these lesions are very chronically growing lesions and they create a space for us to operate. So what we need to do is just do the core decompression and we'll get a large space to operate. Now, once we do that, now we can see that immediately. We can see the posterior communicating artery, posterior cerebral artery and the midbrain. Now we go, once we do the central decompression, now you start dissecting it from the periphery. Now, <clears throat> that is the posterior part of the tumor, gently gently evacuated and usually what happens is there is there is a good amount of uh, the, the separation line between the brain and the tumor one needs to identify that and remain in that plane and don't try to regress just to follow the plane of separation and don't try to get into the brain and be gentle as i mentioned and now you see whole lesion is taken out now and we are in the ventricular cavity temporal horn and the lateral ventricle once we are in the ependyma, one needs to be very, very slow. Now you can see the choroidal vessels there. I'd, I'd, I'd choroid plexus, which is added into the tumor. Now, gently, that is separated and with a sharp dissection, the lesion is taken out completely. That is the end stage of surgery. The ependymal vessels are not injured. The tumor is taken out. A small bit of the tumor may be added into the ependyma. Don't try to chase it and cause damage to the ependyma. Leave it and observe. This is the patient on post-operative day three. This is a post-operative scan with no deficits at all. And this is a post-operative scan shows complete excision of the lesion. Micro tumor may be left behind, but they take decades to grow. One need to just keep them under observation and follow. This is a supracellular intra-third ventricular and intralateral ventricular epidermoid in an elderly lady presented with seizures and progressive dementia and she came to us. That is a CT MRI scan showing the lesion. This was again accessed <clears throat> through interhemispheric fissure because lesion is going quite high up into the lateral ventricle as well as the third ventricle. Now we access interhemispherically, as I told you. Then the, the fox is cut and we make a space there, open the capsule of the tumor. Once we do that, the, as I mentioned to you earlier, there's enough space created by the tumor itself, which we can gently decompress. And in this case, the consistency of the tumor is a little softish because of the cystic thing of nature. Now the tumor is completely resected and taken out. Now, as you see, as we see, now the, the tu tumor is decompressed and the part of the tumor which is inside is gently removed once you do that see that because of this chronicity and since the, the, the origin of the tumor is quite at a young age 
there is no hypothalamus we are encountering. Directly when we excise the tumor, we are in the supracellular space. Supracellular space. And you can see all the structures. From top, you can see the dorsal surface of the optic nerve, optic chiasm, lateral part of the optic nerve and chiasm. And you can see the perforators of the optic nerve and chiasm. You can see the anterior artery. And the deeper part of the epidermoid going into the infundibular recess is removed. As slowly, we have to be very careful because we don't know where is the hypothalamus here and the third ventricle here because all are distorted. So one has to be very, very careful and keep washing. Now we have reached the end stage of the surgery. From top, from the dorsal surface, we are seeing the carotid artery, the origin of the, uh, the, the uh, circle of willis, the left optic nerve, right optic nerve, infundibular recess, and all, all, the, all, the, all the structures. And you can see the dorsal surface of the chiasm, and you can see the infundibular infundibulum and pituitary stalk, and that's the optic chiasm we are seeing from the surface, from dorsal surface. That is the infundibulum, and that is a suprasolar region, complete removal of the lesion is done. And that is the end stage of surgery. We make an opening into the anterior part. We don't know what is it. It's an arachnoidal membrane. It could be lamina terminalis, and that is opened and made communication with the subarachnoid space to to, to relieve the ventriculomegaly or ventricular dilatation. That's the end stage of surgery. And this is the patient postoperatively without neurological deficits on day one. And day three, she is mobilized and wheelchair. This is a postoperative scan showing complete excision of a lesion. Postoperatively, one must remember the, 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 it takes, the, the time it takes is to, uh, to reduce or to come back to normalcy in epidermis quite some time. Third, this is under posterior third ventricular uh, epidermoid, a large epidermoid in a young individual presented with ataxia, uncontrolled seizures, and headache. This, we, this is the MRI showing the situation and location of the epidermoid. We planned through both the ways, supratentorial, infratentorial. First, we did a supratentorial posterior interhemispheric approach, that is parieto-occipital. We accessed the midline and entered the interhemispheric region on the right side and the lesion is accessed and gently with the same principles the decompression is done as much as as much as possible and the the deep bulking of the tumor is done here the what is visible again <coughs> is decompressed and and taken out now again the opposite side, we had prepared to make a craniotomy, but we thought, well, again, our own principle, make a window into the posterior fox and try to access. We excise the part of the fox, posterior one third, and, and go to the opposite side. Now, again, we bring in the endoscope and see how much tumor is there and where it is located. Again, once we know the exact location of the tumor, either with the endoscope help or a microscope, you can take off the tumor complete. That is the excision of the fox and making window into the posterior one third of the fox. I think they'll just go fast forward so that you can show some more videos. That is the opposite side tumor taken out, dissected and taken out from the posterior third ventricular region. At every stage, keep watching where you are and how much you have done and how much is remaining there. You don't have to take out completely part of the lesion which is not coming out or adherent to the important structures, vessels and nerves we can leave behind. As I mentioned to you earlier, they take years to grow back and you can just keep under observation. That is the, the maximum deep bulking is done. Now, with the help of endoscope, if it microscope is not helping, <coughs> we can decompress with the help of endoscope also and take out as much as it comes. One thing is, one, remember, the, 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 the epidermoid adherent to the brain surface, one must be very gentle. Try, don't try to pull it out because beyond your vision, if the bleeding starts, it's difficult to control. That's the end stage of the surgery. And this is a patient postoperatively without any neurological deficits on day two. And this is at, at the time of discharge, is perfectly fine. No, 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 no. 
This is the post-operative CT com showing complete excision of the lesion. Next is posterior fossa epidermoids. Most commonly, what we are called upon to treat in our day-to-day -day work is, is the cerebellopontine angle epidermoids. Majority of the time, they manifest with cranial nerve deficits or trigeminal neuralgia or cerebellar signs. This is a young adult presented with severe trigeminal neuralgia. And this is the MRI showing the big uh, epidermoid located. We operate these patients, prefer to do it in the lateral position. And we do curvilinear incision, retromastoid. And we'd like, we, we prefer to do the craniotomy than craniectomy. Upper tuber holes are made just below the transverse sinus and use a craniotome and take out a big chunk of bone. And the medial limit and the lateral limit is at the mastoids always drill the mastoid and, and up to the anterior border of the uh, sigmoid sinus and the dura mater is opened in a cruciate manner. Next important step is to access the cerebellopontine angle. Once you reach there, the important next step is to open the arachnoid. And as I mentioned to earlier, unless you open the arachnoid, you cannot access these lesions. Now the arachnoid is opened and the, the capsule is open and tumor is deep bulk. Now you see there's a pleasure to take out these lesions because they're absolutely a vascular soft, come out easily, but our handling has to be very smooth and safe, comfortable exchange of these lesions. Once you do that, next need, we need to separate them from the surrounding cerebellum and the brain stem. If you are in a good plane of cleavage which you have created, gently you can just extract it and pull it with a slow and comfortable movements away from the cerebellum initially, the superficially, and next as you go deeper and medially you start getting the brain stem. Again, arachnoid is cut with a sharp dissection. We need to do that. Once we do that, next we see the deeper part all the cranial nerves in the cerebellopontine angle, they'll be engulfed or encased by the tumor. Lower pole is usually associated with the lower cranial nerves. One should be always looking out for the lower cranial nerves. Now you see the whole tumor is taken out from the lower cranial nerves. That is the pica loop on the lower cranial nerves. That's a seventh, eighth complex. And that is the, the, the pica loop. Now the whole microsurgical anatomy is seen very com comfortably here. You can see the lower cranials originating from the medulla, and this is the pons. That's the pica vertebral artery. That is the ica sixth nerve, seventh eighth complex, and that is the trigeminal nerve, which was being engulfed by tumor. Now again, we bring in the endoscope and see how much you have resected because. Most important here is patient is not worried about how much you have taken out, but he is worried my trigeminal pain should go. So 360 degrees visualization of the trigeminal nerve is only possible with the endoscope. Microscope may not help. We can see the superficial part. Now with the endoscope, you can see all the structures in the cerebellopontine angle, vessels, nerves, and, and, and the other structures are, definite, are, are very clearly seen. And safely, the whole lesion is out. And that is the end stage of surgery. Dura mater is closed with a, with, with a graft and bone is replaced and, and the scap is closed in two legs. This is the patient post-operative on day two, no deficits. And he says his pain has completely gone. He is Five very minutes happy. Repeat. Thank you. Maybe one video I'll show and I'll stop. Thank you. This is a post-operative scan showing complete excision of the tumor. Next, I think uh, I've come to the end of it. I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip. This is a squadrogeminal cisternal epidermoid, infratentorial, supracerebellar approach. Again, similar way. I think I'll skip this video. And next one is cavernous sinus petroclival epidermoid. This one, I think I'll show you and I'll stop the last. This is the last video. I have two more, but I'll be short of time. I'll stop. This is a, an elderly lady presented with tingling numbness, the right side of the face, severe trigeminalgia, and swaying while walking. The lesion is, is going from the like a trigeminal schwannoma. Our preoperative diagnosis was a trigeminal schwannoma. Part of the tumor is in the posterior fossa, part of the tumor is in paracavernous, cavernous sinus region. 
and going through the through the tentatorium and paratheotomous region with a significant pressure on the midbrain. That is the MRI. And we planned, as I mentioned to you earlier, both the approaches. First, we thought we'll go through the uh, retromastoid suboccipital approach. And again, second, uh, after this excision, we, we extend the incision and go through subtemporal. But luckily, it came out the same way. This is again the retromastoid suboccipital craniotomy. I'm not going to the details of it. Now, dura mater is open. And first, here the cerebellum was quite tense and bulging. In such case, we'd like to open the cisterna magna, which is of great help, helps in the reduction of, of, of the pressure, CSF is absolutely drained like a sylvan fissure opening. Now you see the, the tumor is exposed. There's up the seventh eighth complex encircling the tumor and separated from it inside the retinal plane. Capsule is opened and a debulking is started. I'll go a little faster. The internal decompression is done and a tumor is, the, the epidermal is uh, with the same principles is taken out. Now you see the, the good plane of cleavage from the cerebellum and the pons and the medulla is, is very, very, very nicely seen here. And one, one need not be worried once we have that a good capsule and pain of clears. Now from here, we could follow it through the paracautus region, the, 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 the space it had created. We entered inside from the, posterior, the superior part of the cerebral pontern and angled itself and got inside. You can see the, the, the paracavernous and supratentorial part could be taken out from the same approach. Unfortunately, that day our endoscope had some problem. We could not use it. Otherwise, I would have shown you the endoscope, the end of the surgery. You can see the jugular foramen, all the cranial nerves are very well preserved, shown in the complex. And I know that is the vertebral artery that is the, the becoming a basilar artery, lower part of the tumor adherent to the lower cranial nerves is gently taken out. The capsule is inseparably fused to the surrounding important neurovascular structure. That's a subtemporal part, trapclear nerve and the third nerve are seen and superior cerebral artery. We try to excise the capsule, but it does not mean we coagulated and left. Don't try to pull it and cause significant neurologic exits. What her symptoms are relieved, and that's what is more important. And that's a patient, the end stage of surgery, and the dura is closed with the facial graft, and 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 the bone is replaced, and that's a patient postoperatively with minimal weakness on the right side with the no neurological deficits, and this is a scan, complete excision of the tumor. I think one more is there. I, I'll skip it up. Cere cerebellar large midline epidermal. I'll not go through it. Uh, some it is, it is video sub meeting. I can we can show and discuss. We had a complications nine deaths in 215 cases in last over 250 to 160 cases. No mortality. Various complications like hemiparesis, cranial node deficits, CSF leaks, meningitis, behavioral abnormalities were observed. And chemical aseptic meningitis were detected in 11 cases. Majority were reversible within 6 to 12 weeks. And 11 cases we had to redo the surgery in 4 to 9 years. Outcome of surgical management of complex introductory epidermis is excellent with least morbidity and practically no mortality. The goal of treatment should be maximum safe surgical resection with no damage to important neurovascular structures. Extensive skull based approaches are not required to expose the entire tumor. Combined microsurgical endoscopic resection with navigation, image guide, and assistance are the ideal to achieve maximum safe resection in the majority of the cases. With these applications, neurovascular morbidity and mortality are taken away with excellent outcomes. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I have crossed that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suresh, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank as, you, sir. Thank as you know, and as we all know, that uh, epidermoids are uh, quite a tumor. In one of the meetings, I had said that epidermoids are like Mumbai slums. Wherever there is space, they just generate and then they grow and then they grow so much that they infiltrate into the adjoining buildings and things like that. So these are real tumors, but these are benign people and benign tumors. 
basically they wherever there is space they ent enter into that space and slowly slowly and surely and definitely over several years they grow in size most important thing is as suresh mentioned that many of these patients have very marginal symptoms if at all and the tumors when you look at the tumors they just invade into not invade but enter into various zones and regions and case the arteries and case the perforators and case the cranial nerves and that makes it a challenging tumor because when you are removing you can damage a cranial nerve which was not damaged earlier so it, it is a, actually patients come with marginal symptoms like a little bit headache or little bit giddiness and you can create diplopia you can create facial nerve disability you can create various morbidities so it is a very challenging tumor and a very it is a responsibility of the surgeon that you could do not create any deficit for any neurosurgery but particularly for these benign tumors where the symptoms are hardly there and the tumors are in such critical areas so there is a very special way of removing these tumors these tumors have to be removed in a very specific manner they have to be dissected they are avascular tumors they are soft tumors but they go here and there so these kind of you know the adjuncts which uh, dr dugani has mentioned about endoscope and of navigation and all those things can be helpful in this situation particularly they are multi compartmental in many situation like go from middle fossa to the posterior fossa and things like that in one of my articles i had mentioned that these tumors particularly those located in the region of ambient system where they go in the temporal region in the posterior fossa they should not be called cp angle tumors they should be called tentorium based epidermoid tumors and for these tumors supra cerebellar approach is a very fantastic approach where you go supra cerebellar remove the tumor around the brain stem then cut the tentorium go in the middle fossa and remove the tumor in that location other very common location is the epi uh, pineal region epidermoid in the posterior part of the tentorium so anterior tentorial epidermoid is one big group posterior tentorial or pineal region epidermoid is another group and other regions like intraventricular interhemispheric and other areas are less common but they are seen here and there so these require special attitude of the surgeon special surgical strategy what different i will do from suresh i am not able to tell you but maybe my my exposure may not be so big as uh, suresh had bifrontal craniotomies and things like that maybe i take a little bit smaller exposure because uh, of various reasons all in all i think i enjoyed uh, suresh your presentation i enjoyed your surgical technique and uh, and i enjoy your will to remove these tumors aggressively and radically other important just last point i wish to make is that considering that the cranial nerves are so important in this situation where the person is going to live normal life for next whatever life he has he is not it is not like a malignant tumor he is going to die in any case these patients will live for no, um, all their life so the need and the possibility of removing the capsule in its entirety should be very highly considered considered and it may not be possible in a large percentage of patients to remove the capsule in its entirety because it is of its invasiveness and its extension it this uh, tumors are quite fantastic neurosurgical issues and we should learn and we should do and we should do it properly other thing is in india we have much higher experience larger experience than any other country in the world i have seen in top in neurosurgical institutes in us and top neurosurgical institutes in europe do not have this kind of experience i saw that the numbers are more than 215 in dr dugani series you know our series may be more than 400 or 450 cases we have done in km hospital earlier so these kind of large numbers are not seen so we can talk with power and with great aggression when we talk in international meetings on epidemics congratulations suresh my dear friend thank you sir thank you <laughs> all we learned from you we are, I, as i mentioned to you earlier we keep following you sir thank you suresh can i, can I ask a question to suresh Yeah, please go ahead, Suresh. Is it is it okay? Yeah, Suresh, beautiful Suresh. presentation as usual. Thank you. 
Thank uh, you. Just Sumesh. a brief question, you know, uh, some of the epidermals, particularly in the CP and where, you know, the presentation is also trigeminal related. Uh, during surgery, if you find some, uh, you know, uh, uh, neurovascular contact, maybe venous or arterial or something uh, to the nerve, trigeminal nerve, do you really pay any attention to that or uh, do something or just leave it alone? No, that's a very good uh, practical uh, point, uh, Suresh. We, we come across all the time. Just now, uh, the sir also... Sorry, you are mute. No, no, yeah, correct, correct. No, so they, they had muted me. I had didn't mute. They had muted me. They so do. this is a very important. Yeah, thank you. It's very important for practical question, uh, Suresh. And just now, sir, Atul Goel, sir, Atul Goel, sir, mentioned this also. Most important is handling of the pain nerves. Your question is very important because what happens is we feel majority of the time the epidermoid is the cause of the trigeminal neuralgia, and we take it out. But as you mentioned, there may be, because of the shift of the vessel closer to the nerve, there may be neurovascular conflict. And I had about three cases like this in, in, uh, in those CP angle lesions. When I found even in spite of taking out the tumor, the neurovascular conflict was present. I, use, I put a Teflon, I put a muscle, separate the vessel from the nerve and decompress it. That's the best way to do it because patient doesn't bother how much tumor you have taken out or what surgery you have done. What he wants is his pain should go. That's all. That's his requirement. So I would do the, the, the neurovascular conflict release in spite of taking out the tumor. If, there is a, if you see on surgery, there is a conflict. A comment from Professor Goel. Yeah, it, you see, it is very many of these tumors present with hemifacial spasm, present with uh, trigeminal neuralgia, present with symptom of giddiness, and you know that we relate to the in the region of internal artery canal and meatus. So the thing is, we have to remove the tumor, and we have to remove nothing but the tumor. And tumor presses the vessel, and the vessel presses presses on the nerve. Whether we find the vessel or we do not find the vessel, whether we have whatever we have, we have to remove the tumor and we have to dissect the tumor. And the tumor comes out very beautifully in this area. It is beautiful, all right, but you know we should retain that beauty for the patient. We should not in any case damage the facial nerve and all those things, which are very high responsibility of the surgeon. So uh, these are you know fascinating tumors to say the least. As we all know in India, I mentioned that we have the beautiful experience. Now, why it is more in India, I'm not sure, but I related to subtle infections that is also like cholesteatomas. We talk of infection. We do not talk of infection in epidermoid. But whether there is some kind of subtlety of infection that relates to uh, this generation of epidermoids in our country more than other countries is only to be speculated. In any case, uh, Suresh, I think the organizers are asking me to stop the thing now to go on to the next presentation. Yes, and yes, I congratulate yes. you. And I thank you, sir. Vernon, to give me this opportunity to see the face of Suresh closely. And thank you, sir. I'm happy about it. Thank you. Same for, same for me. Hope to see you soon. Sometime in, in the future, very yes. soon. Yes, thank, thank, you. You. Okay. thank you. Good day, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, Goel, sir. And thank you, Dugani, sir. So thank we you. quickly move on to next uh, uh, talk. And I would like to invite uh, Nadkarni, sir, who is a professor and head at the Department of Neurosurgery in Nair Hospital, as well as consultant neurosurgeon at HN Reliance Foundation Hospital in Mumbai, to introduce the next speaker for the session. Yeah. Good, good afternoon to everyone. And at the outset, I definitely want to congratulate uh, Professor Vernon Vello and his team for organizing this uh, exhaustive and comprehensive session on operative uh, videos, uh, both cranial and spinal. And I'm sure that not only postgraduate students, uh, even young consultants and consultants in practice uh, will benefit a lot from the tips and suggestions from the senior neurosurgeons who are presenting their exemplary work. Uh, congratulations, uh, Professor uh, Varna. Uh, it is a pleasure to invite the next speaker, uh, that is Dr. Suresh Sankla. He requires no introduction. Uh, at present, he is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at Global Hospital uh, in Mumbai. 
and he as you as everyone knows that he is a member and office bearer of several national and international societies of neurosurgery and uh, he is a very senior neurosurgeon of the city of mumbai so dr suresh please go ahead and present your topic today on endoscopic excision of skull based tumors yeah yeah it was there. You are over. Thank, Your time was thank you very much, uh, Dr. Narkandi, for this nice uh, uh, introduction. And uh, thanks once again uh, to Dr. Vernon and his team for organizing this uh, brilliant symposium today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, endoscopic skull base neurosurgery, uh, which has uh, uh, been a real standard of management care. Uh, in the patients who have skull based tumors, uh, and we have to thank and give the credit to all these uh, uh, skull based surgeons who have really worked hard in in uh, last several decades to really uh, bring this specialty or this procedure to this level today. Uh, there are certain uh, advantages of uh, endoscopic endonasal approach that we are all aware of. Uh, I I don't want to you know go. Uh, uh, over this thing again, but yes, there are uh, several things which are different than what we really encounter or when we really practice uh, during the open transcranial skull base approaches. Uh, and that is the advantage of the endoscopic and uh, uh, approaches. So basically we uh, open the sphenoid sinus uh, and uh, uh, go to the roof of the sphenoid sinus and you identify all the landmarks uh, and then the, uh, select, select your opening uh, uh, very suitable uh, for exposing the intracranial lesion. Uh, and that you can do by drilling away the bone uh, at the skull base. Uh, we prefer uh, bi nostril, bi manual, forehand method. And we uh, use the similar microsurgical uh, tactics that we perform in the transcranial approaches. Uh, and this is the, the picture of the binostral technique where uh, you put the endoscope on the right nostril up and uh, then the suction uh, in the lower part of the right nostril, then the irrigation on the left nostril and the instrument in the lower part of the uh, left uh, nostril. Uh, and then you have a, you know, the endoscopy visualization, which has to be uh, uh, very, very illustrative to be able to really uh, identify all these structures and uh, carry on with the micro dissections as you do under the microscopic vision. So I'll go uh, and show a few cases uh, which we have been we have done recently at last few years uh, uh, utilizing the same uh, extended endoscopic technique. Uh, so this is a 13 year old male who presented to some other institution. Uh, with uh, headaches, which is progressively increasing for last two weeks, diminution of vision, vomiting, drowsiness, uh, <coughs> and hell, peptidal edema. And this is the MR. This is the CT scan, which has shown uh, skull based lesion, cellar, suprasellar region. What are you saying? You had both Can you, excuse me, can you mute everybody, please? Uh, there's so much of disturbance going on. Thank you. So cellar supracellular cystic party solid tumor uh, obstructing the anterior part of the third ventricle causing obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, and uh, these are the vision and this is the contrast MRI scan showing a nicely located lesion into the cella and the supracellular region, which is partly cystic and partly solid, partly enhancing, partly not enhancing, uh, compressing the anterior third ventricular uh, cavity and causing causing uh, uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. So while before choosing uh, the, the approach, you have to see the anatomy, uh, the, uh, the neuro imaging and the MRI scan and the CT scan are used to really identify what are the anatomical uh, factors which are uh, helping you in choosing the or selecting the approach. So the enlarged cella and the lesion uh, reaching up to the, the lowest part of the uh, bony floor is one indication where you can choose the endoscopic endonasal approach. So hydrocephalus was treated with the VP shunt in that institution and then the patient came to us uh, with a very comfortable situation. The ventricles are decompressed and this is the lesion which was seen very well on the repeat MRI scan on admission. 
uh, we chose the endoscopic endonasal uh, approach for the same region that the lesion was reaching up to the cella and the cella was uh, enlarged. Cellar floor uh, was very much visible and we did not find any, any uh, uh, vital uh, brain structure between the tumor capsule and the cella cellar floor. So we chose this approach. So we standard uh, with the nasal dissection, uh, identified the ostea, then the uh, sonar's cavity was opened, the sonar sinus was really drilled laterally so as to uh, accommodate large space uh, and instruments during the dissection. Uh, and then this uh, at the floor or the roof of the cella, we identified all the structure and then we drilled away all the bone which is posterior part of the tuberculum cella, uh, uh, plenum, and then the entire tuberculum cella and the cellar floor, anterior wall and the floor of the cella. This is the whole area and the dura was, uh, was exposed. Now begin with this video with the dural opening. So dura is open in, uh, can be open in many ways, but uh, everything depends on the preoperative uh, uh, identification of the tumor location. So here the tumor was uh, completely located in the anterior part of the cella as well as in the supracellular region, uh, lifting the diaphragm and the chiasma up. So we opened the cella in the, uh, we opened the dura in the cellular region and then extended up. Uh, here is the intercavernous sinus, which was coagulated and a vertical uh, incision was extended which in the supracellular region was uh, extended laterally so as to uh, have a much wider dural uh, exposure. The moment you open the dura, all you see is the tumor covered by the cellar arachnoid. And that is very important because it is here that you pick up the arachnoid plane. Uh, once you lose this arachnoid plane, then it is very difficult to find it again laterally. And then you end up with uh, uh, so many disturbances in handling the uh, supracellular structures. So the dura is open here uh, and the tumor is exposed. Once the tumor is exposed, uh, then the arachnoid is incised in the midline and then the subarachnoid uh, uh, space is utilized. And uh, the so this is the arachnoid which we have opened. The shining arachnoid is seen very well. And we release the CSF so that uh, you can have a relaxed dissection. Uh, uh, the moment you do that, you identify the pituitary gland or we identified the pituitary gland in this particular case and we followed the pituitary gland up uh, uh, and uh, stock was seen. Uh, once the stock was seen, then we kept the stock all the time in the vision. This is the stock here. Uh, and we started decompressing the tumor. So this is the pituitary gland and this is the stock. So once the stock was identified, we went ahead and uh, do the, the tumor decompression. So this is tumor decompression. Uh, you can see small flakes of uh, calcification all around the tumor, within the tumor, as well as in the, the, the outer uh, capsular area. Uh, the tumor is otherwise quite soft uh, and can be resected, but not exactly the suckable. Here we have still not encountered one of the, the cysts that we have uh, seen in the preoperative uh, MRI scan. Now, this is all the solid part. The moment you decompress the tumor, you'll find more and more space uh, around the capsule, which will really uh, help you dissecting the, uh, the, the uh, capsule from the arachnoid laterally as well as uh, superiorly. So this is after decompression, you have this arachnoid of supracellular region, which you have separated from the tumor capsule. And here you see the posterior communicating artery, the third nerve. Now we are working at the superior cerebellar artery here. Uh, and then the basilar trunk, which is seen in the midline here, as you do more decompression and remove tumor bit by bit. Uh, there is some calcification, which is quite hard at time, but so it is not difficult to remove it. So this is the tumor uh, which has been separated from the superior cerebellar artery. And PC, this is PCOM and PCA and uh, bifurcation right behind this. You can see the vertebral artery here. So this tumor, and then the similar dissection is done on the uh, contralateral side. The tumor is completely relaxed, so it is easy to find and work in the arachnoid uh, space. And uh, basically you, re 
the sac between the arachnoid of the supracellular region and the capsule here, uh, keeping in mind that uh, the, the pituitary stalk here and all the time you have to keep looking at the stalk uh, and try and see if you can separate the, the stalk, uh, the tumor from the stalk, which at times is, is possible to do. Uh, and by uh, working in the same space, you try and remove the tumor as much as possible. Sometimes it is very difficult because of the, uh, the stock position within the tumor. It is so badly adherent. And sometimes you are worried about the vascularity of the hypothalamus as well as of the stock. You might have to leave some part of the tumor stuck to the stock and hypothalamus. But otherwise, if you find a good plane, you continue to work in that plane uh, and uh, continue to remove this tumor slowly and gently. Uh, whenever there is, uh, there is uh, no calcification, the periphery, uh, you try and find the plane of cleavage between the hypothalamus. So this is the hypothalamus here, and some of the calcification uh, is still stuck to the hypothalamus, but most of the soft part of the tumor uh, is being dissected away quite uh, uh, clearly. And this is one of the cysts which was uh, uh, ruptured during the surgery and uh, the fluid was drained away, uh, which also made a lot of difference as far as the dissection and complete decompression is concerned. Uh, here we are removing the last bit part of the, uh, this is another cyst which we uh, saw uh, after removing this part of the, of the tumor and we just uh, opened this cyst and tried to remove the cyst wall a little bit and drained away the cyst so as to completely relax the area and communicate it with the basal system so that uh, uh, it will remain like this. So now we have done quite a lot of uh, dissection. Uh, some bit of calcification is left. This is the anterior third ventricular. This is the interpedenticular fossa. This is the basilar artery, the superior cerebellar artery, uh, the third nerve and picom here, uh, and the tumor has been uh, removed completely. These are the post-operative scan, and you can still see some of the, the calcification stuck to the hypothalamus, but most of the tumor and the cysts have been drained away. Uh, this is the post-operative MRI scan three months later, which shows a slight uh, enhancing area uh, right at the top of the third ventricular region, but most of the tumor in the subcellular as well as supracellular region has been removed completely utilizing this uh, approach. Uh, I just go through the second case, which is uh, uh, tuberculum cellar meningioma in a 52-year-old female who uh, presented with frontal headaches and progressive uh, loss of vision. This is our visual, visual charting. And here you can see the tumor occupying the tuberculum cellar region and extending up superiorly to uh, uh, involve some posterior part of the planum as well as the tuberculum cellar. Uh, in the coronary scan, you can see the tumor slightly approaching towards the left uh, optic foramen, and probably there is compression of the left optic, um, optic nerve there. So uh, we chose the same uh, transtuberculum, transplenum, transnasal approach here, the uh, transnasal dissection, spinal sinus dissection, and drilling of the roof of the uh, uh, spinal sinus, uh, the tuberculum cella, and posterior part of the third ventricle, third posterior part of the plenum has been done, uh, and this is the dura. So here we uh, open the dura a little uh, differently because uh, the tumor is all stuck to the dura. Uh, it is, in fact, arising from that part of the uh, meninges. Uh, this is uh, hyperostotic uh, uh, bone of the tuberculum cella, which uh, I, I just want to show you uh, how uh, effective the drilling in this area. Uh, at the same time, you can see the, the optic protuberance and the carotid protuberance and all the anatomical landmark clearly in the vision so that you do not miss any of the landmarks and uh, end up in, in some different uh, uh, area or damage the, the vital neurovascular structure. So once you have done this, then the dura is exposed. So here we try and go above the, in the supracellular region, above the uh, tumor margins. So you can feel the tumor bulge uh, and then go and open the dura in the supracellular region to see the top of the tumor because uh, then you have to go around the tumor attachment and uh, remove the tumor uh, subsequently. So this is the interhemispheric fissure. You see both the frontal lobes here and this is the top of the supracellular region. The optic chiasm has been pushed backwards uh, as you see on the preoperative MRI scan. So you are pretty much safe in this area 
to uh, uh, cut the dura safely after coagulation. So here you see the tumor capsule, the tumor is bulging and lifting the frontal lobes up. Up, this is the interhemispheric fissure. And from here, keeping the, the tumor margins uh, on site all the time, then you go and go towards the cellular region and go below to open the dura. Uh, the intercavernous sinus is usually occluded by the tumor. So you don't encounter much of the bleeding. And if there is small bleeding, you can always control. Then you go to the affected site with the left optic now, uh, try and inspect this area and uh, remain in the arachnoid space. And you identify the left optic nerve. Here in this case, it looks quite relaxed and you don't see the tumor extending into the left optic foramen. If you see that, then you have to remove or cut this dura and then expose the medial wall of the optic canal and then drill it and then remove that tumor. But here it is not the case. So you are just very safe uh, and very comfortable. This is the optic nerve. Uh, work in the, the space between the optic nerve and the tumor capsule, uh, use sharp dissection, blunt dissection, whatever you are comfortable with. Uh, the dissection techniques are the same as we use in the uh, microsurgical procedures using both your hands. Uh, this is the, the A2, which you see first uh, and try and uh, continue dissecting the, the neurovascular structures in the same direction. Uh, once the tumor has been decompressed, it is pretty easy to mobilize the capsule away from these structures. Uh, if you find little resistance and little bulk here, then you go back within the tumor cavity and do further dissection and debulking of the tumor. So here the uh, anterior cerebral complex seen completely. These are the A1 here and bilaterally going into the uh, intrahemesic fissure are the A2. This is the arachnoid of the frontal lobe, which you have to preserve because that protects the frontal lobe from falling down and occupying the, the tumor uh, or cavity abruptly. So here you are going to the right side and you are uh, removing the tumor and uh, uh, debulking the tumor again, looking for the, the pituitary stalk here. Uh, more you, you remove the uh, piecemeal dissection, you will come to see the, the neurovascular structures very, very clearly and here, uh, is the pituitary stalk. This is the pituitary gland. This is the pituitary stalk. The pituitary stalk usually is, is easier to remove in meningiomas as compared to craniopharyngiomas because there is always a good plane of arachnoid around it. Uh, so you uh, remain in the same arachnoid plane and try and dissect the pituitary stalk completely from, uh, uh, from this uh, area. This is the dorsum cella, which you see behind the pituitary stalk here and then the interpeditical cistern. So once you have done this thing, then you come back to the posterior part of this and uh, uh, try and work in the same uh, area and dissect the anterior part of the optic chasm uh, and the tumor capsule. The tumor capsule is already now so redundant that it can be usually moved around from side to side, up, down, everywhere. So you have dissected it from left side, from right side, from the uh, anterior cerebral complex. And this is the last part of the dissection where you have separated it from the anterior part of the optic chasm. And this is the end of the surgery where the tumor capsule has been completely dissected away from all these structures. And uh, you see all these structures quite well. Uh, and uh, the tumor is uh, removed completely. As we have seen on the left side, the right optic nerve is quite uh, is also seen very relaxed, and you don't see the tumor extending into the right optic canal. Uh, if you see it, then you uh, do the dural removal and the optic nerve drilling, optic canal drilling, the medial part of the optic canal. But here it is not seen, so you are okay that way and uh, 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 pull this tumor out once it has been dissected uh, completely. So this is the end of the procedure. Tumor removal has been done completely. Uh, just a, a brief uh, uh, demonstration of the closure technique because the skull-based reconstruction is very, very important. And we nowadays follow this 3F formula, which is the uh, insertion of fat in the uh, dead space, uh, then a, a very robust flap, a dead flap, 
uh, and fast immobilization, fast mobilization patient in the post-operative period. And that works well for us. Uh, and it has been a very, very standard method. So fat has been put in and then there is a facial letter just to uh, inlay, inlay uh, facial letter just to keep the fat in, in place. Uh, and if possible, uh, then you reconstruct the skull base with a piece of bone, if you can do that. So we uh, usually try and look for a small piece of very well cut uh, bone piece, which can be fit in there in the uh, floor of the cellar. And then uh, this is the, then we'll bring the, bring the uh, pre-planned and prepared uh, head art flap, which you put it there and make sure that it really covers the entire exposed area. Uh, it, it should really stay in the touch with the bones of the sphenoid sinus, as well as that bone graft that we have put towards the end of the surgery. Once you have done all this thing, then uh, uh, you make sure that uh, this graft remains in, uh, stays in place. So you put some tissue glue all around it uh, and allow this to, to stay there. And then the usual, nasal packs which we keep for 48 hours uh, in some cases we also keep the lumbar drain but in most of the cases nowadays we don't put any lumbar drain so these are the post-operative uh, scans showing a complete uh, resection of the tumor both the optic foramen are also clear and this is our graft which is really covering the uh, bony defect uh, very well uh, and then uh, there is uh, uh, no pneumocephalus or no CSF seen in the post-operative period. I think uh, I would just stop uh, here and uh, uh, we will take more questions at this point. Thank you very much, Dr. Nakhani. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Sankla. Uh, thank you. That was a very lucid and very uh, illustrative videos on the uh, role of endoscopic surgery for skull-based tumors. I had a few questions. Uh, the first question was, um, how, how many times have you had to, you know, uh, convert your endoscopic approach to cranial surgery uh, for, say, a bleeding complication or some other complication? What was the incidence? Yes, we did not, uh, not even once we had to do this thing uh, for, for any intra-operative intra, uh, problems. But yes, many a times we have to really stop the dissection of the tumor because we found that it is either... Uh, not possible or it is uh, not risk-free to do carry on the dissection, particularly when the tumor is uh, extending beyond the visualization of the, uh, the skull base uh, approach. And then we subsequently, you know, come back again after a few months and do the transcranial approach. That has been uh, uh, a very accepted form of uh, treatment method, but yes, uh, we did not have to really convert it to transcranial approach, not even once. Okay. So a careful, sorry, uh, so a careful selection of cases is the key. Yeah. That is what I would like to say. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just wanted to note that you showed both cases were anterior cranial based tumors, uh, one pituitary and one plenum sphenoidal. Have you extended these endoscopic procedures to other skull based tumors in other compartments? Have you had yes. uh, experience? Uh, uh, but yes, you know, one uh, in one patient, we had to extend the, the anterior approach, more rostrum. So we had to drill a lot of bone from the plenum and up to the olfactory groove uh, to be able to remove the tumor because the tumor, uh, the, it was a meningioma and the, the uh, tumor tail was extending quite uh, anteriorly and we had to uh, extend our exposure. But it was possible and not much of uh, difficulty we encountered during this. Uh, similarly, in one patient, we had to drill the posterior clinoid, uh, posterior, the dorsum cellar, a little bit to have a better exposure. And that was done in a Rathke's cyst, which were extending below and in the, in the uh, anterior clival region. So we had to do that. You, you mentioned about this F3 method for skull base reconstruction. Yes, uh, yes. I would like to know that uh, in spite of this, you know, very comprehensive uh, skull base reconstruction, uh, you, have, you must have had, I'm sure, some CSF leak cases. Yes, and how yes. have you managed them? Can you just enlighten us? Yes, CSF leak. Uh, is, is a very common complication of uh, these extended procedures. And uh, after doing all these things, also we have the uh, 
uh, incidents of CS have leaked. But yes, one must uh, admit that ut after utilizing all these newer techniques and all precautions and everything, uh, the the rate of CS have leaked has, has decreased. In my particular, uh, in my series, it was 37% at once in the initial part of it, which has now become to less than 10%. So that much change we have to really uh, encounter. Yes, uh, in post-operative period, if you see in spite of all these precautions and all that, you have the uh, CSF leak, then you have to really go in again. Most of the time, it is not that the, the uh, reconstruction was inadequate. It was usually the reconstruction which was uh, not really adherent to the same place. Some uh, form of graft has moved somewhere uh, or shifted somewhere. So we had to reposition the graft maybe a little more aggressively and put lots of fat and you know lots of robust tissue in order to occupy or obliterate that opening. Uh, and then post-operatively we had to uh, uh, do more uh, bed rest and uh, rather than doing the faster uh, mobilization, you have to go slow about mobilization but it is possible to do it again uh, without changing any approach. And I'm sure you must be using some tissue sealants, uh, which is the one which you uh, use most often? There are several of them, but one which is uh, which has worked very well and we have the maximum experience is the tissue glue, which is uh, commercially available and it is, uh, uh, and we have not seen any adverse effect with that. And uh, uh, the, the glue effect, is uh, up to our satisfaction and we are quite happy with it. So you are talking of distill or? Uh, distill, distill, yes. Distill, okay. Uh, if there are any but, other questions uh, on, on the session? But, you know, over the, over the you know, years that we have been using it, we are using less and less. One question. Dependent. Yeah. Less and less glue dependent, more tissue dependent. Okay. Well, the question yes. was from? Yeah, Dr. Netalka here. Yes. Yeah, Suresh, that was a nice presentation. Uh, thanks for it. Uh, what is the role of the lumbar drain uh, for CSF leak, pre or post op? Uh, lumbar drain uh, has been, uh, you know, tried right from the beginning of these procedures. Even earlier, during the uh, simple uh, endoscopic approaches for pituitary adenoma, we used to use lumbar drain, and over a period of time, we realized. Mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the lumbar drain is not necessary in most of the cases. In fact, it is harmful because it can have its own complication like pneumocephalus, uh, subdural collections and mm -hmm. all these things. So uh, there was a time when we had really stopped using it. Uh, it was also a time when our techniques of closure and reconstruction was also improving. So with that, for many years, we did not use the uh, lumbar punctures. But now uh, with uh, the robust use of uh, these uh, approaches and larger and larger openings that we are making now for much uh, uh, larger tumors, we have realized that you know putting a lumbar drain and using it cautiously will not be a bad idea. So lately, I have started using lumbar puncture, lumbar uh, drain, but we use it very selectively only in the posterior, uh, on, only in the, the post-operative period, not during intraoperative period, uh, and very regulated drain means not more than five to ten cc uh, per hour for post-operative three to four days. That is, the, that is the only time when we really use this lumbar drain. Uh, when we are not really very happy with our uh, uh, closure techniques and uh, uh, practically it is not possible to obliterate or reconstruct it, uh, the skull base completely, then we use the lumbar drain very cautiously, but generally not. So is it the last question? Is it possible for you to do alternate cases, lumbar drain, no drain, and reduce this 10% incidence of CSF leak just to make a study of your own. Uh, absolutely, yeah. That is the precise reason why we have restarted using lumbar drain because you know even ten percent is more yeah. in these cases. So we have to really uh, move forward and reduce it uh, further to less than five percent. Uh, and one way to do it is uh, start using lumbar drain again. And that's why okay. we are. Using. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your suggestion. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think we'll end this session here and uh, back to you, Rishikesh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Narkarni sir. Thank you, Suresh Sankla sir. So that concludes a very exhaustive cranial session of this video webinar. And uh, I would like to hand over the baton to Dr. Harish.
to take over to this final sessions. Harish. Okay. Now moving on to the next session, that is the final session wherein uh, uh, we have with us six speakers. This is final session number one, wherein the six speakers will be talking on various uh, spinal operative videos. So first, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Shekhar Ch Chirmade. He is consultant neurosurgeon from Ashoka Medical Hospital, Nashik. To introduce our uh, first speaker in the final session, Dr. Ketan Desai. Hello, thank you, Harish. Uh, thank you, Varnan, for organizing such a fantastic video operative uh, sessions. And uh, also, thank you for making me part of it. Uh, I am inviting Dr. Ketan Desai, who is my good friend, and he is working in PD Hinduja Hospital. And he had he had a tremendous experience in brachial plexus injuries, and he's going to talk on um, surgery for the brachial plexus injuries. Over to Dr. Ketan Desai. Thank you, Seker, for your kind introduction, and thank you, Vernon, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, what I would do is to uh, uh, show some videos related to peripheral nerve. Uh, surgeries, I would not concentrate entirely on brachial fixes because it may become too boring. You know, I would try to show some common videos uh, for some common problems. And uh, there are few, two to three minutes videos. And I hope that this may be uh, informative and uh, may give some impetus uh, and stimulus to the neurosurgeons who widely are not involved in management of nerve problems. Uh, after our pioneering work, which was done by our seniors like Dr. Turel and Dr. V.S. Mehta, uh, lesser and lesser number of uh, neurosurgeons are involved in management of nerve problems, which I think should increase and the horizon for the neurosurgeons would increase in management of this problem. So uh, what I would do is to show a few videos and uh, then maybe in the end, uh, invite some questions. Seka, please stop me when, I, when my time allotted time is finished. I would stop there and there. Thank you. So uh, before beginning my talk, I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank my dear residents uh, who have done brilliant work, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Patankar and Dr. Alay Kandar. Without their help, this all video editing would not have been possible. Uh, these are the few videos that I'm going to show. And uh, the first one is uh, carpal tunnel uh, release. This is a common uh, problem, uh, more found in female. And you can see here the incision which, uh, which I take is I'll just stop here for one second. A parallel incision along the middle finger up to the distal wrist crease. You should not cross this. And uh, the limit of the upper end should be perpendicular line drawn from the abducted thumb. So this is the small incision which one should take to expose the median now in the carpal tunnel. So the, the skin and subcutaneous fascia is uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue is incised. And then what I do, I'll just stop here. Uh, you can see the fat pad here at the proxim at the distal end of the incision. And this is the most important thing we have need to identify. Once you identify this fat pad, you should not go beyond that because then there is a superficial palmar arc, the vessel uh, arc. You should not injure that. So once you identify this fat pad, just insert a dissector or a um, small mosquito forceps and go on cutting over it. This is the palmar fascia, which, uh, which is encountered first. Just incise over it, and it's a re relatively very simple, straightforward uh, uh, procedure. As you go on cutting it, now there is the flexor, thickened flexor retinaculum. You cut it by layer, and the fat will start mounting. So once you cut the flexor retinaculum, the median now will just bow out. And now I'm cutting the uh, flexor retinaculum, which is the thickened uh, connective tissue. Sometimes you can encounter bleeding, you can coagulate it. And this is the median now underneath. So this thickened flexor retinoculum is just incised under the dissector or the artery forceps. And my, my preference is to cut a small part of the deep fascia of the forearms because sometimes there can be a pincer effect. And then I do neurolysis of the now, the median now is neurolyzed just to uh, open up the epineurium. and uh, free the now 360 degree from the surrounding tendons, the flexor tendons, which are also 
the the contents of the carpal tunnel and this is the uh, the neurolysis median now so the, the the crux is to identify the fat pad and uh, just open up the facial band uh, along this and this is the incision which uh, i take so just to highlight few points related to carpal tunnel are that first you have to identify the fat plane and the dissection is done from distal to proximal uh, avoid uh, crossing the wrist because sometimes the incision or the scar over the wrist is painful and uh, exposure of the median now should be done uh, there is no need for any splinting uh, post operatively because uh, the bowing effect which is there more commonly in a smaller incision is not there here the median nerve is thoroughly neuralized and free so there is no need for any restriction of the joint movement or any splinting in fact patient is encouraged to Uh, move the limbs uh, wrist uh, post operatively to prevent uh, stiffness and contracture so i hope that this is uh, this video of carpal tunnel uh, is uh, uh, viewed by you all the second video is uh, brachial plexus repair which is uh, uh, the more uh, major problem in uh, now problem this is a case of a uh, up, uh, upper trunk to uh, division level neuroma in a young patient following a motorbike accident Uh, and uh, on exploration the patient had a large neuroma which failed to conduct electrical impulse and this is just a, uh, a schematic diagram to show what exactly the problem was this are, this is the normal anatomy this is the c5 c6 root forming the upper trunk and then it, uh, just about the clavicle there is a division the anterior and the posterior division beneath the clavicle so the neuroma was over here the part of the upper trunk and the divisions were involved by the neuroma underneath the clavicle the majority of the neuroma was beneath the clavicle so what we did was since it did not conduct any uh, uh, electrical activity intraoperatively we needed to graft it so we excised the neuroma and then grafted the c5 and the c6 root with the sural now cables to the posterior and the lateral cord uh, we i would just show the video over here this is the incision which generally we take and this is the c5 root to the upper trunk which we are dissecting and the, you can see the neuroma beneath it near the clavicle this is the c6 root we we have isolated and then now uh, we are cutting the c5 and the c6 root you can see the fascicles here you have to cut the now uh, end till you see the normal fascicular pattern and this is the infra clavicular dissection this is the clavicle and these are the cords this is the posterior cord which uh, i am isolating and now dissecting the lateral cord you can see the scarring involved in the cord level so we have to cut it and then identify the normal fascicular pattern and this was the gap between the two ends uh, around 2.5 to 3 cm the sural now was harvested uh, and uh, multiple cables were used to graft it the key point in the grafting is that uh, while operating your hand should be you know micro micro uh, suturing your hand should be flexed and relaxed you cannot have an extended uh, uh, forearm Uh, and suture it because then you will get uh, tired uh, the suture which are used are 10 0 uh, ethylon, ethylon uh, and i take few uh, two to three tag sutures to uh, anastomose the now and then augment it with uh, the fibrin glue because multiple sutures will invite more scarring along the anastomotic site so these are the two anastomoses which are done from c6 to the lateral cord and c5 to the posterior cord uh, anastomosis so the key point in this uh, video is to see that if the neuroma is encountered during surgery and if it doesn't conduct intraoperatively then you should need to excise the neuroma and graft it never anastomose the ends of the nerve under tension because then that will give way so always prefer a graft if the anastomosis is going to be under tension there is no evidence of uh, graft polarity with respect to regeneration so generally the reversing of graft and all there is no clear cut evidence and there was one a very good paper recently uh, where they had done a prospective study and they found out that there was no much documentation of whether reversing of the graft uh, would help uh, more in regeneration the grafting procedure generally is more preferable when the injury is uh, not very old uh, then the renovation process would be better if the injury is old and then the denervation process is so severe that sometimes the graft uh, uh, procedure may not work 
So uh, if early injury grafting, if the roots are available for graft, then it should be preferred. If the injury is old, then no transfer procedures are more uh, preferable, which will come later during our talk. This is a case of an upper trunk swanoma, the brachial plexus tumor. This was a, uh, just to show the uh, normal anatomy, the, the C5 to C6 root forming upper trunk, and this is where the tumor was. Uh, patient presented with uh, pain, paresthesia, and swelling. They are slow growing tumor. Uh, and this was the pre-op scan. This was showing a large uh, upper trunk uh, swanoma. And this is the incision. We only keep the patient in supine with neck extended and slightly turned to 30 to 40 degree to the other side, keeping a bolster underneath the shoulder blade so that we have a good amount of extension of the neck. And we remain in the posterior triangle of the neck. This is the skin and subcutaneous tissue flap, which is raised along with the platysma. A branch of the external jugular vein is coagulated and then isolate the the cutaneous cervical now. One should try to preserve this now because uh, cutting this now will have more pain postoperatively, and uh, patient gets a lot of pain uh, along the operated area, which one should avoid as far as possible. So the cutaneous nerve is identified and tagged around. Then uh, the next step is to cut the clavicular head of the sternomastoid muscle. You need to cut this, which you can reattach later on at the end of the surgery. And then you uh, encounter the supraclavicular fat uh, over the brachial plexus. This was a, a, a branch of the external jugular vein, which was cut. The fat is raised. And once you raise the fat, then uh, you encounter uh, the vessel. These are the two main vessels which one encounters in the posterior triangle, the transverse cervical artery and vein. You need to ligate it, don't coagulate it because uh, if it bleeds uh, postoperatively, then the uh, patient can have severe hemorrhage. They are branch of the subclavian artery, so you need to uh, uh, ligate and cut. And then you see this omohyoid muscle. You need to cut the omohyoid muscle uh, near the clavicle. You don't need to uh, uh, re-suture it again post uh, after, at the end of the surgery. And once you do that, you see the, the tumor. This is the large uh, upper trunk tumor. Just isolate the cap, the, dissect out the capsule as much as possible. Try to peel off the layers over the tumor so that the fascicles which are skirting around the tumor are also uh, uh, sifted out of the tumor. And then intraoperatively, you stimulate the, uh, the tumor part and try to gauge where the fascicles are there. So try to uh, uh, anatomically isolate uh, where the fascicles are and gauge, gauge an idea. And then once you reach the tumor plane, try to uh, dissect the tumor out. If the tumor is easily dissectable, then one should go for uh, this type of end mass excision. But if the tumor is firm and non-dissectable, then one should go for a piecemeal excision as the another video uh, I would show later. What, what is generally found in swanoma, as this was the case, you see one entering and exiting fascicle. This is the entering fascicle, exiting fascicle near the clavicle. So this fascicle, this is the fascicle from which the tumor arises. So these are the non-functional, non-stimulatable. You can sacrifice this. And then you uh, isolate the entering fascicle, as you can see here. And then you can sacrifice it and can completely remove the tumor. So in this way, we can remove the tumor completely and at the same time, preserve the neural structure, the upper trunk, as you can see here, the upper trunk is completely preserved. So, in, so to summarize this, I think the pre-operative MRI study is very important. Uh, you should uh, see the MRI studies, fascicular pattern, and uh, uh, see the neurovascular structure around the tumor so that you don't encounter any problem during surgery. The tumor criteria for excision should be if the, there is progressive increase in pain or uh, paresthesia or neurological deficit or the size of swelling, then these are the few uh, uh, indications to, uh, of, for surgery. Size alone, unless the tumor size is very large, asymptomatic tumor should not be subjected for surgery unless it is documented to progress. 
the, the main thing is that the tumor should be properly exposed along with the nerves. Then and then you should uh, uh, embark on to excise the tumor without identifying the fascicular orientation. If you straight away try to excise the tumor, you will damage a lot of fascicle in that process and with patient will have post-op deficits. Uh, intraoperative stimulation is very mandatory. Uh, thereby you can outline the anatomy of the fascicles and uh, uh, regarding whether to go for a piecemeal or total excision, one can decide during surgery. Then this is the case of a stab injury in the sciatic now. Uh, this patient had a stab injury in the sciatic now, which was uh, uh, four months old. And this patient had a complete paralysis of the foot movement. Just to show a schematic diagram of uh, the injury, this is the sciatic nerve, and this was the stab site, and the two ends were neuromatous, which forming a neuroma in continuity. And what we did was that we the, excised the neuroma and did sural nerve cable grafting of the sciatic nerve. And this is the neuroma in continuity, non-stimulatable during surgery. The patient uh, EMG also had documented denervation in the sciatic nerve. You can see hard form neuroma uh, uh, in the sciatic nerve. And what we need to do is to excise this neuroma till normal fascicular patterns are seen and the cut ends. So this is, we are cutting the, the proximal end. and never attempt to coagulate the bleeding. The bleeding is a good healthy sign and you can see the fascicle pouting out at the cut end. Uh, never attempt to coagulate it. You can see here, the, uh, I'll just stop the video. You can see the homogeneous uh, 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 sort of picture here at the cut end. This suggests that this, this now uh, at this point are denervated and there's a fibrosis and scarring. So this should not be kept. This should be excised till you see the normal fascicular pattern. So uh, we need to excise it and until uh, the normal fascicular pattern is seen, you can see here this cut end is now bleeding and you can see fascicles pouting out from the cut end. So this is the, you can see the fascicle, never attempt to coagulate the bleeding, it will stop on its own once you graft it and the defect was around three centimeters. So what I do is that isolate the peroneal and the tibial component so that we can cover the maximum area of, of, the, of the nerve ends and then harvest the sural now uh, and uh, uh, prepare cables uh, along the ends. And these are the two ends the, of the tibial and the peroneal end, uh, now. And then uh, three cables in each now. I just uh, sort of uh, amalgated the cables uh, using liquid of fibrin glue so that it can act like a one conduit and suture it with 10-0 Ethylon, take around three to four sutures so that the graft is held properly in uh, proper anatomical uh, orientation. And then augment the anastomosis with uh, fibrin glue. Nowadays, the common trend is to uh, uh, take some tag sutures and uh, then augment it with the fibrin glue. Mind you, uh, uh, some, some centers, they use only fibrin glue, but I'm a little skeptical in using only fibrin glue because in limb, if some movement or some unnecessary jolt happens and if they get disrupted, then the whole, the whole of the surgical exercise is in vain. So generally we take few tag sutures and then augment with fibrin glue. So in case of stab injury, when there is a neuroma in continuity, uh, the, main, uh, the main idea would, uh, in a stab injury would be to explore immediately following a stab. Quite often I see that patients uh, who have uh, had this stab uh, injury problem, the, the skins are sutured and the nerve is not uh, explored at the time of uh, their presentation to the emergency casualty. So uh, one should always uh, explore the stab because we don't know what is the direction of the stab and what structures it has involved. Uh, rather than they coming late for presentation uh, with the, uh, presenting with a deficit, it is better to uh, 
uh, explore immediately because at that time primary anastomosis of the nerve would be possible and the outcome would be much much better than uh, would be following uh, grafting procedure so always explore the stab always uh, uh, stimulate the nerve during surgery in case of neuromine continuity whether they are uh, conducting impulse uh, during surgery to decide whether grafting is needed or not and the anastomosis should be without any tension so this is uh, uh, and another problem of common peroneal nerve uh, palsy patient presenting with a foot drop, the, uh, the, uh, the peroneal nerve getting compressed at the fibular neck, very common problem uh, with patient presenting with the foot drop and uh, uh, all you need to do is just decompress the nerve, the, the peroneal nerve uh, in, in, at around the fibular neck and this is just a anatomical uh, diagram to show where exactly you should isolate the peroneal nerve, very simple. This is the bicep femur is lateral head, just above the knee joint. I uh, identify the, uh, the tendon of the bicep femur is just medial to that is the peroneal nerve. So there is no problem in identifying the peroneal nerve. Just expose the the bicep stand, femur is tendon and just medial to that you can isolate the peroneal nerve and then press it till the fibular neck where you will encounter the scarring or fibrosis or band. So this is the anatomical diagram and. The incision is along the lateral aspect of the uh, of the leg uh, from the knee, and what you need to do is to dis uh, isolate the nerve, dissect the nerve, and free the nerve till it winds round the five minutes remaining fibular neck. Okay, fibular neck. So go on, just doing sharp dissection to identify the nerve, and this is the peroneal nerve which is identified. Just do neurolysis of the now. And you will see a thick fibrous band. So this is the band which was there in this case. You can see thick fibrous band over the peroneal nerve near the fibular neck. And you cut the nerve, uh, cut the band and the nerve will get free at that location near the fibular nerve. So uh, fibular neck. So this is how the dissection of the uh, common peroneal nerve is done. And you stimulate intraoperatively to see whether the conduction is happening. And this is the patient who had a foot drop postoperatively improved remarkably. So in fibular uh, now uh, fibular region, uh, common peroneal now palsy, uh, generally uh, if operated early, they have a rewarding outcome and unnecessarily delay in uh, this type of problem would invite more denervation and then whatever you do, the patient does not recover. Do you have, uh, how much minute I have? Sika? Three minutes. Have four, three to four minutes. Okay, just so I'll just show one last video. Uh, this is a sciatic now tumor in thigh. Uh, this is the location of the tumor. Ma um, uh, always when there is a tumor in the limbs, always mark the tumor before induction uh, or before giving anesthesia because once the patient is uh, relaxed, then the swelling doesn't uh, is not seen and then you uh, end up uh, having un unnecessary large exposure. So better to mark the swelling before uh, uh, surgery so that you know at what region you need to explore. So this is the tumor involving the sciatic now. Isolate the proximal and the distal normal nerve ends. And then uh, identify the fascicle by stimulation. As you can see here, this is the fascicles are skirting around, stimulating those fascicles will elucid response. And where there is a tumor without overlying fascicle, there would be no response. So then you just, in this case, the tumor was very firm and uh, adherent and uh, total excision would have resulted in severe deficit because there would, be have, there would have been unnecessary traction on the fascicle. So what I have done in this case is to debug the tumor. When you excise the tumor, never put traction on the nerve, only just hold the tumor and uh, go on excising it. Don't touch the nerves. Uh, 
and this is after the exorcism. I think I'll finish it. There are a few more videos, but I, I because of lack of time, I would not go. Thank you. Thank you, Ketan, for the excellent demonstration. <laughs> excellent demonstration of the peripheral nerve pathologies such as uh, com compressive lesions, compartment syndrome, injuries, and tumors. The, this was there were excellent videos. I think uh, uh, this will encourage uh, neurosurgeons to pick up uh, the surgeries. They can start with the decompressive surgeries first and they, they can go on learning the complicated surgeries like removing the tumor and repairing of the brachial plexus. Uh, if any anybody is having any questions, I ask a question to Dr. Ketan. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hi, Ketan. I was very impressed by your videos. I want to know that you excise that neurofibroma and then put those cable grafts. Now, these are free grafts. Uh, th is there no chance of them getting fibrosed themselves, these free cable grafts, because they're about three centimeters in size? Uh, Susil, thank you for, for asking the question. It was not a neurofibroma, it was a neuroma. This, this no, the neuroma, the, sorry, sorry, the neuroma in the sciatic nerve. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, when you use a graft, these are free grafts, these are not vascularized grafts. Uh, uh, as you would uh, also agree to the fact that longer the length of the graft, uh, more chance of it uh, uh, being uh, a failure. This was a smallish graft. The three centimeter graft is not a very large graft. What it happens is that when you join the graft, uh, with the nerve end, there is a revascularization. So the, the from the surrounding soft tissue. So those graphs get revascularized, and that is how it helps. It acts like a conduit. Uh, at the end of the day, the grafts are not going to regenerate the nerve. They act as a conduit. So when the renervation process happens, if the grafts are alive by the revascularization, then they will help to renervate the nerve. So uh, that is how it happens. The main thing here is that quite often what, what happens is that uh, we land up uh, using the fibrin glue to a significant extent. You know, we try to cover the whole conduit with fibrin glue. And sometimes that, that process uh, uh, hampers the revascularization process. So fibrin glue should be, uh, you know, sort of very judiciously used, uh, you know, uh, to uh, promote uh, re-innervation and uh, regeneration. So what would be the upper limit of the length uh, for a free graft which you would avoid? This question uh, have got no answer, unfortunately, but uh, the recent uh, you know, uh, thought which uh, prevails is that uh, there is no cutoff limit that, uh, okay, you can use this much centimeter or you cannot use beyond that. Generally, they say that uh, 10 centimeter up to 10 centimeter length of graph is, uh, is okay to use it. But there are now a number of reports and number of uh, surgeons who are using more than that and they have found encouraging results. But as the graph length increases, the, obviously the percentage of outcome goes down. Sorter the graph, better the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. I think Sushil, the plastic surgeons use much longer graphs, including jump graphs. But I think they are more uh, moving towards uh, vascularized pedicle uh, flaps with the uh, nerve uh, graphs, you know, with the nerve. See, Vernon, the, see Vernon, the, to use vascularized pedicle graft, you need to have only, you know, very limited uh, indication because uh, the, 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 there are also in those, those process also, there are uh, chances of failure because if the vascularized pedicle, you need to anastomose the vessel to the another vessel. And sometimes if that vessel gets thrombosed, then the whole graft gets necrosed. So there are plus and minuses in both the things and it should be judiciously used. Thank you. Harish, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shekhar Chirmade, sir, and Dr. Ketendra Sai, sir. Now, moving on to the next uh, talk, I will uh, first I like to introduce Dr. Adhambar Netalkar, who is the consultant neurosurgeon from Manipal Goa Hospital. He will be moderating this talk by Dr. Sushil Patkar, sir. Over to you, sir, Dr. Netalkar, sir. It's my great pleasure to introduce my dear, uh, long lasting friend, Dr. Sushil Patkar who is, has been very modest uh, to have uh, liked to be introduced, like the student of Professor Venkshirkar, Professor Ramani, and he is interested mainly in studying craniovertebral junction anomalies and spinal biomechanics. His philosophy in life is that science is written and rewritten only to be thrown in the dustbin. And I agree with him. His motto, his research is to search again. And his 
main uh, you know direction is towards when he is doing surgery to see if there is a simpler safer and easier way to do something than what has been done over to you dr patkar thank you at last you agreed something with me <laughs> i am very happy that dr netal kar on a public forum has announced that i am his good friend i am elated thank you very much dr patkar <laughs> So I will begin, you know, just directly by showing some videos, uh, such that you know, uh, uh, I am going to show actually two videos uh, to simplify and show my way of doing uh, a craniovertebral fixation. And uh, the most important aspect for doing anterior surgery is to find out whether in extension the angle of mandible is going above the C2-3 disc. Even somewhere up to midpoint of C3 is acceptable, but anything below mid C3 is not doable from the front. And this happens in more than 90% of the times. So um, I will uh, go on straight to show you and start the video. So this was when I used to work before way back. These videos are pretty old. I hope you can see the videos and they are visible on the screen. Can you see them? Hello? Yes, sir. Can, we can somebody see. answer me? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so the patient, the patient is in the supine position. And the uh, most important thing is that you have, to, I always prefer to have a crutch field traction on the head. The patient is supine and extension, which is the normal position for reduction of any mobile atlantoaxial uh, instability. The incision is about two centimeters below the angle of the mandible. And then after dividing the platysma and trying to go in the plane between the carotid artery and the superior constrictor muscle, you reach straight on to the anterior surface. The only structure in between is the hypoglossal nerve and you will be straight on to the anterior surface of the atlantoaxial joints. So this is on a cadaver. You can see the platysma is divided. After dividing the platysma, the next structure you will see is the digastric tendon. Follow the posterior digastric tendon to its attachment to the hyoid bone. Disconnect it, and you'll see the submandibular gland above, and you can see its attachment to the hyoid bone. This is the hyoglossus muscle, which is going on either side. This is a submandibular gland over here. Re remain below the digastric tendon, and then you will not injure the hypoglossal nerve. This is the stylohyde muscle. And you do blunt dissection, you can feel the carotid, and this is the hypoglossal nerve. Now, nowadays, I don't search for it. I go straight down, feel the carotid, and go between the carotid and the superior constrictor muscle with blunt finger dissection and you will reach on the anterior aspect of the spine. See, traditionally, people have been doing this C1, C2 from behind, but here you are not dividing any muscles, but going through the plane, and this is the right angle retracted, and you are straight on the anterior surface of the atlantoaxial joint. These are the long Langenbach's retracted. These are the longus coli muscle in the center, and you're on to the atlantoaxial joints on both sides. After having done that, the biggest advantage is the capacity for gardening, that is opening the atlantoaxial joints, and then you have adequate amount of bone to pass screws, rod, plates, whatever you want, and plus prepare the joint and pack the joints with the bone grafts. This is the direction of the screws on the AP and lateral towards the posterior superior end of the lateral mass. And then you can pass the screw. Any screw across the joint is the best way of stopping movement in a joint. And therefore, uh, the Magal's technique was so successful, but failed because of the vertebral artery. The anterior surgery has all the positive points of the Magal's technique minus the vertebral artery. So you do not require a lot of implants. So this is now a live case where you can see the exposure. Now I'm removing the soft tissue between the anterior arch of the atlas and the odontoid process. So to treat instability, you have to create a deformity, to create more instability. So you remove all the panas and soft tissue between them, and then you have a mobile atlantoaxial joint. See, you can see the joint very well, like a, any case of an anterior cervical fusion. You can even pass a, a, an impaled odontoid. See, I'm passing a hole and making a hole in the odontoid process to pass a tap so that I can pull up the odontoid process 
into a reduced position. So this is the tap which has been passed into the odontoid and you can pull the odontoid upwards and having a holding that in the reduced position, you pass a, make a hole under the superior facet of C2 going into the lateral mass of C1. Then use a tab. Just I don't like to over tap. Just one or two drills into the lateral mass of the atlas. You have to remember the lateral mass of the atlas is solid cortical bone. A few few drills just to give direction to the screw. And once you have done that, the screw is the, the length varies somewhere from 22 to 26 centimeters. And once you pass the screw with this, holding the head in extension under the C arm, seeing that it is reduced, plus the odontoid being held in the front, the screw is passed into the lateral mass. And now the opposite side is easy because already it has got fixed, but still I keep holding the odontoid in reduced position so that there is no lateral tilt. Again, I'm passing. Now you'll remember that you must have a lot of bone on top above the screw hole. So this sometimes becomes difficult because the anatomy of the facet of C2 is very variable, but most of the time you can do it, but if you study the CT scan very carefully before doing uh, this, uh, passing the screw. But rest assured, there is no, uh, nothing in between, like um, uh, there is no uh, vertebral artery or venous plexus in your way, and you can get on with the operation very quickly. Most of the time, this operation is over between, between about an hour, an hour and a half without cutting any muscle. So maintaining the posterior tension band intact, you can do this operation. It is a highly, uh, what is it called, uh, uh, non-stabilizing operation as compared to detaching all the muscles at the posterior end. Now, this is the other aspect of uh, how to put a fixer plate. Now, you see there's a lot of bone available in the lateral mass and in the body of C2. So, a plate can be fixed as good as you fix the plate from behind without any struggle to um, bother about how you're going to pass the screw, what is the course of the vertebral artery. And this is the direction of the screws, you know, which is directed medially and uh, which will be, is, you know, more uh, biomechanically stable. You know? So, first place the plate and select the length of the plate depending upon where is the, this make a hole, entry hole into keeping the plate in position. Don't make a hole in the axis, only in the atlas. And then prepare that hole in upwards and outwards direction because you have to remember that the lateral mass is thinner medially and, and in longer height laterally. So first prepare the lateral mass hole after having selected the hole using the plate. It should be above the midpoint of the atlantoaxial joint. Then you use the plate with the screw and pass the screw in that hole which you have created. And mind you, no hole has been created in the axis tail because if you make up a hole before, you may not get that hole. And these are VSP holes, you know, where the screw can glide towards the center as you tighten them. And now you pass the screw hole in the, lat in the body of the axis downwards and mid. This is just a simple... Uh, kind of an anterocervical fusion. I don't know why people are worried and not ready to do it. So you can see this uh, screw being passed into the body of axis. Very, very simple and easy technique. Having done that, now you can do the same procedure on the other side. There is this instrument which is holding the odontoid in the center and which is very important to hold the odontoid in the reduced position. Now, once the one plate has been fixed, uh, it is not important. Now, again, I'm doing this, I've repeated the same thing on the opposite side. So it is very important to drill the hole correctly in the lateral mass of Atlas using the plate and then deciding the direction of the screw hole after removing the plate and then passing again with the plate, passing the screw and making the screw hole in the, in the body of the C2 after you have fixed the plate above. So you can position the plate as you want onto the body of the axis. Sometimes you need to make a little gardening like making the plate, uh, the anterior surface flatter to accommodate your plate, but you should not drill too much and make the C2 weak. But yes, uh, you have to make some adjustments to get the plates sitting snugly onto the anterior aspect of the um, axis. 
So if the plate is not fitting snugly, then there is a chance that you know with movements the plate can fail. And when you place implants, you have to see that the implants are in close contact with the bone. So this is looking from the opposite side, and this is how the plates are tightened finally. Now I've, I've chained and I've got locking screws. This Jayon is making specialized plates for me. So this is a submandibular incision without cutting any muscles with finger dissection. And you can see this, that the, all the neck movements are preserved without any hypoglossal injury or marginal mandibular nerve injury because you are far away from uh, these structures. So this was uh, how to do it anteriorly. In the end point, you know, at the end of six months, you must get rock solid fusion of the joint. If you're not getting rock solid fusion, then the operation is useless. And this can only be done if you have drilled the and the joints, which I'll show you. And uh, you can, uh, this, of course, this got published very long ago. And recently, this has got published in JNS. For those who are interested, they can go and see this. And this is a new kind of you know, implant which I am promoting now, which I find will eventually solve most of the problems. The problem is that sometimes you don't get adequate amount of bone to pass the screw across the joint. So you can put this plate and pass the screw into the lateral masses directly, beginning at the midpoint of the lateral mass and pass the screw upwards. And there is a VSP design here where you can start the screw and migrate it upwards so that there is compression and uh, it can be fixed. Uh, in, uh, in compression mode. So this was now more than uh, one and a half years. You can see this flexion, extension, x-rays. The lower screw is a, is a bicortical screw, and therefore it has a very rigid hold. A three-point fixation is biomechanically superior to a posterior two-way fixation. So this, this uh, you can see this, how it is done after having exposed the joints, both the sides. And uh, uh, I am passing the, this marking the hole to pass the screw in. This is the center of the lateral mass. So making a hole to in the upwards and outwards direction. And I've measured the length of the lateral mass on the coronal CT scan. And once having marked the holes where I want to pass the screws, the plate is uh, usually selected and placed. I got the, the, the distance between the two upper holes varies from three centimeters to 3.8 centimeters. Various sizes are kept available on the table. And then you pass the screw upwards and outwards into the um, vertebra after, of course, having grafted the joints properly. I'm sorry. So when you have a three-point fixation, it is superior to two four-point fixation without any connection between the plate. If there is a single plate which is connecting all the structures, it is much more uh, biomechanically superior to two different plates which are disconnected from each other. You see, even in the lumbar spine, people talk about using uh, it connectors between the rods to improve the rigidity of the fixation. So I feel that putting an anterior plate across is uh, definitely um, a better option. So those videos are available on JNS for those who are interested. The next thing which caught my attention was, of course, the posterior surgery where the vertebral artery is going riding high up. And uh, many times, you know, she, Dr. Goel is credited with this technique of how to do it and how he, uh, it reduced the incidence of vertebral artery in megal fixation. But of course, uh, when I studied the lateral masses, I feel that there is a, a flaw. If you, whatever you do, if you pass the screw just under the facet, the entire discussion about the vertebral artery comes to an end. And uh, I will show you the technique of how uh, I felt it should be done. I like to use a uh, kind of modified screws, which are like pedicle screws with a plate. And uh, once they are used, uh, they can be used for manipulation, which is superior to polyaxial screw rods. Uh, just a minute, I think there's something went wrong in doing this, yeah. So, can you see the, is it seen on the screen? Hello? Yes, sir. No, we see the, we okay. are seeing the last slide. Can you see the video now? No, no. No video. There's no video. No. Okay, just a minute.
I'll have to go back. How do I go back? So you can stop sharing and then share again. I'll have to stop sharing and share. <laughs> Just to say, give me a second. Huh? I think something has gone wrong in my presentation. Are you seeing this slide now? Hello? Yes, sir. Slide is seen. Yes, blank. We are seeing the blank, blank slide. slide is seen, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Last. just a second. So uh, the posterior surgery technique also I feel can be simplified. Yes. By, uh, yeah. By uh, selecting a different kind of entry point and which I've been talking about for quite some time uh, the posterior entry point, which I showed on the slide. So this is the, I, I keep the patient in prone position and the usual midline incision to detach the muscle. Now let's imagine the amount of muscle detachment that is necessary to reach the C1, C2 joint. You have to disrupt the entire connection of the posterior tension band from the C2 spinous process. Anyway, uh, it does have its advantages when you cannot do the anterior surgery. After opening the joints, of course, the most important point is, you know, preparing the joints, grafting the joints, and then making the holes and putting the plates or screw rods construct in them. These are the usual landmarks. Uh, so for, those, for the youngsters, I have shown this. This is, of course, not for senior surgeons. So this is the occiput. This is the atlas. And this is the C2. So this is the spinous process of C2. So to reach and properly expose the lateral mass of C2, it is very essential to, to tackle two problems. One is the venous bleeding from the paravertebral venous plexus and the C2 ganglion, uh, nerve root. And after only by sacrificing this, I feel you can uh, expose the joints properly. So this is now the uh, right-sided joint. You can see the joint is open by putting a number four dissector. This is the lateral mass of C1. This is the pars entry point, which was described by Dr. Goel. This is the pedicle entry point described by Harms. And this is the entry point which I passed just under the joint, midpoint of the joint, downwards and medially, stopping the discussion about vertebral artery injury. So you prepare the joint. Now you can use an osteotome, you can use a burr. I'm just for the sake of ease, I'm showing, doing it number. This is a cadaver. So showing a number four, how it is used to uh, open the joint and manipulate the joint. Once you manipulate the joint and open all the uh, ligaments, then only you can reduce the joint. Having done that, you are, I like to pass a 2.5 uh, to 3 mm burr in the joint and prepare the joint for bone grafting. This is the, the screw that entry I use just under the midpoint of the joint, downwards and medially downwards and medially. So the screw will go nowhere else except into the body of the C2 without discussing whether this, you know, where is the vertebral artery and it is coming in your way or not coming in your way. There is always dense bone under the facet. And this is the entry point for the C1, which is upward and medially. So this is the C2 point. You can see the screw is, you know, it is, uh, they are not parallel screws. They're divergent screws, which is again a biomechanically superior to construct. Anybody who talks about pedicle screws should know that when the screws are divergent, their pullout strength is stronger than convergent or parallel screws. So these are little things that matter much while doing uh, screw fixations. So this is the C1 screw, which is upwards and medially. And this is the C2 screw, subfaceted screw, downwards and medially. I don't like to tap too much because, you know, uh, if you tap too much the entire length, we are actually making the uh, screw hold weaker. So this is making you the drill to open the jaw, to drill the surfaces of the joint, and which I think is the most important part of the operation. Bone harvested from the spinous process of C2, C3, you can use, uh, you can even use iliac crest bone and pack it into the joint. 
Getting bleeding from the either edges of the, of the joint is most important. And then passing the screws like this. So where you don't have navigation, you don't have you know, 3D models, this is a much simpler technique to fix. And you can see sometimes you feel that there's crowding, but this crowding is only till you hold the head in extension. Get your screws inside, position the this uh, screw heads, and pull on the Gardner Wells skull traction. They'll come in direct line, and you know you'll get it reduced. Now this is the other side where I've exposed the facet. This is the joint. This is the lateral mass of atlas, and this is the joint. So again, taking the midpoint of the joint. You pass the screw down, or you're seeing the dural tube over here medially. You pass the screw downwards and medially. It is going to go nowhere else except into the body of C2, and you can pass a much longer screw. Now, here I'm showing how to use the plate. You, know? you fix this. This was this is again a VSP design. So you tighten the screw, hold the head, and you'll see as the head is being held in extension and pulled, you're getting the distraction. And this distraction has taken place. Bring the odontoid down and fix the screws. Of course, now my screws are come with a locking system. And as you tighten the screws, you'll get the adequate amount of distraction between C1 and C2. Five minutes left. Yeah, five minutes left. Okay, dear. So uh, I will not spend time talking too much of theory, you know. So this was this is the direction of the screw. I showed you uh, how it is done, and of course, you know this is my philosopher. You know, one is Osho and one is Dr. Goel, and you can see the eyes, the 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 smile, completely same. Can you see? Can you appreciate the similarity? Ah uh, yes, my friend, yeah. Dr. Goel. Yes, and I'm telling you, he revolutionized this surgery, and my job was just to make it more and more simpler because I am, of course. Kind of uh, protege. Thank you, my dear friends. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Patkar, uh, for an excellent demonstration of a revolutionizing technique for a safer C1, C2 fixation. I just have one question. Um, you said uh, uh, biomechanics are superior to the posterior approach. Uh, literation mentions almost similar uh, safety. I mean, uh, uh, biomechanics. Uh, so, no, I'm, talk I'm talking about a three-point fixation. I'm not talking about uh, two plates. This three-point fixation is the thing that I just presented. There, is, there are these Chinese group also which are talking about TARP. Mm -hmm. They're also using a single plate. See, whenever the construct which holds both mm -hmm. these C1, C2 joints is you know, in connection with each other, it is going to be more rigid than two separate uh, constructs. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, if you read the literature by uh, the lot of Chinese literature coming out with TARP, T-A-R-P, when mm -hmm. they are using it, but transorally, which I feel is in a completely off the point, because when you put an implant uh, through the pharyngeal mucosa, there is always a very high chance of infection, though they claim to have done many, many cases without infection. But the whole argument is that when there is a single implant which fixes both the C1C2 bilaterally, it is going to be superior to two separate implants. Because it is going to be more rigid. I'm not talking about transoral uh, anterior plates as compared to posterior plates. Okay. So what's the pre-op and post-op uh, special imaging you do for these patients? I just do X-ray and CT. I, I have to do good CT scans pre-op. I feel whenever anybody wants to do good spinal surgery and fixation, especially, it is mandatory to spend a lot of time on the CT scan. If you spend a lot of time on the CT scan, where is the quality of bone? Where is the good quality of bone? Where is a, where you are going to get? Where is the line of transmission of weight between those two vertebrae? Those are the points which have to be taken into consideration. Again, what is the longest length of screw that you can pass in that particular vertebrae? There is no point going on the table and just taking screws and give me 3.5, 4.5, or 45 mm screw without having studied what is the length of the screw you want to put preoperatively. So I feel CT scan is the most important thing. And of course, uh, um, the MR angiogram when you're doing C1, C2, but if you're worried, you can even do a CT angiogram, uh, which is also a good uh, way to know what is going to be in your way. And uh, definitely neuro navigation and all increase the chances and safety of doing surgery. But uh, uh, the navigation has to be in your mind. 
in your mm -hmm. brain and once you're positioned, what is the structure that you have to learn to see the spine and the MRI and the CT scan in three dimensions. So uh, you should spend a lot of time uh, preoperatively on the CT console, do the 3D reconstruction, rotate it, play with it, spend a lot of time preoperatively and then start visualizing the structures uh, as they would look for you when you are in the surgery. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sujil. Any more questions? Uh, can I ask the question? Yes, yes, yes. you can. Uh, sir, uh, once again, thank you for that landmark presentation. I'm a big fan. Uh, uh, Dr. Jais from SGPJ. Yes, yes, sir, I know. Of course, I can see you. Sir, uh, my question is, uh, uh, you have shown uh, beautifully the C1 lateral mass and C2 uh, power screws from uh, anterior approach. So my question is, uh, uh, because I can see that you, you, you have put a 22 around uh, 22, what, what kind of size uh, the length you are using from C2 anteriorly into the axis and how you ne negotiate the vertebral artery for, I mean, sometimes not often the case, but sometimes you have a high riding vertebral artery, your vertebral artery for, I mean, is wide and height is high. Then how do you negotiate from anterior lane in, in you know, you, it, it could be a blind process when you put from anterior lane. So what is your yeah, take? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I tell you that uh, I, I spend a lot of time on the CT scan preoperatively. And uh, if you see this slide, you know, they all talk about the vertebral artery can sometimes come as close uh, over here immediately. But there is always bone on the me medial, medial aspect. And the, the fallacy of the CT scan is that the CT scan is done most of the time, the actual scans are done without tilting the gantry. If you tilt the gantry along the odontoid process and go downward, you'll find that there is a lot of bone uh, just lateral to the odontoid process. So when you pass the screw from behind and you pass the screw lat just lateral into the, to the odontoid process, downwards into the body, you are never, same thing from the front, when you pass the screw from the front, you will have a lot of bone which is available to you to go and the, for the screw to go down into the body of the C2. And you, you have to select this length of the screw depending upon how much uh, this, on the CT scan you study, what is the height of the C2 body. And invariably, sometimes I've gone even up to you know, 30, 30 millimeters. So it depends upon how much, sometimes in, in vertebra, which are you no know, C23 cripple fell anomaly, you can put much longer screws into the body of the CT. So it is all dependent on the CT scan and how much, what the CT scan is telling you. But there is one thing is 150% sure that there is a lot of bone just lateral to the odontoid process. And this paper, which was published by, uh, I think uh, it was by, by this gentleman called Menon. And I think it is a very important paper by Menon, which uh, showed uh, uh, this paper, the trabecular anatomy of the axis vertebra. This was 2018 and then is again published in 2019. And uh, I will draw your attention to this paper by this gentleman, Dr. Venugopal Menon. This is a very important study and you'll find that the most dense bone is available just lateral to the odontoid process. Whether you come from behind or you come from front is not important. Right, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Sushil, Dr. Palandi. Yes, sir. Congratulations for your nice presentation and a good uh, technique showing the uh, safer approach to the C1, C2. Uh, I think uh, just a comment, what is your uh, uh, idea about that 3D printing is available nowadays? So yeah, 3D study, printing is yeah, 3D that printing would be very, very nice. Useful for deciding and planning, I feel. I feel, uh, I think that it is good, but uh, a 3D CT scan and uh, sitting on the console of the CT scan is equally good enough. Having the 3D printer, of course, is a good idea and I getting a 3D construct and yeah. I'm sitting with it. But going to the CT scan and sitting on the console with 3D gives you almost all similar information. But yes, a 3D printed model will give you the feel in addition to the vision. You know? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Good. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All for all of you, doctor. I come from the same school as Dr. Palandi. <laughs> we are both Parisians yeah. from Bandra. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Sujil. Thanks a lot. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. I can stop sharing. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Uh,
thank you so patkar sir and netalkar sir for uh, continuing the session now moving on to the next talk first i would like to uh, welcome dr katikar sir he is associate professor from uh, mgc college uh, solapur and he is consultant neurosurgeon at balwant institute of neurosurgery and intensive trauma care and he is also the secretary of uh, mcns so i'd like to invite uh, katikar sir to moderate this session moderate this talk by dr jayesh good afternoon everybody uh, i would like to congratulate dr varun and his team for this excellent uh, organization exhibition of this cme uh, i would like to invite dr jayesh sardana who is addis uh, who is associate professor at agpgi he is going to talk on posterior c1c2 stabilization with preservation of the ganglion and mobilization of the vertebral artery jayesh please thank you thank you sir uh, actually this was the slot of uh, dr jkbc pardiban sir but uh, unfortunately uh, because of some misappancy could not present so i have given uh, this uh, opportunity uh, and i have suggested that i should talk for uh, the some resident talk so let me share this my screen is visible yes yes it is yeah so uh, this is particularly uh, the, the posterior after the legendary and remarkable talk of uh, dr uh, susil patkar sir uh, now i am going to present the most widely performed technique a c1 c2 distraction and posterior fixation uh, by goel and harms road and screw fixation method and uh, this is particularly prepared for the resident because i would like to kind of revision of all the steps particularly uh, with particularly uh, emphasis how to preserve the ganglia and some step of vertebral artery mobilization uh, particularly if we are dealing with the anomalous vertebral artery so this kind of short video uh... so uh, it's a 50 year female uh, with a spastic quadriparesis and uh, the city is showing the basilar invagination here with atlant oxal dislocation there is a occipitalized at last so particularly we would like to mention that uh, as uh, dr patkar suggests every preoperatively every ct scan should be evaluated in three dimensional way first sagittal orientation para sagittal orientation of both the side of facet joint coronal orientation particularly orientation of the facet joint whether it is symmetrical both the side and what is the orientation whether it is oblique flat or vertical so normally it is oblique like in this case it flat and uh, both the side it is a little bit flat so this is symmetrical sometime it is very important because you have to exclude whether it is asymmetrical maybe one side flat one side oblique the problem is in that case it is very difficult to reduce completely and sometimes if your bi degree of bi is also important sometimes high bi high basilar invagination with retroverted odontoid sometimes you know you you are planning to distract it it, it may require more than 8 mm distraction tethering of the cord may lead to neurological deficit particularly you are dealing with the asymmetrical joint so this is important point you should also look for the isthmus the size of the pars and isthmus both the parasitic cut because it must be more than 3.5 mm you are going to put a 3.5 mm screw whether you put in the pars or pedicle so this thickness is very important while you are looking the pars or the isthmus you also look for the vertebral artery foramen just below the isthmus here so it should be enough space of the isthmus that you can put a 3.5 mm screw if it is less than that sometimes less than 2 mm you should avoid pars or pedicle you there are many alternative like to a subfacetal screw translaminar screw and whatever so it should be planned before that is very important here it is a occipitalized atlas you, you you i i always do a bony decompression for that the third important thing 
if you have you are dealing with the occipit lies at last in any case of ad and bi according to our protocol in the scpgi we always do ct angiography in all the cases because uh, as per our series that is one of the largest series in the vertebral artery ct angiography and we we have found that in case of ct if you find occipit lies at last then there is a chances of persistent intersegmental artery will be more than 20% so either on the one side that is more common or on the both the side but here we can see that the, there is vertebral artery is both the side is very safe not going the two things should be seen one is the dominancy and second thing whether it is crossing the facet joint so both this is the safe in this case in this case there is a tonsillar herniation carry one ball formation so plan is to c1 c2 distraction and c1 c2 fixation with for on magnum bony decompression only the position which is very standard that is a military tuck position and uh, that is basically how much traction should be applied that is 7% to maximum 10% approximately in adult it should be 3 to 5 kg particularly in head in extension position and torso should be at least 10 to 20 degree up for counter traction also the next step first uh, as in this case it is uh, occipital lies at last so posterior rim of the foramen magnum uh, it should be removed we always prefer a only uh, bony decompression now one thing specific i would like to mention that in case of basilar invagination if it is associated with occipital lies at last it means your cervical medullary junction has 360 degree compression not from anteriorly or posteriorly only it is also compressing from the lateral mass on both the side so so your foramen magnum decompression should be also 270 degree so not only the posterior rim of the foramen magnum which is important to excite you should always look for the lateral part of the cervical medullary junction whether it is free or not on both the side and sometimes if there is there, there may be a lateral mass hypertrophy there may be so you, sometimes it may require if you don't find the pulsation at the lateral part of cervical medullary junction you sometimes you can drill the most middle portion of the lateral uh, mass also so this is one of the important point now coming to the c1 c2 exposure that that is the next step now uh, if you see uh, the most cumbersome and exhausting portion of the c1 c2 surgery is the venous plexus bleeding now epidural venous plexus lies around the c1 c2 junction but it is always the epidural so if you see the anatomy c1 in c2 facet joint has a thick capsule and this capsule is extended up to the base of the spinous process in the form of thick periosteum here so you your all the epidural plexus lies in between the dura and the periosteum so you can definitely prevent the venous bleeding by remain subperiosteal so what we do what we can do the 10 number uh, blade you can sharply cut the periosteum till the facet joint capsule then with the help of sharp dissector you can medialize the venous plexus along with the periosteum by dissecting medially your venous plexus bleeding will definitely drastically reduce you should bear the lamina and then you can directly reach the pars and that definitely leads you to the facet joint and you have to remain superiorial for that now we reach to the facet joint these are the common standard uh, uh, steps now the, the the standard procedure is put a osteotome inside now how to expose the c1 and how to preserve the ganglia so the the, the overlying the c1 lateral mass is always overlying with the uh, uh, ganglion So, so in order to expose the c1 uh, lateral mass you have you have to mobilize the ganglion if you want to preserve and what i suggest the ganglion should be preserved in, at least you should try in every case of the c1 c2 surgery so ganglia is always accompanying with the venous plexus overlying venous plexus and one of the uh, uh good radicular artery which is supplying the dura and it is going into into the uh, into the dura so this two stru two structure is uh, accompanying the ganglia now this radicular artery need to be coagulated separately because sometimes in advent injury to that vessels it may mimic the vertebral artery then overlying fibrous tissue is very dense and it should be sharply dissected and the ganglia c2 nerve root should be free at least 1.5 cm lateral to the lateral border of the facet joint 
in that way you can easily retract it easily and after preservation now you expose the c1 lateral mass the first c1 lateral mass here now in c1 c2 facet joint the c1 in end plate is very thick compared to the c2 it, it, it always should be excised with the sharp dissection sometimes you can put a drill in between the c1 c2 joints this sometimes because of improper or suboptimal excision of the cartilage your spacer will create a problem while you it will be very difficult to put a spacer with the remaining cartilage sometimes your cortex may be damaged it's very very important step now the posterior should be put it should be no uh it's it's very important to understand that the mobilization of facet joint doesn't means the opening of the caps facet joint capsule only from posteriorly it should be break all around for that you can put a osteotom that is one thing and you can rotate it the second you can use a trial trial of spacer you can start with 3 mm 5 mm then 7 mm gradually you can put one by one you can put inside the space and you can dilate it that will help to break the capsule all around the facet joint and so you can put 5 mm 7 mm the spacer whatever you want so this is the the the, the c1 c2 distraction method now i'm going to see, uh, show you the entry point of c1 this all are the standard method and just now you should make a square over the c1 lateral mass this is the c1 lateral mass square and your entry point would be the middle of that square exactly sometimes if you are dealing with the c1 lateral mass which absolutely you should be well aware in the preoperative ct if you are dealing with the c1 hypoplast uh, hypoplastic c1 your entry point would be the junction between the lamina and the lateral mass if it is not possible then you can drill the lower half of the c1 lateral uh, lamina and you can directly put a screw from there so center or the junction of the c1 lamina of the lateral mass then the standard method all followed by drill followed by ball probe just to look at the trajectory now what is the trajectory so trajectory would be 5 to 10 degrees superiorly and the medially but what i suggest you can put a osteotom between the c1 c2 facet joint and if you look at uh, the just image in the, uh, the 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 trajectory of the facet joint the end plate and your screw should be parallel to that end plate you do not require the cm if you follow that things just put a osteotom in the c1 c2 facet joint and the screw should be parallel to the end plate i personally prefer a longer screw 22 24 just to prevent uh, the irritation of the c1 ganglion especially if we preserved it and second thing the rod fixation job will be easy now what about the c2 pars or pedicle just uh, uh, for the resident so always you 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 go sub periosteally starting from the lamina go to the pars and dissect the pars superiorly till it curve in medially into the body so that is exactly where the pedicle lies so you put the 4 mm or thin uh, thin dissector tip exactly at the pedicle this will make your job easy now your trajectory of the c2 laterally your boundary is vertebral artery foramen that is a middle border of vertebral foramen medially you have already created the boundary Uh, the medial border of the pars anteriorly you have the tip of dissector and posteriorly from anywhere you can go in between the this medial and lateral border uh, from the c2 uh, facet joints so if you put a screw what straight it is a c2 pars if you put if you want to put a pedicle your trajectory should be in the direction of tip of the dissector that is c2 pedicle from laterally to the in this this direction that's how we are calling it pars or pedicle if you put a 18 to 20 mm screw it is to pars if you put a 22 to 24 it will be pedicle in the direction of tip of it for sure the other thing is same 
sometimes you 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 may have a torrential bleeding uh, from the entry point that's why i use as always c1 prop to, to check the bony mass and uh, whether at every point i just knock and then wait and then knock and the wait whether i'm going to foramen or not you can put a c2 screw and bleeding will itself stop so this is how uh, i the, the distraction followed by c1 and c2 lateral mass the same procedure follow on opposite side ganglia is preserved on the both the side and here so 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 once you put a rod the c1 should be tightened c2 ini should be loose and already you have distracted position because you have applied the spacer which act as a pivot and once you do a c2 and c3 spinous process distraction your entire arch of odont your, your uh, uh, odontoid will be pushed entirely and it will give, give you a final reduction of aid your aid will be completely reduced by this method and then you tighten all the tini finally overlay uh, bone particle can be help in the distraction uh, in the bony fusion so this is a final picture with a complete reduction of aad and bi now what happen if you are dealing with the anomalous vertebral artery because the, in this kind the most common variety is a persistent intersegmental artery so this is another example very small uh, short, uh, small, uh, small video 14 years male patient with aad and bi here we can see there is a occipital is at last so again the ct angio must be done the right side the, the what hypoplastic uh, the left side of vertebral artery is hypoplastic and on one side there is a very dominant vertebral artery make made a loop which is crossing the c1 and c2 facet joint where you have to mobilize because joint mobilization and put uh, the, the is very very important here because you need to uh, distract for the bi and you have to reduce the aid so what we can do we have to mobilize this c1 c2 vertebral artery in such a cases so that we can mobilize the joint so how to do that so this is exposure occiput c2 spinous process especially if you are dealing with the kind of vertebral artery loop the two thing is very important one you should start your dissection from the vertebral artery foramen from inferior to superiorly that is one thing second thing you should always go 1 to 1.5 cm laterally to the lateral border of the uh, facet joint because you need a space there just to dissect all the vertebral artery loop anatomically vertebral artery is always accompanying with a large venous plexus fibrous tissue and the c2 nerve root but always remember that a venous plexus and c2 nerve root lies always superficial to the vertebral artery so while you are dissecting please keep in mind that the c2 nerve root will remain superficial to the vertebral artery that need to be cut that need to be resected first so vertebral artery is uh, being dissected sharply with all overlying fibrous tissue and the venous plexus and it can be coagulated and this was the nerve root uh, remains superficial to the venous plexus which which always accompanying the vertebral artery that need to be dissected and cut So here c2 nerve root cannot be preserved if you want to mobilize the vertebral artery so this loop is completely free now and you can mobilize it inferiorly and medially like this you can easily mobilize because it's very easy to 
uh, it's always safer to play with the vertebral artery rather than to make it injured. It's mobilize and retract the inferior medially, and then you do a, whatever you want to do with the joints. You do put a spacer, you do retraction, distraction. Now, as we are also dealing with the high riding vertebral artery, in this case, exactly this is the sub, this is the entry point for the soft facetals group here. Exactly, Dr. Parker was mentioning this, this, this is the sub facetal screw entry point. And you can directly bypass the vertebral artery foramen here. You can put the screw in very thick, dense cortical bone underlying into the body in inferior direction. And this was just a step to show how to mobilize the vertebral artery. The remaining process was same, the screw and so thank you for the attention. Uh, I would like to stop here. Uh, thank you, Jayesh, for an excellent uh, video. And you explained it very neatly, all the steps. And it was an, uh, uh, I should admit that it was an inspiring and confidence boosting. Yes, any questions or comments from the audience? Uh, Dr. Jayesh, I have one question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, do you, have you uh, observed any difference between ganglion preservation or ganglion sacrifice? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have already uh, that study also that is ganglion preservation versus ganglion severing. Of course, there is a, a numbness. Uh, the patient have a numbness uh, posteriorly at the C2, uh, a numbness and paresthesia typically, which is also a cumbersome and complication thing. If you can preserve, you should always. That was our conclusion. Of course, if you are uh, doing complicated surgery, if you are doing, dealing with the anomalous vertebral artery, you can sever it. But it is a normal physiological structure. So it's better to preserve always. Uh, as far as literature is concerned, liter literature is concerned, people uh, having uh, the, the post-operative outcome, if you sever the ganglia, there would be a bad shore, numbness, paresthesia, as well as sometimes, you know, the muscle atrophy, which is supplied by C2 would be there. So, of course, you should preserve it. Yeah. Uh, so, what like we have observed is initially we used to preserve, but in uh, like uh, last three few years, we have you know in cases wherein exposure to the C1 C2 joint was difficult, we have been uh, in cases such we have been sacrificing C2 ganglion also, but we have not found such sign statistical uh, significant differences as such. Yeah, if you want to cut it, uh, I would say then it should be in a such a manner that it may not end up with the, you know, uh, neuroma formation or the inflammation, because in that case, the, the patient will end up with uh, severe pain and paralysis exactly at that. Rather, you can sharply cut it both the side with clean manners. That is a different issue. But of course, uh, the all the literature, if you feel uh, there is a, a difference clinically, if you found after uh, severing the ganglion. Okay, thank you. Dr. Patkar. Thank you so much. Patkar, sir, you want to say something? What is your experience? Uh, I, yeah, I, I have been, uh, I always feel that uh, C2 root ganglion, uh, should you should try to preserve, but uh, you should not uh, struggle to preserve, is what I feel. And uh, if you are having, I have, in my earlier years, I have found one case where I finished the surgery preserving the ganglion, and the patient woke up with severe occipital neuralgia. We had to re-explore because the C2 root had got trapped under the screw head. I feel that when you are preserving it, you should use a special screw in the C1 lateral mass, where the C1 screw is having a, a <coughs> shaft that comes from Depu. And then now I think even the Indian companies are making the C1 screw with a shaft which is unthreaded. So you can have a longer C1 screw and uh, you use the, the threaded portion in the lateral mass and the non-threaded portion you keep outside. Yeah. So um, I feel that is uh, good enough. But uh, I am not, uh, I do not hesitate to cut the C2 root uh, when I'm doing posterior surgery. Yeah, I, I, and in fact, I take a stitch in that to, uh, to move it the, the medial stump medially so that I have larger area of the uh, lateral mass exposed and my drill or my uh, burr, they are not going to get damage and get entangled with the nerve root stump. But um, uh, 
like I also agree with what Dr. Sardana said that uh, whatever is normal should we should preserve as far as possible and try avoid cutting it, but don't be obsessive about preserving it. Yeah. So uh, I think some patients who have, we have also seen that some patients who had significantly this pain in the occipital region, nape of neck, they were, you know, they were relieved of this pain after sacrificing this ganglion. That is what we accidentally found out in the later part of our study. So in future, uh, when th there is my talk, I'll be showing you those uh, points. So yeah. sir, over to Kartikar, sir, please. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. Thank you, Dr. Patkar, sir. I conclude this talk and hand it over to the host. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Jayesh and uh, Katikar sir. Uh, now moving on to this uh, interviewing session, continuing the next uh, talk, uh, carrying forward by Dr. Palande sir, who is uh, who was my ex professor and is ex head of department of neurosurgery uh, from Jeja Hospital, Mumbai. He will be moderating this talk by Dr. S. S. Kale. Thank you, Dr. Harish. Uh, I would. Uh... Now introduce uh, Dr. S. S. Kale, who is the professor of neurosurgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He has got a special interest in craniovertebral junctions, and he has got a very wide, a large series, mostly more than 800 uh, patients of uh, developmental CV junction anomalies. He is also more interested in tuberculosis of the CV junction. But today he will be talking on. Uh, Surgery for Challenging Spinal Deformity. Dr. Kale, please. You can start. Yeah, Namaste. Namaste to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Vernon. Greetings, uh, Dr. Palande. <clears throat> Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, what I realized is that as you grow older, you kind of go down. So I'm going down the cervical spine now. <laughs> I've shifted from the CV junction to the subaxial spine. So today's talk is going to be on the subaxial spine. So can I go to my screen now? Yes, sir, please. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah, it's, it's visible, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to start right, uh, right in the middle of this <clears throat> without much introduction. <clears throat> so we had this eight-year-old child a few years ago. I think it was almost 15 years ago. Spastic quadriparesis. She was later diagnosed to have Morcure syndrome. And she had this neck deformity. She also had dorsal lumbar scoliosis uh, lower down in the spine. So what we did was uh, that time, this was the first time I had encountered uh, subaxial uh, deformity. So I chose to do it from uh, the back itself, uh, only from the back. And as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, you can see the stump of titanium wires here as well. She had atlantoaxial dislocation and we fixed that with this bringing the C1 and C2 together and an occipital cervical fixation for the rest of the spine. And this is uh, an X-ray three years later and uh, everything was holding fine. And later on, we went on to tackle the rest of the spine. This was the deformity she had. And here we had this uh, first time I had used a growing rod. You know, this, this rod where you see these two parallel rods at the lower part, you keep distracting a little bit. So as the body grows, as the child grows, and that's what we did. And ultimately she, uh, she did quite well. Uh, this is the pre-op and the post-op pictures of this child. Um, we fixed, in fact, we had to fix almost the entire spine, but she did well, she did well, but because of her Morcure syndrome, she had problems in her joints and later on she went ahead to have hip surgery and knee surgery and all kinds of things. Anyhow, that is what we did for this little child. So that's how I got interested in this. And then the next case we had was this, a 23 year old Marfan syndrome, progressive quadriparesis for four years with this neck deformity. And you can see the C2 or the T2 weighted images showing some signal change in the in the subaxial spine, uh, sub, subaxial cord, and we thought that we had to intervene urgently. 
so we thought we'll go from the posterior side release the lateral masses and as we did this fixation the the intraoperative uh, the meps they actually improved so this was the pre op and then just by the side of it you see here the post op and uh, it significantly improved so i was very happy we had straightened out his neck the young man was doing all right but uh, what happened at 3 months uh, junctional kyphosis he is falling off at the lower end so we went up to c5 i thought i was over the hump and um, but no it it fell off at the c5 6 level and so we had to go back in and at this time extend the correction right up to the dorsal spine i think i went down up to d2 and in the one year follow up uh, the picture which you see on the right everything was holding and he did quite well there was some a mild spasticity which persisted maybe because of the signal change in the mri but however he was better than before and his spine was stable so till now what we were doing was only posterior correction and fixation and there you want to do a smaller fixation shorter fixation but there is always a risk of junctional kyphosis so i was wondering that do we need to go 360 degree and lo and behold we had this 20 year old neurofibromatosis patient uh, case 3 spastic quadriparosis for the last 3 years gradually worsening and here again we did from the back you know um only back but if you see this last picture the occipital part of one side was backing out so we had to go back in and correct that after one year however his patient uh, the status was the same with left uh, occipital implant back out and after correction he remained stable after that but i wasn't entirely happy with what we were doing i was wondering if you need to go anteriorly as well now we had this uh, 20 year old female with the progressive kyphotic deformity kind of a marfanoid syndrome not exactly marfans and here we did the same thing we went from the back first if you can see the first picture on the left uh, we put in the screws the hardware and when we put the rod in the meps dropped you know they became uh, worse than what they were pre operatively so we hastily removed the the rod then we decided to go anterior we did a multi level discectomy and put cages if you can see in the second last picture on the lower row we added a plate in front and then we went from the back and completed the the process and she was well with no deficits and after removal of the rod in the first uh, operation that is the posterior operation the meps had improved so our correction without an anterior support was responsible for this worsening of meps so well what thing i learned was that you need to go anterior as well then we had this uh, 28 year old female again marfanoid similar picture and we did the same thing this time we we had learned our lesson with the last case we went from the back and uh, after loosening all the joints we came in from the front we did the discectomy we put cages in place and uh, put a plate anteriorly to brace and then went from the back again and corrected or completed the procedure and she did well then we had this 17 year old nf2 somebody had done extensive uh, laminectomy for him for her actually and uh, because of the laminectomy i suppose and she also had an intramedullary tumor uh, she developed this kyphosis and you can see in the last picture how the posterior elements are completely missing right down up to 4 5 6 and that's probably the reason why she developed this kyphosis so first hand experience so again we did the same thing we first went anterior did the discectomy put in cages then went from the back corrected it she is a wheelchair bound stable disease but thankfully there is no increase in the kyphosis and she she did well then we had this young man again marfan you can see how the way his bones are and this uh, severe kyphosis in the cervical spine where the c2 is touching the c4 if you can see the picture on the right here um then he had all these features of marfan syndrome classical marfan every feature in the book he had it here however he had this gross deformity in the cervical spine where the c3 was uh, not visible probably intraoperatively when we first opened 
we couldn't see the C3 because it was buried under the C2 and C4, which these two vertebrae were touching each other. Uh, this was the MRI, which uh, horrible looking MRI, where the cord seems to be tightly pulled over this C3, which forms a knuckle over which the cord rests. So again, we did the same thing. I went from the back first, we loosened all the joints, put in all the hardware. And as, as you can see in this last picture over here, there is already a gap between C2 and C4, just by loosening these joints and putting the screws in, in the lateral mass and the pedicle. The C2 has a screw in the pedicle, the rest are in the lateral masses. There is some gap where we can approach the C3. And in the second stage, uh, we did that. It turned supine. It, and the moment we applied distraction anteriorly, when we distracted the C2 and C4, separated them to reach C3, his MEP is dropped. So we stopped that procedure. We removed the distractor, gave him steroids, waited for some time. The MEP is improved, as you can see here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you see me? Yes, yes. Okay. And then uh, we had to fashion this cage, which, which was appropriate for the slope of C2 and the C4. We managed to excise the C3, put in a buttress plate uh, from the front between C2 and C4, and then went from the back and corrected this uh, gross deformity. And he did well. He, he went on to gain a height of 200 centimeters. He was really tall when he stopped growing. He was 200 centimeter tall and um, handsome young man now, but with a stable neck without any neurological deficits. So the evolution in the strategy was that we need MEP. And if, you, if there is a fall in MEP at any stage, you need to change the strategy. And the long segment posterior fixation is needed probably because short segment may give rise to failure. The bones are dysplastic in the syndromic and uh, you probably need a long segment fixation from the back. So this was the new things we learned. And lo and behold, we had this another Marfan syndrome, eight year old or 10 year old this time, where two of the vertebra seem to be buried inside. If you can see this picture, this is C2, this is C3, C4 and C5. So this time it's C2 and C5 touching each other and two vertebras are buried inside. And uh, many people had tried to distract, put in a halo, pelvic distraction, tried to distract him, pull it out, but it wasn't working. He was steadily deteriorating, uh, no appetite. He couldn't eat anything and he was losing weight and uh, generally not doing too well. So this was what his pictures of MRI and CT looked like. And again, we did the same thing. We went from the back first. I loosened all the joints, put in the screws, came in from the front, managed to excise two vertebral bodies, put in a plate and then corrected that. And uh, I think it jumped ahead. Okay. So you can see the final pictures here. And this was a CT scan done maybe after one year. And there was bone inside the cage, seemed to be growing. So we left him at that. We didn't do anything else. And he went on to have a cardiac surgery for his valvular defect. And overall, he's okay. He's sitting up, walking with support, eating on his own but still not neurologically completely normal. However, his spine is safe and it is holding. Another case, so I can go on. We probably evolved this uh, mechanism that we are going to do anterior and posterior. And uh, this seemed to work very well in many of these cases. And in some young children where they're still growing, you need to supplement it with a halo so that because the children move a lot, it's difficult to make them understand. And uh, sometimes even after these surgeries, we put them on a halo traction and see that their spine doesn't move till the bone fuses. So I'm going to sh show a couple of videos on a couple of interesting cases to you. There actually, it is very difficult to get an operative video for a cervical deformity case. You know, once you're in the microscope, it's very good to have a video, but I've tried to animate some interoperative pictures and maybe have a small clip, but let's see how this turns out. So this was a cervical spondyloptosis case with atlantoaxial dislocation. It was a four-year-old male child and he came with quadriparesis. So this was his neurology. I'm going to forward it. Um, we also did all kinds of uh, muscle and urodynamic study as well. This was a pre-op 
preoperative x-ray flexion and extension as you can see there's a lot of deformity it is very difficult to understand but then the ct actually showed us what his deformity was like and this was what his uh, ct looked like ct scan of the c spine the c1 c2 joints you can see the right and the left joints is there a lot of gaps and this was what the mri looked like again t2 weighted image uh, there are changes in the uh, signal oh, change yeah. in the cord again we applied traction and the patient was planned for stage surgery first was anterior fixation and halo and then posterior fixation as a second stage and that is exactly what we did uh, this was closed reduction with traction we tried to reduce him um with this and then we went in anteriorly we identified the disc space removed the body put the cage in placement of the mesh cage with of course bone graft and then the plate and the plate in small children it is difficult to sometimes get the right size so this so the earlier plate wouldn't stay so we had to use a bigger plate and go one level above and below and then we turned him after two days uh, we went in from the back and essentially the same procedure what i have been showing you in the earlier cases um except that here we did a c1 c2 transarticular screw to get the c1 c2 together so because it's under the microscope i think we have a short video clip here of the c1 c2 and then the rest of the operation we just completed by using lateral mass screws mostly i think in one place we had a pedicle screw the others were all lateral mass screws and um nothing much uh, nothing very different from earlier shown except that the final fixation picture looked like this and the child is doing all right you know we still in a halo and uh, his spine is holding and neurological deficits are no new neurological deficits and then finally i would like to show you this fantastic case which i had the uh, i don't know what can i say we we just got this patient referred from somewhere <coughs> chin on chest deformity ankylosing spondylitis these are all the pictures and her main complaint was uh, neurologically she was fine her main complaint was i just cannot see in front of me my children are growing my family is around me and i can't see anybody and again i have tried to animate some pictures and make a video out of it uh let's see how it looks like so this was the 32 year old lady progressive neck deformity for 6 years and inability to lift straight ahead so drop chin that's what she looked like so we did all that she was hla b27 positive and she had uh, ang spawn this was the way she used to walk if you can see that you know she couldn't see in front of her she was just unable to see but neurologically she was fine so the, so the idea was to make her straight somehow uh, get her to see in front and we did ct scan x rays and it was impossible to understand anything you can see the ct scan here you can't make head or tail out of what is what because her neck not only is bent and the chin touching the chest but uh, also it is twisted she is turned her head to one side so it is difficult to imagine anyhow we have this great tool surgery map it's called which tells you exactly what to do and then we tried to do it under o arm but she just would not fit so we had to do it without the o arm and uh, we had of course uh, neuro monitoring to help us and the airway itself was difficult it was very she we couldn't put a tube in through the mouth we had to put it through the nose and finally this is the position uh, we had for her if you can so it's kind of a sitting position with the neck tilted back and the chin touching the chest and this was the exposure we did from the back almost c2 to d2 and uh, this was the position what it looked like on the table and i remember that day we had the whole entire orthopedics department breathing down my neck the entire neurosurgery department breathing down my neck and people some people from the other hospitals who had come to see what is going on and everybody was thinking okay this patient is probably not going to make it this kind of a surgery this kind of a position anyhow so we uh, we carried on with the exposure um we exposed the whole spine from the back and we had this uh, image guided uh, thing to navigate but somehow it wasn't very convincing the image guided was not helping too much 
So anyway, we got the pedicle screws down in D or two, three, four, and the cervical lateral mass screws in the cervical spine above. And then uh, we finally the exposure was like this. And then we decided, okay, this is the part of the bone which we need to remove. That is the laterally of that C7 pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And you remove wedges from either side. I don't know if you can see, uh, they probably, no. Anyhow, so this is what was done ultimately. You can see the C6 root, C7 root, D1 root, and the entire bone is gone. And then we place some temporary rods on one side. And uh, my assistant and I, we just held the, the ring which we had applied to the head and straightened the neck after we had done the osteotomy. And after doing the osteotomy, that is the correction we got. Um, the first step, the wedge after the C7 wedge osteotomy. So I think there is a small video of this. So the rods were loosely fixed. They were not uh, tightened so that it can slide down. The rod can slide over the screws. And then um, once we had everything in place, we you can see my assistant just straightened, he just straightened the neck. You know, and I could hear the sound click where the anterior cortex of the broke and the neck became straight or straighter, if I may say so. Damn. And then they held the neck in that position and uh, they got both the rods in place and tightened the rods. Right. Can you ask them to mute the other? The operative video, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is all we could get. It was difficult to get. But finally, we fixed uh, it in the position and we co did correct some deformity in the sense that. Uh, the patient was quite happy with uh, what she had. Uh, you can go right down. This was what it was before. And this was the correction which we, which we finally managed to have. And this was her neck finally. And, but she could look in front and she was so happy with the, with the outcome of this surgery that I can see ahead and I can see my children growing up that she refused any other intervention. Because we, our plan was to correct the C1, C2 and uh, have another um, uh, osteotomy lower down in the spine to make her absolutely straight. But she was she just refused any more surgery. She went home and she's happy. Her neck is holding and she's getting on with her life with whatever uh, problem she has. Brave lady. So that brings us to the end of the thing. I Five would, minutes uh, remaining. So I'm done. So... There is not many, not much literature available. One uh, paper by Abhay talks about cervical kyphosis. He also says that circumferential approach, but um, he learned the hard way. I mean, we learned before Abhay published this paper and there's not much in the rest of the literature as well. So uh, who, whoever deals with these patients uh, should learn from my mistakes. You know, We learned the hard way. So you know two or three things right away. And let me go to the last slide. It is difficult to manage them with one approach alone. You probably need a 360 degree approach. And to get that reduction or to get those joints loose, you need to go from the back first. So it's a posterior, anterior, posterior surgery. So actually it's a 540 degree surgery, but then it gives you a lot of correction and it's safe. And if you have those MEPs in place, you're monitoring in, during the surgery, you can probably avoid any major catastrophe or major deficits. So some people did have IONM signal loss intraoperatively, but we changed, we changed the procedure. We stopped, gave steroids, then went anterior. And since we started doing this posterior, anterior, posterior, the MEPs have not troubled us since then. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me unshare my screen. Okay. I've unshared my screen. Uh, Palande, sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, Dr. Kali, that was a very excellent uh, presentation of really <coughs> challenging cases. And I think the last one was the icing on the cake. 
uh, uh, there also you did in stages the last case no no it was all one go because there was one. no space anteriorly okay. anteriorly her chin was touching the chest we so, could not even put an endotracheal tube so so you went only posterior only posterior sir okay only posterior yeah and uh, other cases where you go both uh, 540 yeah. uh, how much gap is there between the two stages maximum was two days two days Actually, okay it is uh, two two of those operations on one day and the third one on the last day on okay the if anybody has any question they are welcome we have got time otherwise uh, dr harish you can take over and i would thank uh, your dr vernon's young uh, host team for doing a really good job of this uh, conference of this seminar thank you palande sir yeah yeah so i hope you have uh, all of us are benefiting from this uh, webinar wherein we are you know getting through the operative techniques of different institutes so that we can have some changes or we can have some corrections or we can sort of share our uh, thoughts and uh, our techniques to other hospitals so continuing continuing with the next uh, talk uh, by, this will be moderated by dr sanjay kumar he is the consultant neuro and spine surgeon and also vice chairman of medica super specialty hospitals from ranchi jharkhand uh, he will be uh, uh, moderating the next talk uh, over to dr sanjay kumar sir okay. is uh yeah sanjay kumar sanjay has joined or no has he joined no i can't see him yeah if he's not there then uh, okay. let dr jayesh start because he's already introduced yeah so varna sir please moderate the talk by dr jayesh sir. yeah welcome jayesh for your next talk from the cv junction now he'll move on to minimally invasive interbody fusion techniques and uh, jayesh is a very fluid uh, spine surgeon he the goes up and down the spine doing everything so jayesh over to you first of all uh, thank you thank you very much sir uh, for giving me this opportunity thank you rishikesh thank you harish my good friend and uh, uh am i visible sir my screen my yes yes go ahead okay so this is all about uh, a minimal invasive lumbar interbody fusion technique basically this is the overview that mis approach interbody fusion can be done by three way posterior laterally and anteriorly so the concept of this minimally invasive lumbar fusion started with the pili that is a posterior lumbar interbody fusion so once they do laminectomy and put a cage from behind but because of lots of complication related to posterior approach they went to transforaminal approach the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion after removal of the facet still to date remain gold standard because of the mm, beautiful uh, decompression of both the side you can go via suas approach that is called lateral lumbar interbody fusion but exactly the brachial uh, this lumbar plexus lies in the suas muscle so latest approach is the oblique pre suas that is oblique lumbar interbody fusion very well known and popular and you can also go in between the major great vessels that is anterior lumbar interbody fusion now till day this two uh, approaches olif and tilif is doing uh, by maximum minimal invasive spine surgeon worldwide and short after method and more popular i would like to describe this two only today to start with the olive that is a minimal invasive oblique lumbar interbody fusion when to do so the indication is grade one or two list this is it's beautiful approach for the coronary deformity correction mainly lumbar scoliosis fantastic things for who already operated for previous lumbar fusion and again presented with the failed back syndrome or the adjacent segment disease when not to do that is more important than when to do the principle of olive is 
indirect decompression means you are jacking up the disk space. So it is contraindicated in the severe kenosis, which do require a direct decompression. The clinical indus, uh, indication is very important to understand. It is, it is not indicated in rest pain when patient have a predominant radicular pain, which is not relieved by the rest. So indication is predominant back pain or when your pain is relieved by the rest, then it, is, it can have a good result. Anatomy need to understand very well. So olive is basically a minimal invasive retropatonal approach through the lateral of the abdomen in between the psoas muscle and the major laterally muscle. and the peritoneal contents fall anteriorly. Now, this has to be done in the right lateral digobitis position always from the left side. So idea is you just have to go from the lateral abdomen while splitting of this three abdominal muscle with the help of blunt finger dissection, you, you want to, you should push all the peritoneal content anteriorly until you feel, until you reach the psoas muscle, which you can feel from the, your tip of finger. And anterior to that, when you put it, uh, you, you, when you feel the disc space, you directly put this olive retractor over the disc space. You do a thorough discectomy and put a cage from here. So this is the same principle which we are following in the SEDF in the cervical approach. Now the problem is the psoas plexus, the whole the lumbar plexus lies in the posterior half within the muscle, except the genitofemoral now, which always remains superficial to it. It, it may cross at the alpha 5 disc space and you should remove it posteriorly. It may cross, came across in your way, you should move it posteriorly. Ureter, don't worry about ureter. It, it, it usually hide behind the peritoneum and you can push it anteriorly automatically while you are pushing the peritoneum. Sympathetic chain, which lies both the side of the spine and uh, it's, it's, it's came across in the anterior half of your corridor, it should move anteriorly. Sometimes this cross connecting fibers are there and you can sacrifice easily without any problem in the post -operative. Sometimes you have a lower transient lower extremity symptoms due to that, but no deficits. The most important crucial and vascular structures are these great vessels the aorta and IVC, because the bifurcation is very important. Please remember that aorta is bifurcated L4 and IVC is bifurcated L5. So in preoperative MRI, you should see the, 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 dip, the exact location of the bifurcation and relation with the psoas muscle. Because sometimes IVC may bifurcate at high up and th those uh, left side yellow lumbar vein may come across in your picture. And uh, sometimes it may damage and may lead to a devastating complication. So that is very important point. So idea is you remove the disc, uh, or thorough discectomy for that from their oblique approach, use a wide cage, put in this disc space, and then you can directly put a PVOX plate. It is very small, like in SCDF, you can use directly, and you can put it over the disc space and you can put a two long screw diagonally directly into the body space like this. Very fast, short procedures will, will have a good recovery. So coming to the case example, uh, this is a 60 year male patient with a back pain with a bilateral lower limb radiculopathy since one year. Of course, there is no rest pain. And no neurological deficit. Then X-ray should be seen. Uh, should be seen. This L45 grade one listhesis. No coronal deformity, and it was planned for olive. MRI should be carefully looked for the severe kenosis. There should be no severe kenosis here. It is a mild kenosis and should be prolapse. It's a good case for the olive. Now, the most important thing: the day before the surgery, you should. Look in all axial serial MRI scan. You should start from L2, L3 level, follow the anterior to the body. This is the aorta, this is the IVC. So you should serially trace it till it bifurcate into the common iliac vessel. So it's a left common iliac artery and IVC into the left, uh, the right common iliac vein. So why from the left side? You always see that this left common iliac artery and the psoas muscle, here the psoas muscle. The space always left side is broader than the right side between the vein and psoas muscle. 
and this distance would be maximum one centimeter minimum one centimeter distance would be there between the left common artery and psoas muscle if it is less than that this procedure is contraindicated this is the position right lateral decubitus always from the left side under fluoroscopy mark the l4 and l5 disc space you mark the mid disc space point you just remain 4 to 7 cm anteriorly just 2 to 3 cm incision is required either you transverse or the oblique you can directly reach to the disc space there so just 2 to 3 cm incision required i prefer a transverse incision parallel to this space it should be always parallel to the disc space it would be easy then all the muscles across the space like external oblique it should be split internal oblique then transversalis abdominalis and then fascia and then you can directly reach into the retropental fat so once you reach the retropental fat you use this finger blunt dissection push all the abdominal content from the retropetaneum to move anteriorly till you feel the psoas muscle at the fingertip like this so once you feel that psoas muscle can directly slip into the body and disc space you can feel the disc space and the body at l4 5 level this is a, the psoas muscle with overlying genital femoral now in the microscope picture so once you feel that you should use the force dilator or the probe because this all procedure is being done under fluoroscopy so you you should make sure that your probe should be exactly at the disc space for localization and always remember that the posterior half is the psoas muscle with full number plexus so you should always remain anterior half is this a boblic approach use all the dilators one by one always try to rotate and push a dilator so your muscle fiber remains safe and cannot entangled and may damage your retractor should be placed in the anterior half of the disc space this is the lateral mast quadrant retractor particularly for olive and you can fix it over the disc space by this pin the and this retractor should be fixed with the table from the umbilicus side now take a microscope uh, under your vision there is always uh, there, there should be a disc space exactly and 1.5 to 2 cm size anelotomy is required for a thorough discectomy so as far as complete discectomy should be done now most important in key for interbody fusion is end plate preparation so remember that the end plate have a two part one is a cartilage part and one is bony part so for cartilage part removal you, you need may require a shaver and the cork forceps forceps available and the end plate part should be just curate they need to curate so avoid excessive end plate preparation but should be optimal so the most important step contralateral anulotomy by the blunt push with the cork forceps It, it helps to align the uh, all the deformity and this space is sequentially distracted with the trials and under fluoroscopy you can see that whether there is a sagittal and coronal your your disc space should be wide enough your idea is to achieve the one level above or one level below disc space that is approximately 8 mm to 10 mm and you should confirm it that all the foramen should be widened because it is a principally indirect decompression method so it's very important that you are putting all the instruments obliquely but at the end it should move parallel to the disc space your idea is to protect the spinal canal so this maneuver is known as orthogonal maneuver so you enter the instrument obliquely and then it convert into orthogonally 90 degree now full wide cage with autograft placed inside the same principle just go obliquely and then make it parallel to the disc space so uh, this is sagittal orientation after distraction of disc space coronal sagittal curvature alignment is confirmed in the fluoroscopy always put the cage under fluoroscopy so that you can confirm there are four landmark uh, this is translucent landmark 
So the middle two landmarks should be exactly parallel to the uh, spinous process here. And then finally, you can use percutaneous pedicles through fixation or you directly put a plate over the disc space. Put a two screw diagonally into the body and fix it. So this is how olive can be proceed. So now uh, uh, this is a post of things. Olive sometimes can be done for lumbar scoliosis. The posterior pedicle through fixation is a more standard. Great tool is this is can also be reduced. It's a long term outcome. Once you even use the oblique fixation method directly, played over the key, uh, cage. Uh, two two years, support four years, and three years follow up with fantastic interval diffusion. Multiple level olive with a single incision, especially in the patient with adjacent segment disease, can have a several advantage. Especially, you know, uh, you can avoid that complicated exhaustive uh, revision surgery. And with a single incision anteriorly of three centimeter, you can approach this kind of three level, four level surgery. Neuro navigation significantly reduce the uh, amount of radiation and uh, enhance the accuracy in this process. Some of the literature. Now, what are the complications? The most common one is the pain in paresthesia because you are dealing with the lumbar plexus. So pain in paresthesia at the middle part of the thigh, sometimes temporary worse weakness happens, but usually remain for two to three weeks, not more than that. As I told, major vessel injuries less than 1%. So what is the advantage of volume? Of course, the best part is the better segmental lordosis is achieved compared to TLIF, that is five to six degree according to the literature. You are putting the large size of cage and graft uh, in anterior column, and you are putting it the transverse position at the end plate. So less chance of cage subsidence. Reserve the posterior column because you are going from anteriorly muscle band, so rapid recovery, no chance of CSF and nerve related complication. Now coming to the other procedure, TLIF, more standard. The difference is it is a direct neural decompression method with interbody fusion via the transforaminal approach. So what is TLIF? So stepwise, you put first four pedicle screw and adjacent level of disc space, then place percutaneously the masked posterior quadrant retractor over the facet joint because the idea is to remove the inferior articular process and the superior articular process to make a window. The, the degree of then, then you put a cage, either you can put a bullet safe cage or you can put a banana cage, whatever you want, the single cage is enough. As per the literature, overall, the fusion rate is uh, the, the best uh, part of the TLIF is you can do a direct decompression from this side, all of the canal. Uh, and both the nerve root can be decompressed under vision. That is the best part of TLIF. That's why it's the main gold, gold standard. When to do, the indication are same. Uh, the grade one tool is this is foraminal and lateral uh, stenosis, chronic lumbar disc herniation with segment, segmental instability, and sometimes for the Feldbeck syndrome. But uh, in my experience, the ideal indication to start this kind of MIS fusion is grade one L45 and spondylolisthesis. Always use a left, uh, do it first, first 10 to 20 case in the left side radicular pain because more easy because you are the right handed. Never choose the patient with a lumbar scoliosis, severe gynastenosis, obese patient, and osteoporotic. This should be avoided because in those cases, the while putting a percutaneous pedicle through fixation, the pedicle accuracy to define the pedicle will be very, very difficult because of this case. Case example, back pain with L4 radicular pain, left side, and we can see there is a grade one L3-4 listasis with mild stenosis due to disc prolapse. So position is prone, you can put on the two bolsters or you, you can use a Wilson frame. But the idea is to do a maximum reverse lordosis by maximum lumbar straightening. If you are using the Wilson frame, you can open it. If you are using the pillow, then you can uh, do a maximum hip flexion to provide this reverse lordosis. 
Now the steps already I mentioned in the AP view, first mark midline and then four pedicle like this. Your incision came in between the lateral border of the pedicle, lateral border of the two medical of the secure. Now place a guide wire, four guide wire through the four pedicles first. I will not describe the technique of uh, uh, pedicle fixation, but first four guide wire, then procedure of skin. The incision exactly came in between the left side two guide wire, exactly over the L45 facet joint, in the line of L45 disc. So your first dilator should be placed in L45 facet joint directly, exactly at here. It should be confirmed on the skin. And the track via splitting the muscle that uh, sequentially dilated, track is sequentially dilated till maximum 22 millimeter dilator. And this is the posterior percutaneous, posterior mass quadrant retractor. For the olive, you can use the lateral quadrant retractor. This is a different, this is a posterior quadrant retractor. The idea is to put over the facet joint and take a micro both the facet joint, particularly the inferior article of the lower lamina. You can feel this facet joint is moving. So you identify the joints. The medial lamina is the medial spinous process. Cranial is the part, bottom process. Can you please mute, uh, mute uh, others? When the drilling started, drilling should be started medially. The final process depends on how much to be How much more to be compressed. Manisha, could you mute the others, please? Always start to decompress from the base of the spinous process. Idea is to remove the whole inferior articular process in order to expose the cambium triangle. I always used to preserve this bone particles of inferior articular process so that I can use later on as an autograft in the disc space. The cage. There's a lot of uh, uh, noise there. I would like to request technical team to mute others. Bupendra, please mute the others by default. Thank you, thank you. So, so, so this is wonderful cambium triangle. You should expose it, and that is nothing but between the exiting root, traversing root, and medially the dura. So, so this is the cambium triangle need to expose because this is the place where you are going to do a discectomy. Five minutes remaining. Fine, fine. So, annulotomy. And so after you do complete discectomy with good end plate preparation, trials is put to di uh, dilate the disc space till you achieve the good segmental lordosis. This is the uh, bullet shaped cage with the bone inside, photographed. And the final. Then those guide wire is replaced with the percutaneous screw and percutaneous rod. And this is the instrument. Uh, there's an inc uh, incision for significant reduction in the ODI score, and patient can be discharged on day two or day three. Common complication medial pedicle breach while, while putting a percutaneous pedicle screw fixation. So, those who are beginning this procedure, the one message is to avoid this. First, 1.5 to 2 centimeter. Uh, while you are putting the percutaneous, you using a jamsadi needle. First, 1.5 to 2 centimeter jamsadi needle is should be done in the AP view, and during that you should avoid the breach to the medial to medial pedicle border. You should not cross the medial pedicle border. If you do that in the AP view first, then you will never going to do a pedicle breach. Others are very common. Now, 
what is ELIF? That is a very, very recent, most latest method. If you do a same procedure, what I explained in the ELIF, in the percutaneous endoscopic way, then it is ELIF, the endoscopic lumbar interbody diffusion, the same things. This is just a case example of L45 uh, listhesis with canal stenosis. This is a PSLD set. You can do with the transforaminal set, which is commonly used for the transforaminal discectomy also. Usually I do this ELIF with this one. It has a 25 field of view and 6 mm outer space. What is the difference in the incision? The incision of one centimeter is just needed directly over the L45 facet joint. Just a one centimeter incision on the side of pain, directly over the L45 facet joint. You put a guide wire, then put a dilator, put a cannula or the track. You can confirm that your cannula is exactly at L45 facet joint. And this is a procedure completely by the percutaneous endoscopically method, complete under saline flow. This is the base of spinous process, lamina, and this is a lateral facet joint. So here we can see the dislocated facets. So inferior articular process is completely with the lamina is completely drilled. The principle is same. We are using in all till time is up. Fine, fine. I'm, I'm just moving fast. Last one minute. Then the disc is completely excised. On both the side, now root should be decompressed under vision. And via this disc space, you can put a cage. So this is the final method. So I would like to con conclude. There is a limited evidence demonstrating that one approach is superior uh, in terms of fusion or clinical outcome. But according, if I conclude all the literature, data suggests that the anterior techniques are superior for disc height restoration, lumbar lordosis, and deformity correction. But as far as clinical outcome and fusion rate compared till date, anterior and posterior fusion are same. Relief is always same in the gold standard till date. And of course, uh, incision doesn't make it miss, tube doesn't make it miss. Sometimes it may make you miss because it is a technology de dependent. If you can't see, you cannot see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jay, for that excellent presentation and showing all the different MISS techniques. And, uh, uh, my only one question to you is, uh, which is more technically easier? Which is more technically easier to learn? I'm not, uh, and technically easier to master number one. And uh, also I want to know what are the levels which you will, uh, you know, advise this procedure for? Like suppose if it is an L2, L3 disc, would you be uh, using this procedure for a L2, L3 disc prolapse? So you have to have some uh, reasons to choose the approach for the certain level. Yeah. So Go ahead. Very nice question, sir. Uh, simpler to learn is MIS TLIF always because he always, you know, we are uh, uh, very handy for uh, open TLIF. We all, all the neurosurgeon learns to uh, already knows how to do laminectomy, how to expose both the side of facet joint, how to remove that facet joint. The only difference with, in MISS is you are doing the same thing, but with percutaneous leaf. Because OLIF is something which is uh, uh, because you need to uh, learn the retropatron anatomy first and you to deal with all the retropatron structure. So it is complicated so that is the first answer the second is as far as level is concerned olif is limited to l2 to l5 for l5 s1 of course it is uh, a different ball of game uh, but l5 s1 really would be better for l2 to l5 if you ask me i should i always for l2 to l5 i would prefer olive for l5 to s1 i would prefer tilif and uh, l5 s1 they're doing trans ILAC also. Yeah, definitely. For L5 S1, they're using a trans ILAC uh, yeah. route. That is what. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jayesh. And over to you, Harish, to continue the proceedings.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. And now moving on to the next uh, talk, which will be moderated by Dr. Uh, Selvan Rajendra. <coughs> he is uh, head of department of Kanyakumari Government Medical College from Nagar Coil, Tamil Nadu. Uh, word to Dr. Selvan Rajendra, please. Good evening, everybody. We are having a nice session on minimally invasive surgeries. And it's time to call Dr. Rajesh Kumar Lukana, who is doing a wonderful job in Gujarat, Vadodara to proceed with an interesting topic of learning about the complications of minimally invasive surgery and how to deal with it. Welcome, Dr. Rakesh Kumara. Now you can take it over. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Varan and team for inviting. My talk is about uh, minimally invasive spine surgery complications and management. So basically, I will be talking about a tubular system and microscopic minimally invasive spine surgery. So our main workhorse is a fixed diameter tube, which is a matrix. I use 14 millimeter tube as well as 18 millimeter tubes. Tumors, we do it with a quadrant X tube. I began with X tube, but now I don't use it anymore. The glimpse of the type of cases we do, like this is a MIS microdiscectomy done through a 14 millimeter port. The multi level canal stenosis we can do, like this patient had a three level canal stenosis done through a small uh, incisions like this. MIS T leaf, as Dr. Jayesh has explained, it's one of the very beautiful procedure with an excellent outcome. This is pre op and post op x rays. Facet sinual cyst, uh, we do it from a contralateral approach to preserve the facet and get a better orientation, like this, like shown here. We do it intradural tumors as well in a minimally invasive way. This is how we uh, go about retractor microscopy. This is the specimen after excision. And the beauty of MISS is you leave behind a very minimal footprint. Like this patient had a L1 ependymoma. This is pre-op, this is post-op. Actual pre-op, post-op, uh, excellent uh, outcome you can see on a post-operative. But these are all on good days. But when we had complications, as in any other procedure, it becomes difficult. We'll, we'll share what kind of complications can occur. So complications can occur at a stage of planning. Like you, if your planning is wrong, whatever good surgery you do, you are going to get a failure. So it's very important how you plan your surgery, choose the right patient, right surgery, and then succession is success is usually guaranteed. The complication can occur at an execution stage while docking, while decompression, while placing a screw or cage. So at every stage, one has to be careful. And there are some post-operative complications which will be early or late. So as Dr. Atul Gawande said once, that the difference between triumph and defeat you will find is not about willingness to take risk. It's about mastery of rescue. And that mastery will come with experience. So we'll share some cases where we had complications. So this was a 62 year old gentleman who presented with a left leg pain. He was unable to stand more than 10 minutes and unable to walk more than 100 steps. And it was predominantly a leg dominant symptoms. He had a left SLR positive, EHL was grade four and had hypoesthesia four, four, five and S1. We got a dynamic X-rays which ruled out instability and MRI uh, showed L3-4 and L4-5, L4, very severe stenosis with a disc herniation. These are actual images showing 3-4 stenosis with a left paracentral disc herniation. L4-5 again, very severe stenosis with a component of disc bulge as well. So our plan was to do two level MIS decompression from a left, doing a bilateral decompression as well as discectomy, first at 3-4 and then L5. So this is, we were doing first level L3-4 contralateral decompression at halfway, there was, uh, dura was very thin and adherent to ligamentum phlegm and then uh, we had a bad dural tear and you can see the nerve roots were pouting out. Uh, I'm trying to put the nerve roots back in, but uh, because when there is a tight canal from front, there was a disc as well as component of canal stenosis. It was difficult to put the nerve roots back in. So then I used a blunt hook and try again to find out dural edges and try to put the nerve roots in. I also asked anesthetist to 
put a low tidal volume anesthesia or apnea for a small period of time but uh, the no roots were not getting in then i used a gel foam just to cover the roots and try to you know uh, take uh, use gel foam and try to gently push it inside whether we can that can help so once uh, we place now roots almost now roots back in covered with again another uh, piece of gel foam and then i thought of uh, begin decompression in other areas because we realized that without completing decompression it's difficult to go ahead so we tilted the tube ipsilaterally and we are doing ipsilateral lateral recess decompression so this is left l3 for lateral recess decompression with a left l4 for amniotomy now after completing ipsilateral lateral recess decompression we are focusing on l3 for discectomy there was basically a hard disc so annulus was incised and we are doing l3 for discectomy here with a blunt hook without doing much of retraction i am making sure to take out the pieces underneath the thecal sac and uh, do a total do a good amount any good decompression basically good ventral decompression so after completing discectomy we are now moving on to and tilted the tube inferiorly and take out inferior part of compression which is like a lower ligamentum phlegm with which is attached to upper lamina upper l4 so at every stage you have to make sure that you are not biting a root because any single mistake would cause a catastrophic event so at every stage you have to make sure that you are not biting root here so with uh, we have this suction retractor and try to make sure that roots are safe and then uh, biting so that is ipsilateral l4 foramina and then now this small part of lower l4 l3 4 level compression again the roots are coming out so i again have to cover it with a gel foam and then proceed further <coughs> so cover it with a gel foam and patty and then uh, taking that part of ligamentum phlegm which is causing a compression so we used two two and three number punches here and uh, using blunt hook as a dissection so uh, now we will go on contralateral side but at every stage you uh, i just wanted to make sure that your nerve roots are safe so again trying to put nerve roots back in because now we have to go on our opposite side again <coughs> so now we are doing a contralateral lateral recess decompression like this is we are from left side and doing a right sided lateral recess decompression we can we could also see that there was a disc protrusion from opposite side as well which will require a discectomy from contralateral side as well so after completing contralateral decompression taking out that ligamentum phlegm on opposite side yeah now we are seeing that the disc is protruded
so incise the annulus on opposite side and taking the disc fragments out here whenever there is a dural tear you have to make sure that you are not retracting too much because there is not much of CSF you can retract too much which can be dangerous post-operatively now roots may get injured basically so this is a hard disk fragments coming out So completing a contralateral lateral assist decompression, yeah, making sure good decompression with a blunt hook. So basically in a lumbar canal stenosis, you have to uh, do it compartment wise, ipsilateral superior, ipsilateral inferior, contralateral upper half and then contralateral inferior half. So now it is the last part of decompression where we have to do a contralateral L4 for aminotomy. Just making sure that your nerve roots are safe, covering with the gel foam and then uh, doing a final part of decompression. With a blunt hook, we can make sure that your nerve roots are free. You've got a good decompression. That is the last part we are taking out. Okay, so once the decompression is done, we have to uh, make sure that now we get a proper dural reconstruction. So here the margins are not very regular and with a smaller 18 millimeter tube, it's very difficult to uh, do a suture. So we decided to use a dura gen here. So putting nerve roots back in. Now with a decompression done from all the sides, it's easier to put the nerve roots back in. And this is a dura gen. So cover the defect entirely, make sure that all the nerve roots are in and the defect is properly covered and then cover it with a glue. So in a case of large neural dare with nerve roots spouting in, try to put nerve roots back in you transient apnea or low volume ventilation helps cover with F gel petty and continue uh, surgery away from the site of tumor and then come back to the area of tear make sure you don't pull out the nerve roots at any stage dura gen or glue will be of help if it looks like a more struggle then you can make change to a larger expandable retractor and do not hesitate to convert to open in the case of minor dural tear where at the end you will see that uh, puncture small puncture and CSF is coming out. What we use is a muscle patch and this is kind of graft pressure ENT device. So you make a muscle patch like this and then cover uh, the defect. And then use a glue. Minor dural tear is not that much of a problem in a minimally invasive surgery. Uh, chances of 
post operative csf leak is very very less but it's always better uh, so to be safer intraoperatively so cover with ab gel or patty use a keyhole succession suction so that you don't expand extend the tear use a muscle patch and glue so preventive strategy is better so what kind of cases where the risk of dural tear is higher those are revision surgery severe stenosis facet sinoval cyst chronicity of symptoms disc herniation with a background stenosis large disc herniation these are the cases where the risk of dural tear is higher in those cases you have to be more cautious so principle would be to do bony work first preserve ligamentum phlegm all around uh, in lumbar canal stenosis do a contralateral decompression first whenever there is a disc associated with lcs like this case do a discectomy first and then go contralateral and while using a punch dissect first remove adhesions make sure that you be watchful while taking a bite and don't take a bite if you are not seeing like if there is a blur there or angle is not proper it's me you make sure that you make a angle properly and you can see properly before biting another case i would like to show about is a cervical foramenal disc so basically ms cervical lamino foramenotomy for cervical foramenal disc is an excellent procedure it's basically a targeted fragmentectomy it's a disc preserving surgery excellent results in properly selected cases but it's not that popular because predominantly it's because of intraoperative bleeding so this is good case for this kind of case where this patient had a c67 disc herniation with a triceps weakness and very severe pain he had a, this kind of foramenal soft disc herniation uh, excellent procedure for this kind of cases so basically you go from prone posteriorly make a smaller dilator over which serial dilators are placed and then you will retract this place then you get a microscope in and then you make a lamino foramenotomy so this was one of the case where we had extensive bleeding so we we completed a lamino foramenotomy we are retracting the root superiorly and finding a disc but as soon as we try to manipulate the root there was extensive bleeding and this during this case we took a lot of time it's frustrating and uh, this patient developed post operatively uh, right side uh, paresthesia as well as right hand weakness as well which gradually recovered so there are many important strategies that you can make so when you are doing cervical posterior foramen anatomy make sure that in position while positioning your head should be high avoid excessive neck flexion uh, it should be a normal normal tensive anesthesia so basically this is a lateral border of lamina medial border of lateral mass then use drill for uh, bony removal so lower half of superior lamina and upper third of upper lamina should be drilled so make a window there between uh, two laminas and then uh, extension with a fine 1 mm punches to the foramina while taking punches make sure that you don't take any vessels beneath so this is extension to the medial half of uh, lateral mass so this is important point there are vessels running vertically over thecal sac so make sure that you coagulate them before they starts bleeding this is ligamentum phlegm over thecal sac so take out ligamentum phlegm and then there will be a thin layer of vessels over the dura so coagulate that coagulate cut and then uh, you would see like this is this is a thecal sac this is a root and on retracting root superiorly you will see a disc herniation so use a blunt hook and take out the disc fragment there was a large disc herniation and you take out with the disc punches so there will be some bleeding at the end but it's a basically a low flow venous channel which can be easily controlled with a pack and this is at the end another case so 75 year old lady 
presented with a long standing back pain and leg pain unable to walk more than 5 minutes she had a limping gait with the slr positive and left ehl edl was grade 4 we got a mri which showed severe l4 5 stenosis with a facet arthropathy and on a dynamic x ray we could see that she had 4 5 listhesis with a dynamic instability we plan for mis l4 5 t lift so everything was going well we placed contralateral screws ipsilateral k wire discectomy was done disc prepared and while putting a cage i i felt the loss of resistance and while trying to grab uh, that uh, cage again the cage migrated went uh, anteriorly and on a cm image it was looking like a vertical the cage migrated ventrally up so this is very scary because at l45 you have a risk that you know you might get vessels get injured so it was very scary patient was hemodynamically stable we completed posterior fixation consolidator was consolidator vascular surgeon arranged three pcv because at times during prone patient may even stable but as soon as you turn supine they may get hypotension so we kept everything ready and then turn patient supine fortunately patient remained vitally stable we shifted her to icu uh, kept under observation and next morning we got a ct angio fortunately the cage was sitting between aorta and ivc you can see that uh, then we decided what to do next. Uh, consulted a vascular surgeon. He suggested that it's better to remove this cage because it would cause later on pseudo aneurysm. As well as we did a discectomy, but we had not fusion. So in both the cases, uh, in both the scenario, it's better to freak out it. So we used a retroperitoneal approach, took out the cage and reposition back into the disc, as in olive. So. This is this is at the end. Post operatively remain uneventful. Uh, this is three months follow up. So cage placement must be under CM. We have to be careful while disc preparation and cage placement. There was one last case. So this was a 68 year old gentleman uh, with acute left leg pain of three months duration, which was severe, excruciating, not responding to analgesics. He had left EHL EDL weakness of grade three. This was MRI which showed L4 5 paralateral disc herniation. So our plan was to do a MIS paralateral discectomy. Intraoperatively went uneventful. We could found a fragment and we were happy. But postoperatively, the patient complained that he had a lower limb monoparesis with paresthesias. We could not figure out why it happened. So we got MRI. So called got a call from MRI that said disc fragment is out. So we got a whole spine screening. I thought maybe cervical, but uh, whole spine screening was absolutely fine. So I said, maybe stroke, let's get MRI brain. We found small ischemic lesion in cerebellum, NGO was okay, so this could, this could not explain. So we went back to local site, got a CT, it showed a hematoma, which was small hematoma. But when we got NGO, we realized that patient had a deceased aortoiliac and there is abrupt cutoff. So basically it was a vascular insert causing a neurological deficit again consolidated vascular surgeon and on looking back that first mri image we could see that the track was like this so probably disc punch went beside and probably it, it bite that and because of it was deceased aorto iliac there was not much of blood loss and that's why we didn't recognize the event then there was no hypotension in trout so re-explored and you can see that abrupt cutoff it was bad vessel, so aorto dist and distal thrombus was there, so distal thromboembolectomy was done with a iliofemoral bypass was done. By this time, patient had a compartment syndrome as well, so fasciotomy was done. The minimally invasive surgery turned into very maximally invasive surgery, but even that was unable to salvage. Patient had an acute renal failure and unfortunately lost him. So keep in mind vascular lesions, early detection and early intervention only could have saved him. So take home message, MISS has a long learning curve. Choose your cases wisely. Start with simple discectomy and progress gradually. Try to prevent complications by all means. Better patient selection, detailed planning and perfect execution. All steps are important. If complications happen, identify the problem, keep yourself calm. Find out the bailout strategy and tackle as best as possible. Take seniors or colleagues help if available. Counseling is very important. Pre-operative, do explain common complications. 
Five minutes remaining. If any complication occurred, do explain to relatives. Discuss your plan ahead and possible consequences. Keep the relatives in a loop every time. Transparency is must and try to learn from others' mistake. As Nora Robin Robert said, nothing worthwhile is ever without complications. So complications would be part of journey, but we must learn and progress. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Dr. Rakesh. You have narrated the possible complications very nicely. And Thank you, you put sir. the word, learn from others' mistakes. That's a very important word. And we have time for questions also. I have two. Yes, sir. One in which uh, I have learned a lesson to keep the ligamentum flavum intact when doing the bone intersection. That is one excellent explanation. Because in all cases of canal stenosis, we'll be having uh, coming across a lot of additions between the dura and the ligamentum flavum. When we start dissecting the ligamentum flavum, the possibility of dural injury is low. Yes, sir. It's one point to be taken in mind. And the other thing, when you converted the T leaf into A leaf, when you hmm. had a slippage of migration of the crab, have, right. you, have you used a large size cage? Because no, same cage, sir. No, we could use the same cage. Mm -hmm. The same cage? Same cage. Within the ruptured ALL also. Yes, 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 same cage, yeah. How many times you have converted it into your open surgery in case of complications? Um, sir, any no no surgery so far, fortunately, we have we needed to convert into open, sir. Excellent, sir. Any questions yeah, from the audience, sir? Yeah, you had a compliment for us to portrayal of complications. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you have put a lost word. No, learn from others' mistakes. It's an excellent word. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rakesh. Uh, yes, sir. Very, very uh, nice presentation. Excellent, as usual. Uh, just, uh, I am very impressed with those uh, muscle patches you have used for many Yes, sir. Yeah. Is, is it customized instrument or what about that? So, basically, uh, I work with ENT guys for pituitary. Once I was seeing his surgery and he had this instrument. They use it for tympanic membrane. It's called graft press. So, basically, now what we do is when you are docking a dilator, we always have some muscles coming in. So, we always just keep a muscle beside. If needed, just uh, press it, use it as a patch and cover it over a dural tear. It works really well. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so that's, that concludes the session, uh, final session number one. So thank you, Dr. Rakesh Lohana and Dr. Salon Rajendra sir, for uh, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts and views on this uh, spine topic. Now, moving on to the end of the final session, we'll uh, just show you a, a brief teaser flyer of our upcoming uh, NSSA conference. Uh, Dr. Mayuresh, please share the screen.
Varnan sir, can you? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead with the next session. Yeah. So moving on to the next session. So we have with us uh, moderator uh, like Dr. Deepak Kumar Singh. He is the professor and head department of neurosurgery from Ram Manohar Loya Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. He'll be moderating this talk uh, by, by Dr. Vivek Joseph. Is Dr. Uh, Deepak Kumar there? Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, this, okay Dr. Varnan, uh, hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Before we... Okay, so moving on to the second spinal session, and I would like to invite Dr. Vivek Joseph, FRCS, MCH, and he is currently head of the Department of Neurological Sciences and is heading the Neurosurgery Unit 3 in Christian Medical College, Vellore. And uh, now he is going to present his talk on technically demanding spinal surgery. Dr. Vivek, the platform is yours. Thank you. My talk is already loaded. Uh, can Are you, you go ahead and play it, please? Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Vern and uh, Velo, for this opportunity to show some videos. I'll be showing uh, three short videos. Thank you. First is a 54-year-old main with mid-thoracic pain and no deficits. MRI showing this contrast enhancing pile lesion of the thoracic cord posterior placed and more to the left side so pre-op diagnosis of a hemangioblastoma so this is the dural opening and you can see the hemangioblastoma red lesion popping out first thing is to try and cut the arachnoid between the tumor and the spinal cord so using a needle to do that this is a 23 gauge needle you can use a 25 gauge needle also uh, doing it at the bo at uh, one pole and then going to the other pole continuing the same with a micro scissor on the side which is easier to access as you can see, we, have, we, we, we are not able to see the uh, tumor uh, cord junction on the blind side or on the other side. Now we are trying to define the plane. So just uh, standard micro dissection between the tumor nodule and the pia of the spinal cord using the bipolar on the tumor side to control any bleeding and more importantly to coagulate and cut small small vessels which will be entering and leaving the nodule So yeah, so going around it sequentially, now we are slowly able to see the other side of the tumor. So we've gone around one pole of the tumor now, pro that's probably the superior pole. Yeah, now we are going around the other pole. So coagulating and dividing small vessels. So you can just about see the dorsal there. It is that's uh, one of the nerve roots related to the tumor and uh, trying to dissect it off the tumor. Uh, 
again same principle to any vessels entering and leaving the tumor buzz and cut it make the error of bipolar ring towards the tumor side you have to be a little careful because sometimes after you bipolar the whole area becomes white and you know you may cut into coagulated tumor and leave bits of tumor behind so uh, you should you should be careful about that where there's no need to bipolar you could just cut pile strands and arachnoid strands yeah so slowly now th from one side we are reaching towards the anterior side of the tumor now we are going again back to the opposite pole yeah cutting strands of pia yep now we are able to define things a little better so the surgery is following the principles of any hemangioblastoma anyway try and avoid getting into the tumor try and stay around the tumor Yeah, so it's getting dissected off the cord now. Yeah, uh, the tumor is out probably a little bit. May be, may still be there, and now that has also been removed. Okay, going on to the next case. Oh, the sorry, the biopsy. The biopsy was reported as a hemangioblastoma as suspected preoperatively. Going on to the next case, 41-year-old male with six months history of neck pain and progressive spastic paresis with his intramedic uh, intramedullary cervical tumor not enhancing very well, with some suspicion of hemorrhage at both poles. So. This is the dura has been opened over the cervical spinal cord, coagulating the midline, which is recognized uh, approximately the midpoint between the two dorsal root entry zones on either side, and pile vessels which will be dipping into the midline. Then cutting the coagulated midline with a 15 blade knife, following which we gradually deepen with a dissector until we reach the tumor which is shown here now and the principles of this surgery are just like the principles of any other surgery do internal decompression and try and identify the plane between the cord and the tumor and it is important to get a hold of the poles of the tumor again if you decompress and you are able to go around at least one pole of the tumor then that's the turning point of the surgery the remaining surgery becomes much easier so doing piecemeal ext excision and internal decompression and uh, yeah trying to get the plane around one of the poles of the tumor there you can see that we are able to see the cord tumor junction this becomes a little easier once sufficient tumor is removed or internal decompression is done and sticking to the plane uh, using principles of micro neurosurgery gentle dissection Yeah, getting the plane on the ipsilateral side. Uh, 
and removing the tumor piecemeal. So it's a combination of identifying the plane, internal decompression, piecemeal removal and then continuing in the same manner, slowly going across the tumor and around the poles of the tumor. Again, if that use uh, dissector combination of dissector, and this is I'm now going around the tumor pole, which initially was left behind. Yeah, so that bit has come out now. continuing the dissection towards the other pole and sometimes that junction is firm and it's you know it becomes traumatic using a dissector in which case it's better to use a micro scissor okay same principles piecemeal removal internal decompression identify the plane yeah again this is the other pole same principles if you do some internal decompression uh, of the poles also it becomes a little easier to go around the pole firm tissue needs to be cut Now I've changed my hand, I've taken the micro scissor to my left hand to get that pole out. Now just to show you the closure, the using a jeweler's bipolar forceps, we'll approximate the pia and then coagulate with some irrigation and the pia ledges will stick. like so and we do it do that in two three more places till you finally get this result thank biopsy is ependymoma uh, grade 2 thank you here we can see the motor evoked potentials the first six rows are the upper limbs and the rest are the lower limbs uh, there is no significant change uh, compared to pre-op, intra-op or post-op in the upper limbs but in the lower limbs uh, there is some improvement post-operatively as shown by the arrow. Thank you. Next is a 47 year old male, Nuric grade 4, post-progressive spastic, spastic quadriparesis, MRI showing a large C67 disc prolapse behind the C6 body. Um, I couldn't get a OPLL drilling to show but the principles of uh, drilling in corpectomy are the same uh, so uh, I chose this video uh, initially the cervical discectomy is done above and uh, below the levels what you what is required so here it is C56 and C67 following the discectomy the anterior part of the body is removed with rongers which has already been done here and uh, once sufficient bone is removed then use a drill and drill the end plates and the adjacent vertebral body so 
the body's uh, the the corpectomy uh, bone still remains connected to the vertebral body on the sides, but the height uh, is reduced superiorly and inferiorly. So now we are doing it on the inferior side. The drilling is carried till we reach soft tissue, uh, which we can check with a number 4 or some other instrument and with experience uh, we know when we are reaching it with the drill also. If we still, if we feel further bone can be removed to reduce the thickness of the bone then that is done with the ronger at this stage. Following this again you can drill superiorly and inferiorly to reduce the height and once sufficient uh, drilling is done then next phase is to start drilling from the center of the corpectomy to the sides. So in that process you will be able to thin out the bone and uh, remove the OPLL or the PLL if required or float it off if required. This, this, uh, this manner of drilling where you drill superiorly inferiorly reduce the thickness and then start the drilling from the center to the sides prevents leaving a large island of thick bone which you later on struggle drilling with because when you try and drill that then it it will keep sinking down and you 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 simply cannot uh, thin it down and then you are left with the choice of having to hold it and disconnect and pull it out so doing that with a thin layer of opl or bone is safer than with a thick piece which you haven't drilled adequately thin so I have found this technique to be useful so that I am never in a situation where I have to, I am stuck with a thick piece of bone which is sinking when you are drilling. Then drill the adjacent posterior ends of the adjacent end plates to relieve compression and in this case you can see that the disc material has come up to almost 50% of the vertebral body height. Uh, you can see the hook which is bent due to years of use. Probably your hospitals may give you better hooks. Uh, then uh, this is removing the disc material. Now I am removing the uh, drilled down uh, end plate which is drilled thin and uh, you can see the dura through the cut PLL. I am not removing the PLL in this case. Normally I take it out for a OPLL or for a hard disk um, but I have cut the PLL down in the center here and the thecal sac has bulged out. The cage uh, is seen in this x-ray. The cage is filled with uh, bone graft and is surrounded also with the bone graft that is the local bone which has been taken during the corpectomy. It is not wasted. Uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Vernon. Thank you. Dr. Joseph, uh, nice demonstration of all the three surgeries. Any, any questions from the audience? If not, then uh, I would ask, I would like to ask something. Uh, Dr. Joseph, you always believe in dynamic retraction while uh, doing intramedullary tumors or you used to put pile sutures also? Yeah, no, I don't uh, use pile. You mean pile sutures for retraction, like the way you use dural sutures? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I haven't been using that. Because, you know, some, some people actually advocates that, that, Dynamic retraction is a bit more damaging 
in uh, cases where you are operating on you know large uh, extensive intermedullary tumors <coughs> they advocated but okay most you know many people still believe in dynamic restriction the way you are doing so it's good and <clears throat> any particular uh, you know uh, i mean i'm quite impressed the way you have you know uh, put both the pyre together and sealed it because <clears throat> there is a large series in which uh, it has been shown that post op dysthesia is a way common in the patients in which we are not closing the pyre so this pyre closing actually reduces the incidence of post operative dysthesia so this is absolutely very nice thing to put the pyre together and uh, you know uh, seal it together by means of uh, low intensity bipolar bipolar coagulation uh, and i used to actually because you would read about this and you know you try it it never comes then uh, later on only with that jewel of bipolar forceps and uh, carefully just uh, holding the pya only it it worked yeah yeah that that technique has been demonstrated and has been you know written written down also in literature and actually it is it is very good because some people used to put you know sutures together also previously but this you know putting both the pya together and sealing with uh, uh, low diathermy is very good and very effective technique so any any other questions from the audience dr vanan you would like to ask something a very good demonstration vivek congratulations and uh, see what we do is uh, many times the pile sutures which are taken they are uh, you know we get uh, you know they tear off because the pya is not very you, you got to put either 807080 proline yeah. which is if you are taking in the pya yeah. many times they cut through if you are retracting it continuously so if you want a, a continuous retraction what we are doing now is we are putting a piece of marrow cell we are cutting a small piece of marrow cell and uh, we are putting it in, on the both the ends of the uh, tumor once you open up do the myelotomy so at the lower end and the at the upper end you identify the ends first and then put this marrow cell which uh, i think we will show also in our spinal tumor video session that is number one and if you want to close the pya you can either seal it like this with a uh, bipolar it should be a very low bipolar uh, the bipolar setting should be very low if it is very high it will just burn off the pya and the second thing you can do is you can take a 90 uh, stitch also which we do uh, uh, routinely so both are possible and you do not need to take too many stitches because it will cut through if you take too many uh, stitches it will just cut through the pya is very very thin yeah and and the second message that you have given in you know the anterior cervical uh, corpectomy is actually actually is happening you know most of people have feel that thing that while uh, doing the corpectomy thing if they drill the you know islands first in the center first then a piece of bone usually remained on the both sides in the last and that actually floats that's a very good very very good uh, you know technique and very good message you have conveyed i am quite quite impressed thank you thank you so much thank you so can we move on to the next session uh, next next talk harish is dr harish there yes sir that so moving the... on to the next uh... A talk uh, it will be moderated by dr amit ghosh who is the doctor uh, he is a consultant neurosurgeon from institute of neurosciences kolkata he will be moderating the talk by dr sumit pawar over to you sir yeah thank you dr harish and i like to thank professor velo and dr shukesh also and dr mayuresh for arranging this wonderful academic session so i will straight away go to dr sumit pawar for his presentation he will present percutaneous stenoscopic lumbar decompression for l5 and s1 disc dr sumit power please thank you so much uh, dr amit for your kind invitation and your kind introduction i thank dr vanan velo dr harish naik dr rishikesh for inviting me for this uh, really amazing workshop and i hope to take you through the journey of endoscopic surgery uh through which we'll see uh, is my screen visible yes visible yeah thank you so through this journey we will see the how endoscopy has evolved what we can do and what is possible 
with uh, endoscopic uh, lumbar surgeries. At the outset, I would like to invite you all for NSSS Spine 2022. Dr. Vernon Mello is the president for this uh, beautiful meeting that we are planning for the September 2022. It will be held in Mumbai at JW Marriott Sahar, and I will be the secretary for the conference. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite you all for this August meeting. So endoscopy spine surgery is an offshoot of the minimal invasive uh, spine surgery. Endoscopes were limited for discectomies, but now with the advances in technology, the indication has widened to include lumbar stenosis also. This is a standard history uh, of evolution of endoscope. What we need to understand over here are the two ways in which we use the endoscope. If you have a separate trajectory for using the, if you see on the left side of the screen, if you have a separate trajectory for the endoscope and separate for the instruments, like you can see for the arthroscope, you have two or three port of entries through which you are using the endoscope and other entries for the drill and for the other instrumentation. Same you do for a pituitary surgery as well. You have a nice uh, endoscope on one side and you are using the other instrument curates and everything through another port of entry. These as against when you have an endoscope through which you have a working channel and it's a single port this is the difference between endoscopy assisted and a fully endoscopy system. Everything else is separate. Everything else, the medium being water, medium being air, everything. The definition depends on the trajectory. If it is separate trajectory, it is endoscopy assisted. It's same as fully endoscopic system. And this is the nice classification by Dr. Gan Choi about the generations of endoscope. We'll just take you through it very quickly to understand where we are and where we are uh, going. So there are many techniques described for the first generation, which was essentially a transforaminal approach, but the few zones were very difficult to approach because typically zone one and zone four, which was just behind the pedicle, the far downward and the far upward. And with these limitations of transforaminal, we decided to go to the second generation, which was a interlaminar endoscopic approach. But mind you, this is interlaminar endoscopy assisted approaches. The Sando endospine system was, is the foremost in this. It has, as you can see over here, a eight millimeter working channel, a suction cannula, a place for the Hopkins II endoscope, four millimeter, a nerve root retractor, and of course the eight millimeter working channel through which you can put all your standard instruments, your keresin punches, your drills, and everything else. So, even the intradural tumors, detethering, standard discectomy, fusion, everything can be done to the standard endoscopy system. This is a standard way that we approach in the interlaminar way, a standard setup. And here we can see a 16 year old girl with severe kyphoscolotic deformity with a tethered cord. We had to do the scolotic deformity correction, but the incident was going to be so big that we decided to do minimal invasive detethering of the cord. You can see the vision is not very clear. It is okay, acceptable. There is significant bleeding over there. The dura was opened about seven millimeters through which we have put this dissector to separate the cord equina from the phylum. We are not used to this kind of vision for the intradural approaches. So it takes some time to, of, for getting used to it. Once we have identified the phylum, we can identify with a very typical vein over it. We have to cross check in a minimal invasive technique, the phylum with a nerve probe, if any sphincter or any lower limb activity, muscle activity can be seen. Once we are sure that there is no nerve root stuck to the phylum, we can coagulate and we can cut it. This is a standard uh, bipolar forcep that I've borrowed from my ENT colleagues. Again, a scissor borrowed from the ENT colleagues, which can be used with a descendo system, followed by anastoclips, which can be used for dural closure. So this is a very small incision that we could give to the child who was going to have another huge incision for the kyphoscolotic deformity correction and gibbous correction. The child was able to be, we were able to mobilize her within three hours of surgery. And we can see the good decompression on the right-hand side on the post-op MRI. Easygo system is similar, tubular. It is, I think, the workhorse of for spine, minimal invasive spine surgeons. 
the tubular endoscopy system. You can, of course, you have, this is basically a micro endoscopic discectomy. You can use a microscope, you can use an endoscope doing discectomy or decompression using tubular retractors. The size varies as per the company. It does not really matter what size you're using. You can do decompression, discectomies, fusion, and almost every single thing that you need to do as a spine surgeon, you can do with this excellent technique. This is basically the workhorse for any spine surgeon and very standard, very small incision we can achieve with that. The third generation came with the fully endoscopic interlaminar approach. And this was heralded that we could do stenosis correction, which is very common in our part of the country, and not only discectomies. If you can see on the image on the right, on the left hand side, we can see there is compression due to the ligament, facet hypertrophy, disc, and everything. If you only remove the disc with the transformal technique, it does not really achieve the purpose and give a good decompression for the patient. As against with the interlaminate technique, you can achieve ipsilateral, contralateral decompression, ligamental removal, facet extension can be done, and you can achieve the complete gamut. This is a standard fully endoscopic system. This is a standard set that we use. Uh, I'll be touching upon the endoscope because not most of most are not aware of the entire set. That's it. This is the entire set that you require for a fully endoscopic interlaminar system. You have a Tom endostick 5.5 millimeter working channel endoscope. You have a dilator, which is 7.9 millimeter. You have a outer sheath working sleeve through which you put the endoscope to hold endoscope. And you have standard kerosene punches, which are thin, long shafted, but the size that we normally use two, three and four millimeter. You have a dissector which acts like a pen field dissector, which is something we are very used to, a tactile hook to tease the uh, disc and to remove it, and a standard grasping forcep. The instrument size are bigger than the transforaminal. So the chance of breakage, wear and tear, leaving the instrument piece behind, and this kind of things happen much, much less with the interlaminal system as compared to a transforaminal system. This is an 11 centimeter working length. You have over here, as you can see on the image, the bigger one is the working channel, which is 5.5 millimeter. You have an irrigation and suction port, and you have the gold, what you can see the gold shoulder thing. That is your endoscope and the sides, like the horn, that is the light source from which the light will shine. A standard setup, you have to use the arthroscopy drapes because there's going to be a lot of water oozing out uh, from the irrigation. And that's it. Under CM guidance, you have put your marked your level, you can see that I have put a dilator, I have put a working sheet over it, and I am ready to start the surgery. There is no dissection, there is no pottery on table, there is no bipolar on table. The endoscope once assembled will look like this. You check it and then you can just standard directly insert it. You confirm the dilator position on CM to see that you are in the interlaminar window and you can enter inside. One game changer of interlaminar surgery or fully endoscopic surgery is the radio frequency coagulation. You can see over here, there is an outer shaft through which a curved tip is coming out and the tip is coagulating the tissue. This is a 4.1 megahertz radio frequency generator through which there is no or minimal heat production and you can coagulate the tissue very nicely without fear of damaging the neural structures around it. We are extremely used to the vision that this is providing because it is an interlaminar window, but still not used to the colors because we are used to some different kind of uh, colors that we are used to. Second thing, we are used to working in the microscope with our eyes close to the eyepiece. It's a 3D vision. Endoscope gives you a 2D vision. We are looking at a screen in front of you, however high definition, it makes a big difference to get used to it. I'm putting my kerosene punches and removing the upper lamina, the lower edge. This is a slightly video that I have made in 2X. We enter the ligamental, we have made a small ligamental opening over there to give access to the
you can see over here i'm removing the ligament the bone you can see has been sharply cut by the cut of the bone you can see the shape now you can start seeing the dura the nerve root has been identified the same radiofield frequency uh, probe is can also be used as a dissector to tease away the nerve root to create space so the same thing is used as a dissector as well as for coagulation. You're removing the ligament on the sides. And this is a case in which this was a four or five level. And you are doing a fantastic decompression. Patient is under local anesthesia, under conscious sedation. This is an absolute game changer for people who are very aged, for patients who are medically not fit for undergoing a GA. And I think the cost of hospitalization drops significantly when you make this surgery a daycare surgery. Once you have your set, there is no extra additional expense for the surgery. The set is one time investment and then you don't have to like, there's no nothing special that you need to use. This is exactly the approach that we're looking at in a standard endoscopic interlaminar system. The image is over showing the retraction that we do to the dural tube, but it's just for representation purpose. Another, another video in which we can see the use of fully endoscopic system under local anesthesia. This guy is a 35 year old guy with a right sided L5 S1 disc. The bony opening at L5 S1 is automatically there. You have a huge interlaminar window. There is literally no bony work that needs to be done for L5 S1. Interlaminar system is ideal for L5 S1. If you have a drill, you can go to higher levels as well. Of course, you cannot dare to have this kind of a retraction for the higher uh, where your L1, L2 and L3, L4, but lower levels, it's quite easily possible. You can see I'm at the annulus and with a very small annular opening, I'm removing exactly the excised fragment. The radio frequency is used to do annuloplasty at the same time as well. And once I turn the outer working cannula, you can see that the nerve root has fallen black in place. There is no bleeding. The vision is excellent. This is a very, very small opening. This is eight millimeter outer channel. And you can see that much is the, that's the only opening that we have done for the ligament as well as the bony opening. As you remove the sheath, you can see the muscle has not been touched by any coagulation or nothing has been used over there because we just put the director inside and put the working sheath over it. And that's it. You have removed a disc fragment and you have achieved a decompression. This is a standard surgery, a standard surgical setup that we use. The patient in the evening with his clothes changed ready for discharge. All the images have been taken with permission. This is the size of the incision, as you can see. The incision typically is taken along the Langer's lines to have a better healing. So these are the standard advantages of the surgery. The game changer over here, I believe, is the radio frequency coagulation, which allows you to shrink the tissue without too high a temperature being achieved, which makes it literally you can use it on the dura, you can use it on the nerve root without any damage to them. Of course, the current has to be lower than normal, but you actually can use it on the neural tissue as well. And of course it uses, it works as a dissector as well. So with the irrigation, radio frequency coagulation, constant sedation, endoscopy with using the fully endoscopic system with interlaminar technique becomes a much, much easier rule. Typically, this is the rule that we follow that you have a natural opening at L5, S1, L4, L5, so the interlaminar technique becomes much easier on this region, whereas at the higher levels, the foramen is bigger than the interlaminar window and where your endo uh, transforamen technique might be a better option. It all depends on the patient's pathology and not on the what you have, but what patient has that determines the uh, uh, choice of surgery. Again, that being said, the tubular system remains the workhorse for almost all minimal invasive surgeons. Many Korean Japanese surgeons are using this interlaminar and transformant technique for doing every single thing, which I think will come with the experience. With that being said, uh, it has a big role to play in the new era of quick discharge and reduced hospital stay. 
learning curve is not as steep as transferaminal as the approach and angle are similar to traditional tubular or open microscopic techniques. I once again invite you all for NSS Spine 2022, where Dr. Vernon Velo will be presiding. Anyway, invite. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sumit. What a nice presentation, very nice proce procedure for daycare and under conscious sedation. Uh, any question from the audience? If there is no question, then we can go to next session. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. And now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hari Shoza, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at Dr. Chang Super Specialty Hospital in Siliguri, West Bengal, uh, to introduce the next speaker. Over to you, Dr. Harish. Seeing. Seeing Dr. Harish Oza is not around, so I would like to request uh, Vernon, sir, to introduce the next speaker. So you are mute, sir. Our next speaker is our very own co-host, Dr. Harish Knight, who is the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at our department. And uh, he's going to talk to us about CV junction anomalies, the different anomalies and how we manage them. Over to you, Harish. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. So now this is a, a attempt of ours to show how we manage the CV junction anomalies at our institute, ranging from various posterior stabilization techniques to anterior stabilization, anterior fixation versus posterior fixation, wherein we, you know, uh, we take these cases on patient to patient basis and choose an optimal approach to manage these uh, anomalies. These are basically very technical challenging lesions because of various bony anomalies, vertebral artery courses, and uh, wherein sometimes instrumentation can be difficult, wherein uh, uh, some cases there will be vertebral artery injuries, or we can uh, even expect a patient deteriorating in the post-operative period and how we manage. So I will be showing you the uh, various videos wherein the uh, patients are falling into three different types of categories ranging from simple cases to difficult cases to complicated cases. Of course, 3D printed bone models have been of various of uh, invaluable help in providing the in-depth knowledge of complex bony uh, abnormalities and various vertebral artery courses. So the surgical methods for managing the such uh, anomalies of CV junction ranges from posterior stabilization, anterior stabilization, or then uh, in cases wherein anterior transoral decompression is the suited, it can also be done. And of course, off late anterior versus posterior fixation is of, of beneficial help. So these are the various diagrams wherein it is just a, uh, over showing the various techniques. So how to reduce the chances of complication? Of course, a detailed study has to be done in cases of uh, complex CV junction cases with CD angiography, wherein it shows as the complex uh, vertebral artery course. And you have to have always a proper choice of instrumentations, ranging from screws, plates, uh, rods or spacers, or sometimes you have to have tight, uh, hard shield plates or titanium wires. And a 3D bone model simulation is of great help if it is available. And we always use operating microscope during C1C to join exposure, almost starting from the skin incision. And neuromonitoring if available is of a tremendous help. And one should always be having a, a plan B rescue technique, wherein if you in, uh, encounter any difficulty during surgery, like vertebral artery injury, or if there is a in pedicle insufficiency, we'll have to have an idea of a rescue technique. So thorough study of the detailed bony anatomy in the preoperative period with bone models, or if there is a, a proper study of the CT, uh, of the CV junction, as uh, told by Dr. Sushil Patkar, we have to study the CT, uh, CV junction very carefully and know the uh, complex bony uh, anomalies in case to case basis. 
So this patient, this bone model helped us to know that patient had an aberrant vertebral artery course. So we have to have, we have to be very careful in uh, you know, getting this, uh, tre treating this case. So this is just a video showing how we do this uh, simulation on bone models in the pre-operative period. On that day, we take this bone model and in the surgeon's room, we uh, all together sit as a team and then we see what has to be the trajectory of the course. Uh, trajectory of the screws and is the screw instrumentation will it suffice or we have to have a backup plan for such cases and we we get a you know the surgeon operating surgeon has get this additional confidence in the intraoperative period wherein he can deal with any complication as such if arises so this is of great help which has been added to our armamentarium of late so five minutes remaining so this technical aspects uh, coming on to uh, technical aspects in safe exposure of C1-C2 joint. So now I'll be showing you how a C1-C2 exposure joint has to be done. And just a, this is just a, a learning uh, video for uh, residents who have logged in so that they will get to know what has to be done and how the cases have to be managed. So this is exposing the C1-C2 joint and you have to have a exposure with uh, my, under microscope. So this midline and when you're going laterally, this a vascular white fibrous plane has to be traced upon. So this is the dissection in this A vascular fibrous plane and dissecting that you reach the C2 pass. So that is the C2 pass. So that is the C2 subperiosteal sub -periosteal dissection being done to medialize the uh, venous plexus. So that is the dissection over the C2 pass in such in the in by doing a subperiosteal dissection as uh, Dr. Jayesh also said that we I'll, I'll encounter less amount of venous plexus bleed. So when the uh, dissection is done along the C2 pass, never go medial to the C2 pass. Otherwise you'll land up into the vertebral venous plexus and tracing the C2 pass, you will find that the, you will land up in the C2, uh, C1, C2 joint. So this is the fibrous capsule. They're covering the C1, uh, C2 joint on the left side. So that is the fibrous capsule there. So with a gentle retraction by Adson retractor, you can have this uh, C1-C2 joint. So that is, uh, you know, you, this is the C1-C2 joint being shown here now. So once this joint exposure is done, then we get a, a good amount of the exposure of the C1 uh, isthma. So this is the joint capsule that is shown there. So that is the distraction being applied so that the you know, joint space can be visualized. So then we localize the isthmus of the C1 lateral mass. So that well, once the isthmus is localized, then we uh, go on to have this uh, instrumentation in the C1 lateral mass. So this is how to place the screw placement in the C1 lateral mass. So once the C1 C2 joint is exposed, we put a G graph uh, by, uh, before putting the G graph, we roughen the C1 C2 joint complex by a drill bit 3 mm wherein it removes the fibrous capsule to have a bet better orthodosis. This is under fluoroscopic guidance, inserting a 3 mm drill bit with 10 to 15 degrees medial angulation under fluoroscopy. The uh, direction always towards, it should be towards the anterior tubercle of C1. So once the drill bit is placed, after the drilling, we check for the uh, bony continuity with the probe and then with the screw of adequate, adequate length ranging from 18 to 22 mm can be inserted. And this should be done under the C fluoroscopy guidance. So after this, we move on to the placement of the uh, C2 pedicle screw. So this is the junction of entry point of C2 pedicle screw, which is more laterally if you are placing a C2 pedicle screw. And if you are placing a C2 pass screw, it, should be, it will be a bit medially. And it is placed with a 10 to 15, 15 to 25 degrees of medial angulation. So uh, this is the placement of the right-sided C2 pedicle screw there. So you will encounter some amount of bleeding, but uh, it, it will stop on once the screws are placed. So this is the right-sided C2 pedicle screw. 20 degree up angle and 15, 15 degree medially directed. So this, uh, you can see that the vertebral artery is just placed here beneath the C1 lateral mass screw. So this is the C2 pedicle screw being placed and you have to have a stop uh, 
um, uh, uh, technique of uh, taking this 3 mm drill bit you should not be having a control uh, continuous drilling it should be a stop gap technique so once this is drilled and the bone continuity is confirmed we move on to the placement of the c2 pedicle screw so these are the techniques uh, of c1 c2 uh, instrumentation now this are the high end uh, machines that we have in our ot ranging from leica oh5 microscope to a high end allenger cr and even a drill bit uh, machine a drilling machine these are the various instruments and one has to have on his table uh, operating table a good set of vascular instruments too because in cases you will have to uh, you'll be encountering uh, any vertebral artery injuries you should one should be ready to have a repair so these are the drill bits that we commonly use angle drill bits of uh, uh, 3 mm size so so this is just a video showing the drill bit now coming on to the pre operative intubation how one we do our intubation always invariably uh, in our hospital it has become a nominal rule that we always do a awake intubation using a video laryngoscope this has helped us in preventing various uh, complications because initially when this was not available we have seen that patients ended uh, having a respiratory arrest wherein they have to be tracheostomized on table so this awake intubation using uh, c cmac has helped us to prevent this complication so and once the patient is intubated we place, place the patient in prone position this is how we place uh, this is the traction being applied with the gardner well tongue skull traction uh, patient then is placed in the prone position in a neutral and the arms are tucked by and we have a good uh, uh, cm uh, shoot where in uh, uh, pre traction we take a shoot and then post traction we take a shoot the weight depends upon the patient body weight and it is usually calculated at the 1/6 of the body weight neck is kept neutral and head is placed in a military tuck position and this is how the cm is placed these are the various surgical uh, procedures wherein uh, we are not stuck up on one, uh, one uh, technique but on patient to patient basis we do this if uh, patient has this in, uh, insufficient in, uh, bone uh, Uh, structure then we do a wiring or sometimes if patient has rheumatoid arthritis wherein the bony purchase will not be sufficient we do a interlaminar hook technique or a hard shield plate wiring technique or uh, more commonly we have been doing c1 lateral mass and c2 pedicle screws technique so this uh, now we're coming on to some of the videos wherein this was a patient with history of neck pain with quadriparesis and he had a, a ad with uh, adi of 9 mm and uh, oclonto occipital assimilation here you can see the severe uh, jun- uh, compression at the uh, cranio vertebral junction and even ct angiograph showed that he had a hypoplastic right vertebral artery this was a patient who had weakness more on the right side and a neck tilt on the left side so this we uh, patient underwent this ct angiography to know the hypoplastic vertebral artery and the uh, bone model showed the uh, 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 associated bony anomaly so now we we usually do this dissection under uh, cm guidance so this the midline dissection uh, and then we denude the c1 uh, arch then the c2 spinous process we one has to stay in the midline so this if you stay in the midline there is no uh, question of bleeding here the c2 spinous process and the c3 lamina is being uh, dissected then we move on to the c1 c2 joint exposure so this is the c2 pass on the right side so here once the ganglion is you can see that sometimes you know difficult to expose this c1 c2 joint without sacrificing the c2 ganglion so this ganglion once it is cut we get a lot ample amount of space so to uh, reach the c1 c2 joint and this is on the left left side so once this is done our job is very much easier we once uh, this uh, we get a ample amount of space and the c1 c2 joint complex is shown here you can see in the back of the uh, operative photo video the c1 c2 this is the isthmus of c1 lateral mass so it is a, almost a square shape at the center of the isthmus will be the entry point so you can see the mobile c1 c2 joint there it is the drilling of the c1 c2 roughening up the joint complex 
to have a better orthodosis and then we place the g graph so this is a straightforward uh, case wherein i am showing how we usually do this uh, posterior c1 c2 fixation the g graph is placed inside it is uh, then impacted so as i showed you earlier how how we how the c1 lateral mass screws are placed so this is the placement of the c1 lateral mass this is on the right side under fluoroscopic guidance you can see in the inset and uh, the direction should be toward 10 to 15 degrees medial upwards and towards the anterior tubercle so one has to irrigate uh, profound during uh, drilling so as to lessen the chances of heating and then the screws are placed after checking the bone continuity on all sides so if there is a breach then you have to have a secondary rescue technique so this is the placement of uh, the c1 lateral mass on the left side there so in cases if there is atlant uh, occipital assimilation you can see that uh, the occipital bone has to be drilled in a little bit so as to accommodate the uh, screw head of the uh, c1 uh, lateral mass and these screws are specially made wherein they have extra added uh, length of uh, uh, the uh, screw wherein the screw head will be placed up above the uh, c1 c2 joint so this is placement of the c1 lateral mass on the le left side now we move on to the c1 uh, c2 pedicle screws so this is on the right side the length of the screw is measured and the, the drilling has to be ha under uh, stop it has to be not a continuous drilling it has to be stop and gap then we assess there will be amount of a little bit amount of bleeding in a few cases but once it uh, the screws, screws are placed the bleeding stops on its own so it's on both sides the c2 pedicle screws are placed there and patient on the same day of the surgery this was the uh, additional foramen decompression done sufficient uh, decompression has to be done almost 270 degree uh, so that the uh, cervical medullary junction is freed up on and patient is relieved of his uh, weakness so this was the post op scan showing good uh, placement of the c1 lateral mass and the c2 pedicle screws and the uh, ead was reduced and even the basilar invasion was corrected we thought that patient might be having a uh, injury the vertebral artery on the placement of the c2 pedicle screws in such cases in, if there is any doubt do a dsa if uh, this patient luckily had no injury and patient did very well his weakness also improved immediately after the surgery you can see the amount of uh, a patient mobilization there he is very uh, ha happy and moving around in the ward this was again a patient wherein uh, i will show you the the dissection technique is fairly uh, same in all almost all the c1 c2 fixation cases this is the sectioning of the c2 ganglion there and the drilling of the c1 c2 joint complex and the placement of the screw so uh, to uh, correct this atlanta axial dislocation we we employ this distraction technique wherein the uh, joint is distracted to correct the uh, dislocation and also the amount of basilar invagination if the patient is having this is patient in the post operative period the ct scan showing good reduction of the bi this was a patient who had mal aligned odontoid fracture with c1 c2 anterior dislocation with subluxation so this patient underwent a combined approach of an anterior and a posterior approach so patient first was placed in the supine position we took an anterior cervical approach because there was a the fracture segment had uh, tilt anteriorly so we had to fix that uh, fractured mal uh, aligned odontoid fracture segment so this is the dissection so even the anterior cervical approach the dissection is started under direct uh, microscopic visualization so as to prevent any injury to the hypoglossal nerve here 
so this is the dynamic retraction that we generally take help of there is no continuous retraction these are the dynamic right angle retractor wherein two uh, assistants will be retracting the uh, cervical musculature and the trachea and the esophagus and the carotid on the lateral side so this is dissecting from c uh, c2 to c4 uh, exposure and with the cautery this is the number 4 penfield dissector wherein you can see that this is insulated with silicon uh, lining uh, so as to prevent injury to the uh, surrounding musculature so this the fracture segment being shown here it is very highly mobile so we have to stabilize this anterior fracture so just a posterior stabilization would have been insufficient for this uh, child so this is uh, leveling up the c1 c2 joint uh, leveling up the fracture segment to place the uh, plate so once the fractured segment is leveled and then the fractured segment is drilled so as to fill up that gap with that gap was uh, the cortical breach was very irregular so it was uh, evened upon with a drill and then the g graft was placed upon which the uh, plate was placed with a and then then fixed with screws so after this anterior cervical approach then the patient was turned in the prone position and then the dissection was carried as uh, uh, to similar to other c1 c2 fixation then uh, a good c1 c2 fixation was achieved so this is the c1 c2 joint complex there so you can see that yeah, every minute detail under microscope can be of very uh, very much help and minimize minimize the chances of complications with a dissector the joint capsule is the joint is distracted and then the graft is placed with the subse subsequent placement of c1 lateral mass and the c2 pedicle screws so this is the end picture showing you the result the patient child was very uh, relieved of uh, her symptoms patient did very well in the post op period this child sent us video from uh, his home and this was a course of left aberrant vertebral artery now i'll be showing you few videos wherein how we manage a cases cases wherein there is aberrant vertebral artery course so this the dissection is fairly similar so once the vertebral artery is uh, localized this patient had this uh, left side of aberrant vertebral artery course so after the screws were placed the vertebral artery was seeming like it was being uh, jammed upon between the uh, c1 and c2 screws so so here you can see that the vertebral artery is being jammed between the c1 c2 but after distraction it was relieved and there was we could tackle this complication so patient in the post operative period there this patient had this uh, another uh, aberrant vertebral artery wherein i'll be showing how to mobilize the vertebral artery in this case so uh, at times you can so one can confuse with the c1 uh, c2 joint ganglion with the vertebral artery but with careful microscopic visualization here you can see that the vertebral artery being separated the earlier part cut was the c2 ganglion so one can even confirm with the icg dye study wherein uh, if the vertebral artery is anomalous you can confirm the uh, path of the vertebral artery and then isolate with the silicon patty so this is the silicon patty which is of great help which gives us a traction on and pulls up the vertebral artery away from the c1 c2 joint complex and then the dissection can be carried forward as uh, shown here so the next few steps become subsequently very easy and placement of the c1 lateral mass here you can see drilling is very easy so art of art, vertebral artery detection and mobilization has to be mastered upon in cases of complex cv junction anomalies because Uh, if cv uh, anomalous artery one can one encounter such patients then detailed preoperative ct angiography 
and intraoperative detailed separation of the vertebral artery has to be uh, dealt upon. So once this is done, the further subsequent placement of the screws is very easier. Five minutes remaining. And then we can see that the subsequent steps are very easier. So this is a patient again, of course, uh, of aberrant vertebral artery, wherein we are mobilizing uh, this vertebral artery with a, a small infant feeding tube. So to just to lateralize and pull out this uh, vertebral artery from the C1 C2 joint complex, where as so as it gives us a uh, ample amount of space to deal with the uh, drilling of the C1 C2 joint there. So these are the various techniques how we mobilize the vertebral artery and the distraction on the side of the uh, torticollis, so as to correction of the torticollis. So this patient had uh, interoperative vertebral artery injury while placement of the C2 pedicle screws. So we just went on ahead with the surgery. We placed the C2 pedicle screws. Then uh, the amount of bleeding which we encountered thought that the patient had vertebral artery injury. Uh, subsequently, th so this is the placement of the screw there in the C2 pedicle. So after this, there was profuse bleeding, which seemed like a possible vertebral artery injury during the drilling. So one has to not be uh, afraid of such complications. It, it, uh, we have so much facilities with us so that we can deal each and every complication as such here. So this is the bleeding that we saw. The screw placement was done subsequently. We, uh, and then the patient was shifted immediately to the uh, DSA theater, wherein we saw that immediate post-operative DSA showed that there was no vertebral artery injury. Immediate post-operative was a significant reduction of the uh, bacillar in invagination. Normal post-operative in the immediate DSA, uh, in the immediate, immediate post-operative period, but at after six days, uh, check DSA showed a vertebral artery aneurysm, pseudo aneurysm, which was managed with a coil and glue technique. And the patient did very well in the post-operative period. So even though there is a, what one has to be suspicious of a complication, one might arise, this is a case of a traumatic AD with odontoid fracture. These, uh, the, I am the, showing the instruments wherein we use for an anterior uh, transoral odontoidectomy. This is the spedzler Sontag self-retaining si retractor system there. So this is the anterior transoral approach. The pharyngeal fascia is dissected in the midline. And then it is localized under CM guidance. The odont odontoid uh, process is drilled. And the fecal sac is decompressed from the anterior anteriorly. The hemostasis with a, fib uh, with a flow seal there. And the uh, pharyngeal fascia is closed with observable suture. And then the patient underwent posterior C1, C2 sublaminar wiring. We thought that C1, C1 sublaminar wiring would suffice as we had done a good job anteriorly. So this was the place, uh, a sublaminar wiring of uh, C1 and C2 lamina. And then interposed with a uh, bone graft, with a G graft here. But to our surprise, patient had a uh, weakness uh, which worsened in the post-operative period and then we immediately shifted him for a post-operative MRI. It showed that the CV junction was compressed very uh, severely. So immediately we had to shift the patient to the uh, OT theater and then we removed the wire, wires and then we just went on to do our, uh, the C1C2 fixation with a good uh, forum and magnum decompression.
so patient luckily escaped any harm and he came to us in the follow up period walking so that gave us a tremendous satisfaction that we could tackle uh, such case this was a patient with uh, distraction injury so here the dissection is same only thing what we saw that the amount of dissection which was placed in this patient was uh, retrospectively was we thought that this was uh, too much of a distraction because patient worsened in the post operative period the patient weakness uh, the instrumentation was screws were placed very well but the weakness worsened in on the post op day two patient had no power she was quadriplegic but gradually uh, with good icu care and good physiotherapy she could move her limbs so such complications do arise but one has to be very vigilant and explain the comp expected complication to the relatives this is a patient who had whatever artery injury so of course uh, uh, having a vascular uh, set on the ot table was of help in this patient because while dissection we had this in, uh, encountered this whatever artery injury so this was sectioning of the ct ganglion but after sectioning this we uh, found that the vertebral artery got uh, inward attentively and injured then luckily we could deal this complication we ha had a good anastomosis so vascular set was taken and then the both the stumps of vertebral artery were within reach and we could primarily uh, anastomosize anastomosize this vertebral artery the stump being the stump made regular and even so these are the two stumps of the vertebral artery which was injured placement of the temporary clip to occlude the flow and then the anastomosis was carried interrupted suture taken and the flow was confirmed with a dye study there patient had good flow and then the subsequent steps, steps were same so so this was to highlight the importance of having everything on the ot table so this was again a patient with a uh, down syndrome who had atlanta axial dislocation wherein uh, c2 pedicle insufficiency was uh, seen so we could not go ahead with the uh, uh, c2 pedicle screws instrumentation so, so then we had to place the c2 translaminar screw so the pedicle which was drilled was not getting a good purchase so then we had to have this Uh, rescue technique so this was the trans laminar uh, screw which was placed so the scans they showed that post operative there was complete c1 c2 reduction so these are the various cases this is uh, placement of transarticular screw here case of traumatic ad this was irreducible ad with the hard shield plate with the forum and magnum decompression this was occipital c2 c3 fixation and c2 c3 uh, lateral mass fixation so thus to conclude a thorough knowledge of the anatomy and pathology in uh, complex cv junction anomalies plays a very pivotal role in management of these anomalies and advanced imaging techniques should be taken of help and use of operating microscope while dissecting the c1 c2 joint complex and fluoroscopy while placement of the screws is very helpful and the 3d imaging has all uh, has paved the way and made our job very easy and of course to sum up one procedure cannot fit all patient the procedure has to be tailored as per patient's requirement as and when It, the surgery surgical procedure procedure has to be uh, tailored upon thank you thank you varish for a very 
elaborate the presentation. Any questions from anybody? Any questions or comments? So if there are no questions or comments, yes. we can move to the next. So Harish, take over. Yes, sir. So moving on to the next talk, which will be moderated by Dr. Sai Sudarshan. He is a neurosurgeon, uh, Pulse Hospital, Ranchi. Uh, over to Dr. Sai Sudarshan, please. <coughs> Hello, am I audible? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, yes, audible. Okay. My screen, where is it? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Nimesh Jain, who is going to present a slightly exotic approaches uh, to the thoracic spine, trans axillary approach and uh, the traditional trans thoracic approach for various uh, conditions like tuberculosis, trauma, congenital deformities and tumors. Uh, Dr. Nimesh is assistant professor at Grand Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. Uh, over to you, Dr. Jain. Hello. Hello. Uh, very good evening, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over to you. Take over. Yes, all, all the floor is yours. A very good evening uh, to one and all. Uh, so my name is Dr. Nimesh Anil Jain, and today I'm here to talk about uh, transaxillary and transthoracic approaches for dorsal spine uh, surgery. I work in Department of Neurosurgery, so JJ Group of Hospitals. This is the place uh, where I work. A basic tenet of any surgery is a fine knowledge of anatomy. Lesions involving uh, upper dorsal spine are difficult to approach due to the bony cage and the large vessels. Transclavicular approach carries significant morbidity. Transaxillary route is a relatively safe route. Uh, these are the various approaches uh, for uh, a dorsal spine surgery, with, depending upon the compression, which is anterior or posterior, uh, anterior cervical, transclavicular, transaxillary, or a posterior lateral thoracotomy may be used. If the compression is posterior, then the uh, standard posterior approach may be used. These are the various uh, advantages of uh, anterior approaches. It offers excellent uh, visualization, adequate cord decompression, drainage of free and paravertebral abscesses, a higher chance of anterior column distraction, significant correction of hypotic deformity. However, these are the disadvantages. Uh, there is a difference in the anatomy on the right and the left side. Uh, coming on to the specific things uh, which are required for uh, a transthoracic uh, surgery, it requires a single lung uh, anesthesia, single lung ventilation, which is done using a Robert Shaw tube. A lateral uh, decubitus position is uh, given where the torso is elevated to 60 degrees, arms abducted, flexed at the elbow and secured to an uh, armrest using an L-bar. Uh, this is a standard uh, curvilinear incision at the base of the hairline. The length of the incision is usually around 5 to 7 centimeters. This is the basic steps uh, of any uh, surgery where the uh, muscles are cut. The basic difference between a standard posterior approach and uh, the trans uh, thoracic and trans approaches here the exposure depends upon the uh, rib and rather than the vertebral body, which we see on a standard routine C arm. Hence, the uh, rib is exposed. The latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis muscle are retracted, dissected of the rib, and rib is excised to enter the thoracic cavity. The uh, mediastinal pleura is opened. The granulation tissue pathology is excised. Standard corpectomy is done anterolaterally, and then fusion is done using bony cage. Incision is fused in layers, and ICD has to be kept for 42 hours. I would like to focus on a few cases. This was. Um, the uh, first case where uh, combined supraclavicular plus transthoracic approach uh, was used for a patient who had a C7, uh, D1, and C, uh, D8, D9 pot spine. He was a 30 year old female who presented the weakness in lower limbs, hours grade one in lower limbs. This is the operative video. First, uh, uh, a cervical uh, decompression was done, the drainage of the cervical abscess was done by supraclavicular approach. Range of the anterior epidural abscess, removal of the granulation tissue, the vertebral body is identified. A standard copectomy is done. The granulation tissue is removed slowly 
so as to attain dural decompression and then fusion is attained using expandable cage and screws then the patient was uh, uh, changed the position was uh, then made to left lateral so as to do a left sided exposure a left side uh, thoracotomy was done the disc space on either side was removed again the granulation tissue was removed and a standard corpectomy was done the corpectomy is then using a high speed diamond drill with continuous irrigation so as to avoid heat damage to the underlying dura the bone is removed and there is the dural 180 degree dural decompression is attained by this procedure the entire granulation tissue which is compressing the cord anteriorly is removed and plates are prepared the lung this is the retracted lung and the fusion is attained using an expandable cage and this is a uh, customized screw which is uh, uh, designed by our department pedicle screws are put on either side and fusion is attained this is the post op uh, ct scan and the post op uh, scan which is showing a significant correction of the cobb's angle now this is a, a transaxillary approach this is a 35 year old uh, female who had presented weakness in bilateral lower limbs power was grade 3 in bilateral lower limbs and the deep tendon reflexes were brisk uh, there was a, a wedge compression of the anterior uh, plus an anterior epidural abscess at uh, d2 d3 level hence a uh, standard transaxillary approach was used from the right side the skin subcutaneous tissue is incised camper scarpus fascia latissimus dorsi is incised this is the abscess cavity which is reached the abscess is drained mediastinal pleura is opened this is the entire spinal column which can be seen this is the involved vertebrae with the granulation tissue which is excised the involved disc which is removed discectomy uh, discectomy is done with curettes gradually as you can see we can see on the other side also implying that uh, more than 180 degree decompression has been done end plate preparation on either side is done and then fusion is attained using expandable cages hemostasis is of utmost importance here hence flowable gelatin matrix is of tremendous use at this place this is the expandable cage which was designed by our department cage is expanded and screw are put on either side in at each vertebral level and secured with rod this is the post op scan and the post op patient video which showed a significant uh, improvement there was a significant correction of uh, cobb's angle post operatively 
This is the next case, which was a 25 year old male who had presented post traumatic sudden onset weakness in lower limb following history of fall from height. He had paraplegia and had power grade zero in the lower limb. On uh, the imaging, he had a, a collapse of the D4 uh, vertebral body with cord compression, which was predominantly anterior. Hence, a trans axillary approach was used in this patient more from the left side. Again, now the centering on the rib, the rib was exposed. Simpson's fascia is incised, pleural cavity is entered. One lung anesthesia is of utmost importance out here to avoid lung injury. The mediastinal pleura is opened. The vertebral body is defined on either side. This is the fractured segment. This is the involved disc. Discectomy is done. A uh, corpectomy is performed using high speed drill. This is the dural decompression, which is done. As you can see, continuous high flow irrigation is of utmost importance at this place, so as to avoid heat injury to the dura. End plate preparation is done on either side. This is the fusion which is attained using an expandable cage and a screw and rod assembly. This is the retracted lung. The rod is fixed using innies. This is the final tightening which is done. And once the procedure is done, it is of utmost importance to see for complete expansion of the lung. This is the post-op patient video and uh, post-operative scan showing significant correction of the Cobb's angle. This is the next case, which was a 25-year-old six-month ANC patient who had presented progressive weakness in bilateral lower limb. Power was grade one in lower limb and the deep tendon reflexes were brisk. She had a D4, D4 level cord compression, which was more anteriorly. As you can see, after this is the view after uh, opening the pleural cavity. This is the involved segment. This is the collapsed vertebral body with the involved disc. Discectomy is done. Dural decompression is attained. End plates are prepared on either side. and fusion is attained. Now, once the retractor is removed, it is of utmost important to see for complete expansion of the lung. This is the post operative scan showing significant improvement in Cobb's angle. This is the next uh, patient, which uh, was a 35 year old male who had presented with progressive weakness in lower limbs, power was grade one in lower limb, and the MRI showed a, a cord compression at uh, D3 vertebral body level. This is the view after uh, performing a thoracotomy. A uh, mediastinal pleura is opened. Again, as you can see, there is significant granulation tissue with cord compression at the involved level, and the lung is retracted using silicon patty. This is the involved collapsed vertebrae. All the entire granulation tissue is removed. The 
corpectomy is performed with high speed diamond drill with continuous irrigation the discectomy is performed entered preparation is being performed now this was a bullet cage which was used in this case and was fixed in place using plate and screw this is the post operative scan showing significant improvement these are some other pre op post op scans this was a 15 year old male who had pre uh, presented with progressive weakness in bilateral lower limb power was grade 1 in lower limb on the mri there was a anterior compression at d7 vertebral body level with an anterior epidural abscess and hence a posterior lateral thoracotomy was performed going from the left side mediastinal pleura is opened vertebral body is defined granulation tissue is identified granulation tissue is removed is deepened this is the hitch stitch which is taken over the mediastinal pleura so as to attain retraction of the great vessel that is the aorta the vertebral body is defined on either side of the involved level now a corpectomy is performed using a high speed diamond drill a discectomy which is performed as you can see continuous irrigation is being done here and the lung is retracted on one side the granulation tissue is removed which is there over the dura so as to attain dural decompression end plate preparation is done continuous irrigation and hemostasis of utmost importance out here now this is drilling for decompression on the other side so as to see more than 180 degrees as you can see that is the other side that we can see so by this approach we can attain at least 180 degree dural decompression that is complete anterior decompression this is the expandable cage that is put a flowable gelatin matrix which is used to attain hemostasis screws are put on either side and fusion is attained using rod and screw assembly this is the complete dura which is com completely elevated and separate from the cage assembly as you can see this is the lungs which are expanded as soon as the retraction is removed this is the post operative scan showing significant uh, correction of the cobs angle this was a 15 year old female represented with the uh, progressive back pain and weakness in bilateral lower limb power was grade 3 in bilateral lower limb 
on the mri scan there was a vertebral body hemangioma at d7 level which was extending up to the neural canal with cord compression hence a pre operative embolization was done in this female mediastinal pleura this was a needle which was put in the d7 vertebral body and intraoperative embolization was done using fibrin glue jamshedi needle which is put then a standard corpectomy which is done as you can see the bleeding is minimal after doing a embolization with this method the vertebral body can now be safely removed a corpectomy is done hemostasis is trained using fibrin glue this is the post of 3d ct scan this was a 45 year old male who had presented with sudden onset weakness in bilateral lower limb following fall from height how was grade 1 in bilateral lower limb as you can see on the uh, pre operative scan there was a collapse with fracture vertebrae of uh, the d9 vertebral body level with posterior cord compression hence a posterior lateral thoracotomy was done going from the left side as you can see there is evidence of uh, hematoma overlying the mediastinal pleura the mediastinal pleura is opened the vertebral body and the spine is defined that is the collapsed segment this is the fractured segment vertebral bodies are identified on either side the fractured segment is removed this is the disc discectomy which is done dural decompression which is attained end plate preparation which is done a hemo patch with the fibrin glue is placed over the dura so as to attain a dural integrity now uh, bone pieces are placed on either side of the graft so as to attain bony fusion this is the expanded lung this is the post operative scan this was a 30 year old male with uh, fall from height followed by progressive weakness in uh, lower limb this is the exposure following a a left sided transaxillary approach left left sided transthoracic approach posterior lateral thoracotomy was done mediastinal pleura is again opened the fractured vertebrae is vertebral segment is removed the disc on either side is removed corpectomy is done this is the dural decompression and this is the expandable cage this is a 22 year old female who had presented back pain and weakness in lower limb powers grade 3 in lower limb as you can see on the scan uh, the female has a, a large uh, mediastinal tumor which was extending up to the neural canal with anterior cord compression at d5 to d7 vertebral body level hence going from the left side uh, posterior lateral thoracotomy was done the vertebral bodies are identified on either side the lung is retracted the, this is the tumor which which is identified the tumor which is removed a corpectomy which is performed dural decompression is attained and is confirmed with fluable gelatin matrix spinal continuity is attained by using pedicle screws dural integrity is of utmost importance here hence 
duragen with fibrin glue is placed over it this was a 17 year old male who had presented to us with inability to walk and imbalance since one year patient has been operated just recently one week back power was grade 3 in bilateral lower limb as you can see that the patient is having a kyphoscoliotic spinal deformity with maximum compression at d5 d6 d7 vertebral body level and hence a posterior lateral thoracotomy with fifth rib approach has been used this is the view after performing the thoracotomy as you can see in this case this is a this is a little uh, difficult case and hence uh, the vertebral uh, and initially the costo uh, vertebral joint is identified this is the rib margin which was followed by feeling the end of the rib using a number 4 penfield dissector the spinal column which is first defined as you can see it is a curved rather than a straight line this is the heart with the vessel which is retracted as you can see this is the pathological vertebral body level you can see that uh, the vertebral body is spongy in this case rather than the compact cancellous bone a corpectomy is performed the involved vertebrae with the adjacent disc is removed A 180 degree dural decompression is of utmost importance out here in this case hence high speed diamond drill with continuous irrigation is done this is the dura which is there which can be seen posteriorly and the cortical bone which is there anteriorly the bone is made axial thin and then stripped of the dura by fine dissector this was the anterior epidural vein and there was oozing from one point for which a hemo patch was used this is the hemo patch which is placed over the oozing surface so as to attain hemostasis now this is drilling on the other side so as to see and check for decompression continuity is attained using an expandable cage screws are put one level above and below so as to correct the kyphotic deformity because of the uh, scoliotic spine hence it is of utmost importance to see for the to avoid breach of any annular uh, canal hence a probe is probe was used this is the rod which was placed and was uh, fixed in place using any as soon as the lung retraction was removed we have to check for lung expansion bone chips are placed all around the graft so as to attain early bone effusion this is the lung expansion which is checked this is the post operative scan and the post operative patient video as you can see the patient is completely doing fine is moving all four limbs with an intact power this is how i would like to conclude the upper dorsal spine is a difficult area to approach of the pathology and the compression is anterior sternal splitting approaches have its limitations transthoracic approach is a relatively safe procedure when the indications are correct it allows significant correction in kyphotic deformity with early mobilization and rehabilitation thank you thank you dr nimesh uh, any questions from the audience please in case if there are no questions i would like to get two three things uh, to the to your notice since you are doing a trans thoracic approach is there any pre op preparation uh, as far as the uh, lung problems are concerned post op management ke liye pyrometry says pyrometry is of uh, utmost importance in these uh, places and we like to do a pre operative ct of the spine along with the the mri of the spine so as to confirm that the compression is anterior 
and the patient uh, needs an anterior uh, decompression how long any any pre op uh, respiratory exercises or respiratory therapist involvement is uh, needed so uh, uh, we usually use a three ball incentive spirometry so as to uh, build up the inspiratory group of muscles and uh, the patient uh, as early as possible uh, we try to build his muscles and uh, depending upon as soon as uh, his breath holding time is there only then once the patient is taken in any post op precautions similarly the patient has uh, uh, or post op management rather or uh, the intercostal drain has to be kept for a period of uh, 72 hours sir hmm. uh, rest uh, apart from that the patient has to be doing good expiratory physiotherapy exercises and uh, nebulization has to be going on once the intercostal drain is out then the patient can do active physiotherapy limb exercises as you can see on uh, the last video Any, patient you, you had shown uh, plenty of cases so nice of you to have been very fast and very uh, precise uh it was a good eye opener for everybody or did you encounter any specific approach related problems in the post op like any bronco pleural fistulas or uh any hemothorax insisted hemothorax or something like that uh, no sir i have sir, sir I, uh, i have not seen up till now sir vernon sir we... okay okay fine fine bye Uh-huh. See, these they are not large thoracotomies. They are mini thoracotomies. Number one, they are not more than seven point five centimeters incision. Second thing is we use the microscope immediately when the mic the rib is open. That is number two. So uh, when uh, you can have lung problem is if the lung is adherent, especially if it is an old healed box. We have not seen when there is acute pus there inside. suppose there is a healed cox and if there is pleural fibrosis then sometimes it becomes difficult and one should not do this cases without a cardiothoracic surgeon which he has forgotten the access is given to us by the cardiothoracic surgeon how work starts once the thorax is open we have a thoracic ot which is just next door to us so my cardiothoracic surgeon comes and does the exposure many times he might have to even mobilize the lung so don't try to do these surgeries on your own you can get into severe trouble so if you try to do it on your own you will end up with bronchopleural fistulas and damage to the lung and pneumothorax and hemothorax when they do it they would be giving you a, a good access because sometimes when it uh, things get adhere and you might not be able to differentiate where the aorta is so basically if it's a left sided approach you should be uh, uh, more careful of the aorta if it's a right sided approach you have to be careful of the vena cava which is more dangerous than the aorta so we prefer left sided approach on the lower part of if it is above t5 uh, if it is a d5 d4 you can go on right side or you can go on left side no problem but if it is below d6 then the liver comes in the way on the right side no, so it is better to is go on the left side we have gone up to l2 from the left side for l2 fractures also we have taken the diaphragm down no big deal but it was done by the cvts surgeon so if you have a good access surgeon your life is much much easier and uh, they do the opening they do the closure so the neurosurgeon is left only with the pure spine work spine work anyway dr nimesh nice presentation you stuck to your time and then showed plenty of cases all the best and i thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity thank you Harish, please continue. Yeah. So moving on to the next talk, it will be moderated by Dr. Raman Deep Dang, who is consultant neurosurgery from New Delhi. Over to Dr. Dang. Dr. Raman Deep, there. is not there is dr ramandeep there if he is not there we shall move on to the next talk and to uh, uh, show us the videos on interspinal tumors is dr yogesh saukare who is also the assistant professor at the grand medical college and sir jj group of hospitals in the our department of neurosurgery so he is going to talk about uh, 
different types of spinal tumors encountered in our department. Over to you, Yogesh. Good evening, sir. Respected delegates uh, and uh, respected teachers, a very good evening. My topic is intraspinal uh, tumors. Uh, we will be showing some interesting cases. I'm working in JJ Hospital under Dr. Vernon, sir. Uh, so these are very rare tumors. Complete excision in the goal is the uh, is the goal in this tumors. We know that it is classified as extradural. Some of the examples: <coughs> intradural, extramedullary, intramedullary. So investigations as required are MRI, EMG, CT spine, CT spine, uh, spinal angio, X-ray, urodynamic studies as required. Uh, tractography also plays an important role. The tools required in these cases are ESQSA, high-speed drills, endoscope, uh, microscope, and a good cautery is important. Neuromonitoring obviously plays a very vital role because spinal cord is a very, very, very sensitive structure to traction as well as cautery. So sharing some of the cases, sir, is a case of cervical ependymoma. <clears throat> Patient 40 year old came with uh, spastic cord paralysis. We can see a lesion which is located intramedullary at the C3 level on axial. It is expanding the cord at C3, C4 level. This is the exposure from suboccipital ionian to the upper cervical three vertebras. A laminotomy being done. Firstly, on the unilateral side with a lot of cold serine irrigation so that the drill doesn't get heated up. <clears throat> Similarly, a laminotomy done on the other side, as well as a suboccipital craniotomy done for the proper exposure of the CV junction. Yes. The suboccipital craniotomy done. <clears throat> C1 arch was removed. We can see the upper cervical cord as well as the cervical medullary junction visible. The thick dural band at the cervical medullary junction taken down cautiously. We use a intra, <coughs> intra, intra ultrasound. Very often, we like to use all the tools available for visualization of the tumor. Intraop ultrasound gives a very good visualization of the tumor as well as presence of other anomalies. Like we can clearly see a syrinx here with the tumor. We can locate the cranial part of the syrinx. Proximal syrinx cavity seen clearly. Extent of the lesion can be made exactly on the intraop ultrasound. Thereby, we can do a exact dural incision. This is the caudal syrinx, which is visible. Myelotomy, uh, the dural opening is done. We can see it, uh, a lot of pressure inside the canal. Fluorescent dye was used. The dura retracted laterally. The CVJ dura is open. <coughs> Cautiously okay, taking care of the sinus. Sinus was coagulated and open. It's a very important step in opening this CVJ. Thick dural band was also taken down. Fire open, arachnoid open. We can see the midline veins very clearly. Fluorescent dye was used, which is useful in many tumors for proper demarcation. Entry from the left DREZ zone. Because many times we can see in this case, like the Midline, the vein is coursing in the midline. If we try to open in the midline, this vein can get damaged. So we tend to open from the DREZ zone always. So that there will not be injury to the cord structures. 
incision deep and in layers open with bipolar use also as a dissecting instrument midline vein preserved The caudal searing seen clearly, and the tumor is also visible very clearly from the surrounding spinal cord. Miro seal is used in the caudal. We tend to use Miro seal for proper retraction. <clears throat> Miro cells helps in the retraction as well protection of the cord cranially and caudally and helps in the dissection also. We tend not to take the pile stitches. Tumor being separated from the surrounding cord structures. Tumor is grayish pink, looks highly vascular. So we have to be very gentle with the spinal cord, very gentle with the <clears throat> dissection, a little bit of traction. The patient can go into complete quadriplasia. We can see now the tissue plane in between the tumor and the spinal cord. <laughs> Visualizing the tumor as this is the proximal uh, syrinx, and we will put a Miro seal in that, similar to that we did at the caudal area. <clears throat> Lateral separation of the tumor from the cord structures. The cortex is used beautifully as a dissecting instrument in this case. Patty is used to gently retract the cord naturally. Tumor dissected off from the bed of the spinal cord with complete achievement sequential hemostasis slowly and gradually. This is the cranial on end of the tumor being dissected. This is the last bit of the tumor. Removed. This is a cervical medullary junction. Last bit of the tumor is removed. We can see the posterior canal very clearly. The tumor is removed completely. It's about three centimeter excise specimen. Complete hemostasis was achieved in this case. It's very important to have hemostasis in such cases, because a small hematoma can lead to drastic consequences. The pyre was approximated and pyre closure was used, was done using thermocoagulation technique. So this gives a <clears throat> way to not, a, uh, to, or not to, to prevent the dural leaks also. This is pyre coagulation technique. If possible, we should always do. The only thing is we should preserve the pia very nicely while opening it because it gives a one layer of more protection for preventing the dural leaks. And of course, 
the dura is to be closed meticulously under the microscope. This is one of the very important steps, dural closure. It will prevent much dreaded complications like infection, meningitis. So it has to be a very meticulous step. Dural closure was done. The CVJ dura was repaired with a pericranial patch, which is autologous graft was taken. And the duraplasty was done very finely under microscope. We tend to do the duraplasty all under microscope because the micro sieves, which can leak the CSF are beautifully vis visible under the microscope. It's a very beautiful dural closure which is achieved. Lot of irrigation torosa line washes with antibiotic is given. We tend to use cholestin. This is the tissue glue put over the dura, augmented by surgical. <clears throat> yeah, the spinous process along with the lamina was replaced back again because this construct is an important thing for the protection of the high cervical cord posteriorly and man maintains the normal anatomical integrity of the of the vertebra, cervical vertebrae. A drain was kept. Even the foramen magnum suboccipital craniectomy was also replaced back. Use of glue. This is a post op scan showing complete removal of the tumor. Syrinx was also resolved. This is the immediate post op video in the ward. Patient was able to move upper and the lower limb four minus by five power. Aggressive physiotherapy was given to this patient. Rehabilitation is important in such cases because it augments the functionality of the patient. This is another case of uh, intramedullary high cervical astrocytoma in a very young female. She presented again with the symptoms of imbalance, spasticity, decreased hand grip, and paresthesias. On investigations, the intramedullary lesion was seen in the high cervical area. Similar exposure was done for this patient as shown in the previous case. These are the dural traction stitches. We do a DREZ myelotomy very carefully preserving the midline veins. The dissection proceeds in the deeper plane. We tend to use all the armamentarium available for this because these are very difficult lesions. Cervical cord is very sensitive. The respiratory centers and all the nerves passes through the cervical cord providing nerves to lower limbs as well as the upper limbs. Tumor very seen beautifully. A mild traction is needed. Tumor can be removed in piecemeal. Traction should be just adequate to lift it up from the spinal cord with a gradual dissection from the spinal cord below. Tumor was very vascular, but dissected off completely. <clears throat> Remnant part of the tumor was lifted. Slow traction, hemostasis, sharp dissection from the cord following the planes. And yes, complete dissection over the tumor was achieved with 
good hemostasis. Good hemostasis is very important in cord tumor cases. Post-op scan shows complete resection of the tumor. And this is a very happy video of the patient. Patient went home with full functionality without any deficits. See the happy face. You see, still following up without any recurrence. Uh, it's another challenging case, a uh, CV junction meningioma. You can see at the near the just and the anterior aspect of the foramen magnum, a very highly enhancing tumor, suggestive of meninges tumor. Here, a suboccipital craniectomy with exposure of the cervical spine, upper four vertebrae were done, durotomy was done, stitches were taken. Dural stitches and the vascular tumor is already visible there. A minimal amount of traction is put on the cord. Husa is used as well as suction. The tumor cannot be pulled out in uh, CVJ, so it has to be decompressed in piecemeal fashion gradually, taking care of the hemostasis. Cautery is used to occlude the feeders. And the meningium is completely removed. Take, you see the underlying vasculature is completely preserved. Patient went home without any deficits. Aggressive physiotherapy is being given. Patient is still following up with us. This is another uh, interesting case of a Recurrent uh, cervical, cervical medullary hemangioblastoma uh, was operated two years back, 40 year old male presented with again imbalance. We can see on a contrast scan, a high cervical posteriorly placed, brilliantly enhancing lesion is there, and causing kinking of the spinal cord just by explaining the myelopathic symptoms. It's a very brilliantly enhancing lesion. So the DSA was showing a hypervascular lesion, so this tube of hemangioblastoma with the feeding arteries. Patient was placed in a prone position, taken on clamp. We tend to use neuromotoring in such cases because uh, CVJ has vital structures. So MEPs, abductors, frontal uh, facial muscles were all uh, being taken care of the neuromotoring. This was the baseline neuromotoring. MEP response was measured from various muscles, train of four showing twitches at the time of MEP measurement. Then this was a previous C1 arch was drilled and removed from the underlying dura. In the recurrent cases, you have to be very careful while doing the dural opening because the planes are lost. You have to do this under microscope. The midline sinus is taken up care of by the Liga clips. And yes, we have gone open the arachnoid. We can already see the lesion seems to be full tangle of blood vessels, feeding vessels. Big feeding vessels are visualized. <clears throat> we have to do this uh, under high magnifications. When small, important vessels supplying the brainstem it can lead to large deficits. Intrafluorescent dye is very helpful in such cases. We will give a uh, complete anatomy of the vascular arcade. Sequential dissection in layers, separating the vascular structures from the surrounding brain tissue by a sharp dissection is warranted in such cases. No pulling or pushing technique is allowed at this area because it can lead to drastic consequences on the part of the patient. 
tumor being followed. <clears throat> tumor is gradually coagulated, taking care of the first arterial feeders, gradual dissection with gradual coagulation of the tumor. Tumor starts to separate from the surrounding brain tissue. Already, you can see. Big feeding vessels and big draining veins are there. You have to always take care not to injure one of them during the surgery, at least for torrential bleeding. The patient will never come back and die on the operating table itself. The tumor is seen gradually separating from the surrounding tissue. The remaining deep feeders are of utmost importance. See, there is no MEP is showing no significant changes during the surgery. It's very important to follow the MEP while you are proceeding with the deeper dissection near the medulla. So we have to go all around the region. They market the normal structures from the tumor away. So there was no significant changes. So we can be proceeded more further in the cavity in the deeper aspects of the tumor. So you have to ask, uh, keep, uh, keep on asking the electrophysiologist. The electrophysiologist also has to be very vigilant regarding the fall of MEPs. So we have to stop at that point where the MEP seems to be dropping or if there is an inadvertent, inadvertent traction given to the medulla at some places, the last part of the tumor being. So there was a drop in uh, abductor hallucis and abductor pollicis brevis, which uh, didn't reflected in the post-op uh, uh, deficit of the patient actually. It was very transient, improved with the steroid therapy. Tumor cavity, meticulously, hemostasis was done. Flow seal, we use, tend to use flow seal at such places, difficult places. Thorough irrigation, washing of the flow seal. We use antibiotic washes, uh, dural closure. We're using a dural patch. Another case of a cervical neurofibroma. The 13 year old girl, she presented with left tingling sensation, left upper limb, and weakness with a power of 3 by 5. We can see the tumor is going in the foramen on the left side of the cervical cord at the high cervical area. Is displacing the cord to one side, predominant on the left side. Again, a high cervical approach is warranted. Opening in layers, proceeding with the laminar tomies, <clears throat> suboccipital exposure is also warranted in such cases. Uh, you using of high speed drill, continuous irrigation with coal saline is important. You have to drill under high magnification so as to avoid dural injury to the underlying cord. Is the ligamentum flavum being separated beautifully with a hook and taken off with the disc forceps? Cauterization and adequate hemostasis at this area is important. Bone wax is also used because sometimes the bone causes bleeding too much. We should wax it off. In such cases, we should use all the armamentarium available to us pertaining if it's an instrument. The tumor is visible, it's, it's coming laterally uh, and it's going in the foramen, it's going anteriorly also, tumor 
seems to be very bulky as yes. i think uh, it to be taken out in piecemeal fashion in such cases so it is coagulated and uh, cut so that the uh, so lateral laminotomy was extended the tumor was going in the foramen below the bone the laminotomy was done some bleeding which was taken care of and the remaining part of the tumor was dissected off which was going underlying the bone after proper exposure and drilling of the bone in this kind of tumor you have to be very patient you can't just pull it off even if it is visible adequate hemostasis and meticulous dissection is important in such cases as it may be attaching to a root down you can pull if you pull it off it can get damage and cause a permanent neurological deficit to the patient the tumor was taken out completely the dura at places was repaired closel was applied so jet form glue is used to reinforce followed by fat followed by glue to have a proper closure and to avoid dural leaks <clears throat> and yes obviously the skin closure is very important we can see post op scan complete tumor removal yes drilling of the one side of the lamina and pedicle is done in such case <clears throat> patient went uh, home without any deficit her upper limb deficit resolved this case of dad9 <clears throat> neurofibroma we can see this on the one side of the cord ultrasound was used to localize the tumor after laminotomy the durotomy was done we can already seen some of the part of the tumor looking at us just below the dura such is the beauty of the ultrasound it will get exact location of the tumor we don't need to keep on looking so it's obviously a looks like a neuro or a schwannoma we have to be very gradual with this tumor because it is attached to the nerve roots one of the roots below a gradual lifting from the cord along with the hemostasis is very important in such cases <clears throat> gradual separation is very important you can see some of the roots are attached laterally you have to dissect some of the adhesions there the tumor is lifted off gradually and separated from the nerve roots laterally a gradual traction will give an idea of the nerve root or the additions which are there to the tumor and will be able to separate the tumor completely from the underlying roots or the cord structures the tumor is lifted off very beautifully in mass completely achieving a complete resection with a proper hemostasis obviously we tend to do a very proper dural closure because the patient doesn't have a second chance if infection occurs post op ultrasound post op mri shows complete removal of the tumor patient went home with improvement of the uh, symptoms still following up without any recurrence <clears throat> this is a meningioma so i called asal meningioma c7d1 patient again presented with the myelopathic symptoms so pre op marker ct was done in this case lamina been exposed laterally laminotomy using a drill I always use a drill to do laminotomy 
laminotomic procedure to the Carrison punch is also used. The lamina is lifted up. So again, intra intra ultrasound was used in this case to see the tumor, localize the tumor. Tumor was localized. And yes, uh, dural opening in the midline, traction stitches applied to the dura. And yes, you can see something, cord is there. <clears throat> Further superior exposure was needed in this case. Again, reconfirming with the ultrasound. Yeah, tumor is being seen there. It's gradually dissected <clears throat> from the dura, achieving a hemostasis, coagulating the feeder vessels. Looks like a meningioma. So hemostasis is very important in these cases. You can't just take out, cut the attachments. <clears throat> tumor being coagulated and dissected. The gradual traction with the help of a hook. Is warranted in such cases. May not be able to take out the tumor completely. May have to take in piecemeal fashion because <clears throat> if a complete traction is given, it can damage the underlying structures. Sorry. Yeah. The complete tumor was taken out with the underlying hemostasis separation from the last bit of the tumor was remaining, which was also separated from the dura. <clears throat> We tend to use <clears throat> neuromonitoring in a lot of spinal tumor cases. Because ultimately, the functional outcome is important in these cases, as well as the resection. So, complete dural closure. <clears throat> Glue was reinforced. We use, tend to use covered with fat also. The laminas were reposited back. We tend to use antibiotic powder uh, in the operative cavity to provide one layer of more protection. Uh, this was post-op video. The patient was walking without support. Pre-op, she came. She was ambulant with support. Sequential physiotherapy also was. We tend to give aggressive physiotherapy in our patients and make them ambulant as soon as possible. A post-op, the tumor uh, scan shows complete tumor of the tumor. So the last case of conus dermoid. <clears throat> the laminotomy being done in this case. On either side. The tumor opened. And uh, yes, we can see the spinal cord and another lesion there. That is a dermoid showing mixed elements. Dermoid, uh, the resection of dermoid is very important. Complete resection is very important along with the capsule because it tends to recur. So incomplete resection is unforgivable, the patient will have recurrence, will come with again with deficit. And the second time will not have a, as good as a good plane as in the first uh, surgery. So you should try for a complete resection in the first sitting only. 
can see some potassium material, mixed material, some hair, some bony tooth like things. Also, were retrieved from the humor. Decompression, internal decompression of the tumor was done. You have to be very patient because this tumor tends to be adherent with the surrounding spinal cord structures. Dermoid tend to well, do well at the hands of uh, much experienced surgeons. <clears throat> Tumor was decompressed in piecemeal. You have three minutes. Yes, sir. Just finishing up. The capsule resection is very important. Identification of the capsule and separation from the spinal cord is very important in such cases. Slowly, we should identify the plane. This plane is being seen very clearly from the spinal cord. Especially in the conus dermoids, we need to be very careful uh, regarding the handling of the roots. There's a lot of uh, roots going to lower limbs and bladder will be encountered in the conus area. So should not give inadvertent traction or should avoid injury to the roots. The plane was created. So the dermoid is being lifted from the underlying structures beautifully with proper hemostasis and a sharp dissection. was the post of the section cavity. Hemostasis has been done. Mero seal is being used. And uh, yes, good dural closure in every case is important. Patient preserve good functionality after the resection of the stermoid and went home without any deficits. Thank you. I would like to end my presentation. Uh, another one thing is, in this case, a rehabilitation is very important. Uh, like if you have a chest, uh, high cervical, a spirometer is important. Active and passive limb physiotherapy, walker, rest rehabilitation, neuromuscular training, bladder training, occupational training, and spasticity management holds an important. These are the various exercises we give to our patients, which will and there is a good functionality for them. I would like to end my talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Yogesh. And uh, are there any questions or comments from anybody else? If there aren't any, then we shall close this session. I think, Harish, are you there? Or uh, Rishikesh, you can take over? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so that uh, uh, ends our spinal session. So now we are back with the cranial session, uh, part two. So for the first talk, I would like to invite Dr. Alok Sharma, sir.
who is a professor and head of the department at the Sion Hospital and director of Neurogen Brain and Spine Institute in Navi Mumbai. So he'll be introducing the speaker. Over to you, Alok Sharma, sir. You're mute, sir. You're mute. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be part of any educational program uh, organized by Dr. Vandan. Uh, thank you, Vandan, for bringing all these things. This is of great value to the students. Now, it's also a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Batuk. Dr. Batuk has been our student. He joined our department as a postgraduate student almost 20 years ago, then went on to become assistant professor, associate professor, and is now the additional professor. Now, the special thing about Batuk is he's one of the very few neurosurgeons in the world who excels in both interventional work, endovascular work for vascular, as well as open surgery. Uh, majority of people, they do either just open surgery or they do endovascular, but Batuk specializes in both. He excels in both. And uh, I think this is what the future of vascular should be, that neurosurgeons should be able to do both endovascular and open surgery together. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Batuk to take his talk, which is on management of falco tentorial meningiomas. Uh, Batuk, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm very much proud and it's a privilege for me. I'm audible. Yeah, we can hear you, Batuk. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, I'm very much proud and uh, uh, privileged to be introduced by my teacher and head of the department, uh, Professor Dr. Lok Sharma. Sir, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Varna and his entire team for an opportunity to talk on this subject. I'm going to talk about the falco tentorial meningioma and share my experience on the subject. You can see the large manage mass lesion in the region of the pineal gland. So pineal region meningioma can be either meningioma of the velum interpositum or falco tentorial meningioma. It is sometimes very difficult to differentiate be between these two entity. While the velum meningioma arises, arises from the pia of the roof of the third ventricle and it gets blood supply from the posterior carotid artery. It places the venous complex posterior superiorly. And there is a telltale sign there, is, there will not be any dural uh, a tail or dural attachment in case of the velum meningium of the velar in, velum interpositum. It can be either dorsal lip or a ventral type. While the falco tentorial meningium arises from the either fox or the tent at the junction of the fox and the tent, and it's mainly supplied by the artery of Bernasconi and uh, Cassinari. It uh, uh, shift the uh, uh, venous complex entero inferiorly. And always there will be a dural tail, which can be either superiorly or inferiorly placed. So the falco tentorial meningioma are defined by the location. It, it localized at the junction of the tentorium and the fox cerebri. It may occur any place from the junction of the vein of galen and the straight sinus to the torcula herophila. Often the meningioma around the torcula uh, call as a peritorcular meningioma. This falco tentorial meningioma accounts for one or two percent of intracranial meningioma and hardly less than 100 uh, uh, cases of uh, this meningioma reported in the literature. Re resection of this large lesion are challenging secondary to the complex local uh, venous anatomy and often requires a manipulation or ligation of the straight sinus, torcula, or the vein of galen. So the, when the meningioma is lying above the venous complex, it is called a superior type of falco tentorial meningioma. And the, when the venous complex lies above, it is called the inferior type of meningioma. Usually patients uh, present with the progressive symptoms and uh, symptoms develop over a month or a month prior to the presentation. And the classical presentations is the headache. Most of the patients present with the headache and very few patients will have a presentation of a visual uh, changes and the gait abnormality. Uh, occasionally, they have uh, incontinence, personality changes, and mainly because of the obstetric hydrocephalus. Physical examination, one very uh, rarely find a positive finding except the papillary edema, and very uh, uh, rarely one can see the cranial nerve deficit. So most of the patients present with a CT scan, like I have shown in the uh, these pictures, large lesion in the posterior third ventricle, usually enhanced significantly on the contrast. One can see the location of the, uh, the lesion in relation to the, the fox. So in all this sort of a patients, it's a, it's a must to have a preoperative neuro uh, imaging in the form of magnetic resonance imaging along with the angiography, including the cerebral venography. 
So with regards to the MRI, T2, T1 weighted, T2 weighted images sequence with or without uh, gadolinium contrast uh, enhancement, uh, uh, it's uh, very necessary because it not only show the location and the size of the lesion, but also show the relation of the lesion in, rela uh, in, in, uh, uh, in a uh, brain parenchyma. So MR venography and CT venography provide a 3D venous anatomy, and that is a very important in making a decision regarding the surgical treatment. Angiography with venography is performed nearly in all cases, both for assessment of the arterial supply to the tumor and for evaluation of the patency of the straight sinus, torcula, transverse sinus, and vein of Galen. Uh, this lesion usually approached by the uh, either occipital transtentral as shown in the uh, uh, blue marker and the infratentral supracerebellar approach as shown in the green marker. See, the operative approach depends on the lateral extension and the venous displacement. Uh, uh, occipital transtentorial approach can be performed either in the seating position or a three-quarter cone position. The C, uh, it provides a wider corridor in relation to the craniopodal view and uh, gravitational retraction. It helps in the gravitational retraction of the occipital lobe. While supracerebellar trans uh, supracerebellar infratentorial approach helps when the tumor extension across the vein of Galen malformation, uh, vein, vein of Galen uh, complex. Uh, to the contralateral infratentral side. It's preferred in the patients with the visual symptoms because of occipital transtentorial often associated with the visual disturbances. So it's uh, patient positioning is determined by the uh, patient's habitus and the surgeon's preference. Uh, procedure, as I mentioned, can be performed either prone or three-quarter prone position. That is preferred position because there is a lower risk of embolism and also optimize the, uh, uh, optimize the uh, relaxation of the occipital lobe and thereby uh, minimum re uh, retraction to the occipital lobe. Well, the semi-sitting position is better tolerated by the obese patient because in this patient, sometimes it is very challenging to uh, ventilate in a prone position. But I also I already mentioned it is all surgeon's preference also play a very important role. Uh, those patients who underwent a surgery under semi-sitting position should evaluate it for the patency of foramen ovale uh, preoperatively. Intraoperative aids include the use of steroid mannitol hyperventilation to reduce the postoperative edema, to reduce the intraoperative ICP and minimize the need for the retraction. Smaller lesion usually can be uh, managed by the unilateral occipital uh, uh, craniotomy, while the larger lesion require bilateral occipital craniotomy. Lumbar subarachnoid space, uh, lumbar uh, subarachnoid drain, as well as the external ventricular drainage, so often used to re, uh, reduce the intracranial pressure. Often, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are very limited uh, cases uh, available in the literature. So, when the case series is more than two, the complication reported in this series is around 20 to 50 percent, and that is mainly uh, related to the visual loss. So patient and the family members should be counseled regarding the significant potential for the transcortical hemianopsia or blindness postoperatively. Resection can be either total or subtotal and uh, entirely depend on the position of the great, uh, great vein of galen, tumor attachment to the falcotentorial or major veins, consistency of the nature. This is a very important uh, uh, thing one has to remember during the surgical procedure. Uh, as well as this lateral and inferior extension and the presence of a good tumor in a neuroaxial arachnoid plane. So I will share my uh, experience with the two giant palcotentorial meningiomas uh, along with uh, its video. Uh, my first patient is a 38-year female. She presented with a chronic headache for 9 to 10 months and she had a, uh, since last one month she had a giddiness. Neurological examination doesn't reveal any uh, positive finding. So CT scan brain plane study reveal a large mass in the region of the posterior third ventricular with the presence, it was isodense in nature with the presence of peripheral as well as some central calcification. Lesion was homogeneously enhanced, uh, uh, enhancing on the post contrast administration and one can see the relation with the FOX in this uh, uh, CT scan. So this is the coronal and the sagittal imaging showing the uh, uh, extent of the lesion. One can see the FOX and the relation of this uh, uh, tumor uh, with the, both the tents. Here one can see the deep uh, relation uh, with uh, the deep cerebral uh, vein uh, to the tumor and the uh, straight sinus. I will show uh, in a subsequent slide uh, uh, about details of this finding. MRI plane study showing a almost isointense lesion, which was almost isointense on T2 weighted images, as well as uh, homogeneously enhancing on the contrast, as I mentioned, and MRI 
uh, always denotes the uh, size and the location of the lesion, but also helps in the understanding the relation to the important uh, 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 brain parenchyma and the important neurovascular structure. This is the coron uh, this is the coronal uh, image showing the relation of the uh, deep cerebral veins to the tumor. One can see here that there is a displacement of the venous structure on the left side and the superior aspect of the tumor. Again, this is a sagittal view, uh, T2 weighted images, and the contrast showing uh, again the relations to the in the uh, in the peritorpular region. So, as I mentioned, cerebral angiography is a very essential. Most of these tumors getting a blood supply from the uh, this is the tentorial branch of. Uh, 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 tentorial branch arising from the internal carotid artery. In this, uh, in our patient, there was also blood supply from the uh, uh, PCA branches, mainly from the left side. This is a very important uh, uh, imaging I found uh, uh, and I reconstructed uh, myself uh, personally, showing the relationship, uh, showing the relationship of the tumor with the straight sinus and the deep venous system here. So here is the both this internal cerebral vein lying on the, as I have shown, lying on the left side, is the left side of the tumor and going into the uh, galenic vein and ultimately draining into the superior side uh, in the straight sinus. So this is a very essential and important thing uh, while planning the surgery for this patient. So we, we did a surgery in a semi-sitting position with a bilateral occipital craniotomy. We put a left parietal EVD and via right occipital intrahemispheric transdental approach will uh, approach the lesion. This is a semi-sitting position. Patient was head was tilted slightly towards the uh, right side to facilitate the retraction, uh, facilitate the uh, retractions of, of the right occipital lobe. This is the bilateral occipital craniectomy and the dura here was uh, open uh, mainly based on the uh, uh, medially. So this is the operative video. Uh, showing the uh, showing the uh, opening of the dura, dura opening was based medially towards the sinus. By uh, by a gentle uh, microsurgical techniques, right occipital lobe was separated from the uh, fox. This is a very important vein that was we found uh, uh, occipital vein, and uh, uh, throughout the surgery we took a care uh, to prevent this vein. So now one can see the tumor was rich and the tumor was soft, suckable, bit of vascular, but uh, it was easy, easily suckable. And this, once you understand, once you see this nature of the tumor, uh, almost your 70, 80% uh, anxiety will disappear because uh, you know this is a suckable tumor, no doubt it will take time, but slowly, slowly you will be able to remove the tumor. And most of the time, this is the nature of the tumor that will ultimately decide the, uh, I feel, outcome of, the, of these patients. So now here with the microsurgical techniques, I am uh, sucking the tumor with the help of the sucker and uh, uh, taken a tissue a sample for the biopsy. And uh, uh, one can see on the right side, I put a self-retaining retractor. This is the retractor on the right occipital. And one has to be have a dynamic retractor, it should not be heavy. Uh, uh, and uh, repeatedly, one has to release the retractor to prevent the infarct to the occipital lobe or injury to the occipital lobe. So here I am going uh, on the right side, I'm decompressing the right side of the tumor uh, 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 from the right side. Most important thing is the intratumoral decompression, and that is the key principle we follow in each and every tumor when we remove from the uh, cerebrum or a, a spinal cord like intratumoral decompression, intratumoral decompression, that will ultimately, tumor will make a space for you to work. Like Because in, initially when we uh, expose the uh, tumor, you will have a very limited space. As we decompress the tumor, we'll have a more space and ultimately tumor will create a uh, space uh, to work. So here I one can see this is the posterior part of the uh, 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 corpus callosum and splenium of the corpus callosum. Uh, and then uh, there was a very good pile uh, plane, uh, pile arachnoid plane that uh, the tumor was dissected from that. So after uh, ensuring uh, enough uh, decompression anteriorly, one can see how tumor can easily uh, suck it out. So I, I went posteriorly and uh, this is the uh, tent, I'm cutting the tent. So this is the uh, transtentorial, I'm going transtentorial. And then again, you can, one can see the tumor bit uh, fibrous uh, 
but uh, most of the tumor was suckable and uh, not so much vascular no doubt there was uh, some bleeding but and now i am trying to uh, remove the tumor from the opposite side from the left side beneath the fox so here so again intratumoral decompression gentle uh, 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 one continuous uh, uh, continuous concentration as well as in the right uh, right occipital lobe retractor what i put there so now uh, I am removing some fibrous uh, bands. I will just uh, forward the video. And uh, one can see here on the right side, one can see the very good uh, 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 pile plane and uh, 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 tumor can be easily sucked out there. So now one can see this the, the part uh, of the uh, falco tendril junction from where the tumor was arising. I am going across that and towards the left side, decompressing the tumor. Yeah, one can see the more, more uh, normal uh, uh, anatomical structure. And that is the posterior part of the uh, splenium. So at the end, one can see uh, one can one can see the uh, flow of CSF, and that is the time when you will, uh, uh, one can realize there is enough decompression of the tumor, and uh, 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 most of the most of the tumor has been uh, uh, removed. There was some uh, bleeding in this this part uh, of the this is the part of the tumor that was lying above the cerebral uh, cerebellar parenchyma. So that this one can see the cerebellar parenchyma uh, beneath this tumor. So here one has to be very careful about uh, preserving the normal veins because sometimes it's very difficult to uh, uh, while uh, uh, sucking the tumor sometimes you cannot focus and uh, you can damage the vein. One can see here there is a posteriorly lying a vein over the normal cerebral uh, parenchyma. So uh, here now the most of the uh, tumor was removed and uh, one can see some part of the tumor on the left side beneath the tent on the uh, it's uh, it's still there now. Uh, here are the PCA branches. I was just uh, doing the hemostasis there, and finally, uh, so yeah, yeah. This is a tactile plate. Posteriorly, we can see beneath the splenium, and most of the tumor was removed. Yeah, and then finally the. Uh, uh, Row area was covered with the surgery cell. So uh, this is the post-operative CT scan um, uh, immediately after surgery. As I shown, uh, one one can see there is almost uh, this is the pre-operative image is the uh, pre-operative image plane study. Uh, so there is no hyperdense density. This again is the plane study, and this is the craniotomy as well as the external ventricular drainage that was kept from the uh, the left para, uh, parietal bar hole. So this is the post-operative CT scan, the coronal and the sagittal view. And uh, we did a, uh, uh, before discharging the patient, we did a MRI showing a significant uh, uh, excision of the tumor. Some, some enhancement I was seeing in this area, but I thought it may be uh, post-operative disease will see this uh, 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 in a subsequent follow-up. So this is the pre-operative uh, MRI and this is the post-operative MRI after excision of the tumor. The post-operative post course was uneventful. A patient was discharged on the sixth post-operative day and the histopathology report was a transitional meningioma who grade one. My next case is a 35-year male. Uh, he presented with a headache for uh, six to eight months and he also had a visual disturbances and he uh, did not have any neurological deficit. So he had a CT scan brain that was suggestive almost uh, 6.8 6 by 5.8. 1 by 6.6 .6 centimeter size midline uh, uh, lesion along the fox and uh, that was hyperdense on t1 weighted image in, and there was no evidence of any calcification this lesion was enhancing uh, brilliantly on a contrast one can see on a coronal view as well as the sagittal view and the axial view here one can clearly understand the relationship of this tumor with the fox tent and uh, 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 straight sinus 
here uh, 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 it's very important to understand the venous complex before planning the procedure in this patient planning the operative approach in this patient so uh, here i have shown the uh, clinic uh, this thing a uh, cartoon showing the uh, normal anatomy and uh, how the tumor has made this uh, anatomy uh, absolutely uh, abnormal so this is the mri uh, uh, showing a similar size lesion that was uh, superiorly pushing the splenium and the body of the corpus callosum uh, anteriorly it was widening the third ventricle and compressing the midbrain one can see here inferiorly it was extending beyond the tentorium and compressing the cerebellar hemisphere and uh, posteriorly it was extending uh, along the both the side of the fox uh, this is the t2 weighted axial uh, uh, images and one can clearly see the relationship of uh, both the internal cerebral vein here are the right internal cerebral vein left and joining together form the a uh, galenic vein beyond this we were not able to see so we thought uh, like uh, there is a obliter complete obliteration of the straight sinus as well as the distal part of the vein of galen so again in this patient so we went uh, with the semi sitting position but uh, uh, and bilateral occipital intrahemispheric transtentorial uh, transfalcian approach in this patient uh, instead of uh, compared to the previous one i had to go on the both the side of the uh, 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 both the side of the fox uh, from from the midline so here on the right side uh, i'm like uh, one, one can see the tumor again like the tumor was uh, soft suckable uh, compared to the previous case this tumor was uh, very much soft and suckable so I, as i was just putting a suction there and tumor was automatically uh, coming uh, into the suction so again like uh, uh, as i have mentioned previously intratumoral decompression is the key thing and that will bring a tumor uh, into the uh, your vision and uh, not only uh, it will create a space to for the for you to remove the more lesion here i cut the uh, uh, tent on the right side see one can see that the, the and uh, the part of the tumor is still uh, now this this part is the posterior part of the tumor and posterior inferior part of the tumor and uh, that is coming in the view and uh, that is again like it was uh, easily suckable and uh, that was uh, 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 exercise micro uh, micro uh, micro surgical uh, using micro surgical techniques here one can see this entire part of the tumor and uh, the part of the tumor that was adherent uh, to the uh fox and the tent again after adequate decompression uh one can see the uh, normal uh, uh, brain parenchyma yeah now one can see easily the csf space and uh, this is the end of the tumor in the posterior posterior inferior portion so again the uh, in these patients uh, after cutting the tent i have cut the fox and try to go from the same side on the opposite side from the right uh, from the right intrahemispheric to the towards the left side and whatever possible uh, tumor was uh, removed but uh, during uh, one stage i realized uh, still uh, i am not able to remove some uh, some of the uh, uh, tumor from the right side so i decided uh, to open the dura on the left side again and uh, to go, uh, remove the tumor from the left side so again still i am on the right side so now when one can see there is a normal brain current current time is exposed almost all the tumor is removed from the right side and now on the on the left side of the uh, left intrahemispheric separating separating the occipital lobe one can see the tumor here again the same uh, the tumor was having a similar uh, characteristic easily suckable and uh, again like with a intratumoral decompression sorry so most of the part uh, most of the uh, tumor was removed one can see here uh, there is a clear csf uh, coming uh, from and this this was the end of the tumor tumor was a well capsulated one can see the capsule of the tumor and the arachnoid plane here so uh, these are the pca branches in the uh, uh, 
subarachnoid space one can see clearly so this was the part of the uh, straight sinus uh, and i thought it was like obliterated uh, spontaneously with the tumor so we have excised that and uh, uh, maximum possible tumor was removed and when i realized there was a venous complex uh, coming uh, and one can see here probably this was the venous complex that we have seen in the uh, t2-weighted mri images so that uh, uh, this part i have left uh, and uh, finally, uh, so again, I went on the right side and uh, the, the, the part of the tumor that was arising from the fox was uh, removed. So this is the post-operative CT scan uh, showing the uh, uh, complete excision of the tumor and uh, some air pockets uh, because they're done in the semi-sitting. One can see the pneumocapillus in the frontal region and this is the post-operative uh, clinical photograph of the patient. So again, like patient has an uneventful post-operative course and discharge on the seventh post-operative day. And again, the histopathological uh, uh, diagnosis, histopathology was a transitional meningioma who grade one. This is the immediate uh, post-operative MRI uh, flare sequences uh, showing a, a significant uh, excision of the tumor. And some uh, uh, post-operative changes, I thought uh, during uh, uh, immediate, uh, during this TV, because the MRI we have done uh, on the fourth or fifth post-operative day. But in the follow-up period of one and uh, one year and eight months, uh, one can see almost, uh, uh, except this dot, there is no enhancement on the uh, axial cut. This is the sagittal cut, and this is the venous complex. And this is the coronal cut, showing no uh, uh, residual tumor. And we did a follow-up venography, and uh, that has also confirmed there is a complete absence of the uh, 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 straight sinus in this patient. So this is a three and a half year follow-up patient so happily working uh, in his farm. So in conclusion, uh, falco tentorial meningioma are a rare tumor and challenging to manage operatively. Useful component of a successful resection includes the uh, detailed preoperative neuroimaging, angiography with a venography and a wide craniotomy. Planning of the operative approach after understanding the status of the surrounding venous sinus is key to successful outcome. And I would like to acknowledge my resident, Dr. Gagan Dahl and Dr. Kavin Devani, who helped me to prepare this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for kind helping. Thank, Thank you, you Batu, for excellent talk and for sticking to your time. That's wonderful. Uh, we have three minutes more. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, people can uh, Rishikesh, people can ask questions, right? Yeah, yeah, people can ask. There's yeah. nothing in the chat, sir. Yeah, there's nothing. So, can we terminate this or should, should we go to the next lecture? Uh, yeah, if there are no questions, there is a slight change. Uh, Dr. Manas Panigrahi sir is stuck up somewhere. So, Vernon sir will uh, present his talk first and then we'll move to Dr. Manas. Okay, so we finished this session. And yeah, we finished this talk. So, for next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Santosh Lard sir, uh, who is a senior consultant neurosurgeon in uh, Muscat Private Hospital, Badri Sama Hospital and Star Care Hospital in Muscat, as well as a visiting consultant Neurosurgeon at Goa Medical College and Manipal Hospital, Goa. So, Santosh Lad, sir, you are Can there? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, it's a, it's a nice honor and privilege. And first of all, thank you all the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. And I am presenting now before you, Dr. Vernon Vellu. In fact, he's one of the dynamic young neurosurgeons. Not only is a good surgeon, good teacher, but one of the thing is, in the process of you know, introducing me to various programs, he's also been teaching me and I have learned a lot from him. He's a good teacher and I hope he continues to do so. So, and I don't think he needs more introduction apart to say that he's the professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery, Grand Medical College, which I used to work some years ago for a few, few months under Professor Bhagwati. So over to you, Dr. Varnan, for your nice talk. Thank you, Dr. Lard. And uh, thank you, Rishikesh. So I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, show you some intraventricular tumors because it's an operative video session. So I will talk less of theory. So before starting any surgeries on intraventricular tumors, we got to know and understand the anatomy of the ventricle, which is very important. It's a very complex anatomy. It's a 3D anatomy. It's not 2D. 
I would say more than 3D, 4D. And uh, you have to know where you are once you're in the ventricle because there is no escape. If you do not know where you are, you can damage a lot of important structures. So this uh, slide is full of the anatomy and you have to know how to approach and where to approach is very, very important. So these are the different approaches which you would use for the intraventricular tumors. It can be from front, it can be from middle, it can be from back, it can be from the nose. So one has to be familiar with all these types of approaches and the tumor warrants the different approaches which one has to be having as a shortest trajectory, safest trajectory and the easiest trajectory. So I'll just show you some videos. So this is a tumor, a very large tumor. It's more centrally oriented. You see the sagittal cut. So the MRI, not much of enhancement. You see here. So looking at it, this tumor, it appears you'd be able to suck it out. So the approach would be a midline approach. It would be towards the So you have to get to the midline. Now, there are two ways to get to. One is through the trigone, because you might have to go to the other side. Or one is transcalosal. So this was the approach which we used. That's the ultrasound. Localization. And we use the I don't use much of retraction. I use the silicon paddy. So here, if you see, you can already see the tumor. The tumor which is seen is fairly suckable. So these are good tumors, but mind you, in the ventricle, as you suck out the tumor, the ventricle collapses and the brain also collapses. So it becomes difficult to maintain. This is the choroid plexus here. It becomes difficult to maintain that retraction. But one has to use dynamic retraction because... Self-retaining retractors create more damage. You can use it. You can use a brain retractor, but it is better off used for a short period of time. So here, you have to know your direction. You follow the choroid plexus. Preferably, you can go from one side to the other side and always use only ringer lactate irrigation. So the good thing is to find the choroid plexus first and then go on following the choroid plexus because that's your guiding light. You can go up to the foramen of the bondro. There's no problem about it. But before that, you've got to keep removing the tumor. That is the most important thing. So the tumor gains vascularity as it goes deeper and as it goes closer to the foramen. So one has to be careful. And here we are trying to preserve this vein here. There's a vein which is going right through the tumor. So as far as possible, preserve this vein and work around the vein. If you see a bleeder in the ventricle, it is better off coagulated because you will lose that bleeder if you leave it. So once if you see a bleeder, it is better off coagulated. So we are dissecting this tumor off the choroid plexus and the venous plexus. It's turned out to be a central neurocytoma. 
And we place the drain always for 48 to 72 hours. And that's the post op scan. So the other option was to go transcalosal, but I would have been able to, uh, to remove little of the tumor. So I decided to go from one side to the other side through the trans trigonal approach. So this is another case, an intraventricular meningioma. Again, a transsulcal trigonal approach. If you see the tumor is pretty hard here. I literally have to cut it, it is calcified. And these meningiomas can grow to big sizes in the ventricle. Again, no retraction. I'm using the silicon paddy and uh, always have the cotonoids with a long thread because and keep a count of the cotonoids because you don't know how many you have used inside. I always keep a count and I ask the sister to give me a count periodically of the cotonoids being used. Here we are doing a piecemeal dissection. You cannot remove these tumors in total, until you do a piecemeal decompression, you have to identify the ependymal anatomy. And one has to, the patient should not tug on the tumor too much because you have important venous structures going below the tumor because they are all hidden by the tumor. And your corticectomy is a very small corticectomy. It cannot be more than 3.5 to 4 centimeters. Sometimes you have to do it from the left side. If it is pointing towards the left side, and there it becomes lesser. So here you have to identify the choroid plexus again. This I showed you. And as you write it here, it is attached to the choroid plexus. So I had to take a little bit of choroid plexus out. And then we put the drain. I keep the drain for 48 to 72 hours. And that's the post op. If you see here, there's a little bit of blood. So all these ventricular tumors. This blood has to be cleared out with the EVD because sometimes it goes to the opposite ventricle also. So it is better to have an EVD for a few days and clear all this blood. And that's the post-op follow-up scan. That's the patient. She had a little bit of confusion initially, but then she improved. So this is another patient, left trigoronal intraventricular meningioma. Again, left side. So one has to be careful in planning the surgical approach. So the topectomy has to be just enough to get the tumor out. We use the ultrasound to localize and some tumors are pretty firm. So we need to literally cut them. And again, I use the silicon paddy on both sides and uh, trying to identify the tumor and the ependyma interface, which is very important. And uh, your assistant has a very important role here. He has to keep holding the tumor because you have to retract. I retract with the suction. So one hand is engaged retracting and the tumor is held by the assistant. So exact amount of tension should be achieved. And that's the post-op scan. That's the patient. This is a third ventricle colloid cyst. Now the approach I do is transcalosal. I don't do them endoscopically anymore because this was having a thick colloid. So the classical transcalosal approach, the craniotomy is based around the coronal suture. You gotta be careful of the veins. So here we are using more of stitches on the box side little bit of early retraction to get to the corpus callosum. And after that, I do not use much of retraction. So here we keep some marrow cell or a ball to keep the retraction inside. That's the callosotomy. You have to be in between the pericallosals. And once you get into the ventricle many times because of the tumor, displacing the septum pellucidum. It might displace the phonix also. You might be in the wrong side. So you have to get oriented. So the trick in the intraventricular surgery is to have a three-dimensional view in your mind as you're going in, because if you see here, the whole foramen of Monroe is pushed up and you have to sort of open the septum pellucidum and go a little more anteriorly. 
So we have to trace this choroid plexus. And if you see, that is the left side choroid plexus, not the right side. So I had to open the colloid cyst. It was thick material, very thick wall. So these tumors are difficult slightly endoscopically. And uh, most part of it is once you open this, all this gets into the ventricle. So it becomes difficult in uh, endoscopically. Although they, uh, Dr. Yadav had shown it with a, a retractor, tubular retractor, but I prefer the transcalosal because it is much easier and faster. So here we are dissecting the, always there would be a vessel, choroidal vessel attached. So this is a very firm sac. So we have to dissect it all around gently. Do not tug too much because the phonics is just there. So you have to gently peel it off medially and laterally and then coagulate that feeding vessel. and sharp dissection when required. So now I'm using the silicon paddy again. I'm not using the retractor because many times the retractor comes in your way to negotiate the instruments. And here we are separating it from that vascular attachment. You have to preserve the veins as much as possible and coagulate only the arterial feeders. And the important thing is you should not damage anything surrounding in the ventricle because every part is very delicate. The ependymer is very sensitive. That's the last part which we are disconnecting. And achieve hemostasis when you can because if you lose the bleeder, then it is very difficult to find it. So that's the tumor which is dissected. And that's the tumor out. Little bit of hemostasis and then closure. I leave a drain there for 24 to 48 hours if it's a large colloid cyst. And that's the post-op scan. Yes. So this is a recurrent colloid cyst. This patient was operated before by endoscopy, we used to do the endoscopic uh, excisions. But however, it would be difficult to remove the whole uh, uh, colloid cysts. We have to shrink it because basically it's a one hand technique. Now they have the two hand system, which is called the LOTA system. So you are aspirating the cyst and then you are coagulating and shrinking the cysts. But then the tendency for recurrence is high. This patient came back after five years with a recurrent colloid cyst. We had done a good job fairly in the first phase, but a little bit of capsule was left because that is all which you can do. We are, we are cutting the capsule with the scissor and delivering out, but you tend to keep some of the capsule when doing it endoscopically. Unless you have a two-hand technique, that's the remnant of a capsule which was left inside. That's the third ventricle. So it's slightly technically difficult if the cyst is thicker. If it is very fine and uh, flimsy, it can come out in total. Yes. So here he came back with the recurrence. And we had to go in transcalosal again small callosotomy. Here what I've done is I put marrow cell to retract both the lobes and silicon protection on both sides, just a limited opening of the callosum. And then on high magnification, that's the colloid which is coming out. Since it's recurrent, it is more adherent. So one has to be careful, dissect it gently. 
you see there's a lot of vascular attachment here since it is recurrent so a gentle tug and a gentle delivery of the tumor along with the capsule is very very important and if you see here there would be a vessel attached and uh, that can be coagulated and cut you can see the third ventricle in the background so this patient did well post operative scan and is cured now hopefully next so this is another intraventricular meningioma again it is pretty anterior so in this anterior you have to have a proper exposure it's a lateral position which we give a topectomy which is done and then getting back to the meningioma we localize this with ultrasound and these meningiomas this tends to be adherent more towards medially so i'm removing it piecemeal i have preserved the if you see there's a vessel there which is crossing the brain one should not coagulate it because this is the if you coagulate too many vessels the patient can come out with a deficit so you can preserve the vessels even while doing the topectomy it's a pretty hard tumor it's calcified so the amount of movement which you do inside the ventricle is also very important they should be gentle coordinated movements so your assistant should be knowing exactly what to do and not pulling unnecessarily you see here these tumors tend to bleed so always keep a ball inside and core out the tumor gently till you get only the capsule and then the tumor can be delivered out and you have to maintain hemostasis by irrigation coagulation and that's the post op scan and that's the patient so this was a patient the third ventricular craniopharyngioma which was going pretty up almost going up uh, towards the corpus callosum but it was pushing the third ventricle up so we decided to go transcalosal transcoroidal so this is transcalosal transcoroidal approach entering the third ventricle and excising this tumor since it was sort of a midline region pushing the third ventricle upwards what you see now is we are in the floor of the third ventricle we have opened the floor of the third ventricle and we are removing this tumor piecemeal that's the pca reservoir placement closure that's the post op scan and that's the patient this was a sub ependymoma again a transcalosal approach since the tumor was more on the left side we decided to go from the left side so one has to plan which side you can enter transcalosally you have to also do the mr venography and see for the venous anatomy and here we are identifying the tumor close to the foramen of monro again no self retaining retractors just the silicon paddy doing the job using the cusa to debulk the tumor and sort of decompress it these tumors mind you are dear into the phonix so one has to be very very gentle and uh, dissect them in a proper way so here you see the entry towards the foramen of monro that's the post op scan that's the follow up scan that's the patient <clears throat> so this was reported as a lymphoma we thought it would be a central neurocytoma it turned out to be a lymphoma very rare area to have a lymphoma 
again transcalosal approach opening the septum a little bit of handheld retraction here we don't use self retaining we have a handheld retraction that required and that is done over the silicon patty and then we remove the retractor that's the third one take post op scan so then we go to the posterior third ventricular tumors so this was a pineal tumor entering the third ventricle so we use this lateral semi sitting position instead of the classical sitting position it's a good position so one can do the same thing like what you require in a semi because this is a more comfortable position for the surgeon so here we are going supra cerebellar infra tentorial this tumor is entering the posterior third ventricle excision again piecemeal excision and then after excision of the tumor you can see the third ventricle well that's the post op scan so this was a large intraventricular epidermoid now again we'll have to go trans trigonal to reach the other side so small topectomy and epidermoids in the ventricle are slightly difficult you got to keep dissecting these veins from the capsule you got to keep getting to the mother of pearl because the mother of pearl gives birth to the epidermoid so until you get the mother of pearl which is these globules attached to the capsule and attached to the choroid plexus you will not be able to get the tumor completely so this was a right sided approach and we could go up to the other side because in epidermoids one thing good is that the space the tumor produces gives you enough of space for you to work inside so here we are removing it piecemeal but the only problem is that the as you remove the tumor the brain collapses on you and that is the post op scan and that is the patient another epidermoid you see here it was traversing the ventricle going up to the surface and coming down into the posterior fossa so here again we went transcalosal interhemispheric approach and the good thing here is the tumor has divided the brain into two halves right up to the posterior fossa so which was a very good thing for the surgeon so if you just follow the plane then you can see now we are that's the choroid plexus and it is going below the choroid plexus right into the posterior fossa so we are going trans choroidal now just following the tumor that's the mammillary body is there into the third ventricle down below and then we could see the liliquous membrane also there and after removal we use the endoscope to see if everything is out many times some things are and this is the anatomy of the posterior fossa prepontine area and that's the foramen of monro so here also we could get a fairly good excision watertight visual closure and that's the patient and that's the post op scan next this was a trigonal neuronal tumor again left sided approach 
left sided you have to be very careful you do not give the patient a speech deficit ultrasound localization here is a trans sulcal approach it's not a trans chiral approach we are going trans sulcal here and then entering the ventricle just enough uh, opening you do not need large openings once you get into the ependyma you see the ependyma then you can work around the tumor debulk the tumor suck the tumor with the fusa and achieve complete hemostasis so the problem about intraventricular tumors is orientation and the tendency to get lost inside the ventricle so you got to keep on reorienting yourself look at the scan go back to the scan see where you are and uh, get oriented get oriented with the direction of the tumor how it is going and you have to keep looking for the choroid plexus and the vein to lead you to the foramen of monroe it's like finding your way to the foramen of monroe many times it is difficult and the amount of pull you should use is very less it should be a gentle tug never pull anything inside the ventricle because it's attached here to the foramen of to the choroid plexus so we have to literally shave it off the choroid plexus most of these tumors neurocytomas are attached to the choroid plexus some may arise from the choroid plexus also and if you see here you have to dissect this vein gently and preserve it completely so i am showing you this in real time so that there is no hurry you have to spend your time dissecting in intraventricular tumors you should not do it in a hurried fashion that's after the excision that's the patient post op that's the post op scan this is another meningioma i think i'll skip this because we have already shown and this is a large glioma frontal glioma which we just did if you go to see it is entering almost the anterior part of the ventricle also so here we did a frontal approach and if you see it is left sided so we are removing the tumor this meal is going towards the medial part of the frontal lobe and also into the corpus callosum sort of a low grade high grade type of a glioma it was a moderate grade grade 2 so quite sub suckable and uh, getting the tumor out so here if you see the ventricle is open so one has to be careful otherwise we can get collections keeping a drain that's the patient and that's the post op scan so he is sent for radiotherapy this was a patient colloid cyst with the avm he had a corpus callosum avm so we did not know what was causing his headaches so but to get to the top uh, colloid cyst we had to first excise the avm otherwise it would be very difficult to get to this of course somebody would have said that we could have done it transcortically but i said since we are going in for the colloid cyst why don't we get the avm out also so here we excise the avm first
using a temporary clip the arterial feeders are taken down first and then after that we went in for the colloid cyst because it was the same uh, trajectory and the same approach and we did not know what was causing the headaches so we said better get both out and that's the colloid cyst coming out to the rear end to the forward plexus that's the post op pre op bsa post op bsa post op scan and that's the patient who did well so this was another patient funny case adenoma it was i think adenocarcinoma was an intraventricular metastasis so these are sometimes very vascular we did not know what it was before it turned out to be an intraventricular primary from lung that was what was diagnosed it was an adenocarcinoma so intraventricular tumors can be a variety of them and they can present in different ways most of them are silent and they grow to a big size before they appear before the surgeon except for the colloid cysts the colloid cysts appear more earlier compared to these tumors which are in the trigon so this is excision of this metastasis intraventricular and that's the post op scan so the technique is the same no difference in the technique so this is another intraventricular cavernoma so if you see it is left sided deep seated so it's good to navigate but after you open the ventricle the navigation is of no use the ultrasound is a much better tool So here we have used the ultrasound and then gone in trans trigonal again. And this AVM is sort of bled, not AVM, sorry, cavernoma. And getting the plane. And the important thing inside in the ventricle is you have to identify the cavernoma on all sides before delivering it out. sometimes there is some small and here if you see we have preserved the vein and the artery on the cortex not gone through and through and that is the removal and that's the post op scan that's the patient so this is another pineal glial tumor posterior third ventricular tumor we use fluorescing to identify the tumor interface again lateral semi sitting steins approach we use so removal of the tumor here so in a glioma it is slightly difficult to get the plane you have to be on higher magnification and that's the tumor removed hemostasis and the endoscope shows you all the veins preserved and the tumor almost out that's the entering inside the ventricle with the endoscope so endoscopy gives you a beautiful view to see the completeness of your excision that's the patient he had perinodes initially but he uh, improved after a period of 3 months now supposed to scan on the right below the patient So this is the last case I will show. It's a pretty big tumor. There's almost no ventricle here. The whole tumor is in the ventricle, vascular tumor. So these are the tumors which are challenging. We had twelve bottles of blood given to this patient because once you are in the tumor, there is no escape. It keeps on bleeding till you get the tumor out, and you have to be ready with blood. So this tumor was bleeding like hell. but we could finally control and i had to increase the topectomy because the tumor was too large and we had 15 bottles of blood transfused intra op into this patient if you see there's a big vein there and once you enter into this it is like entering the lion's den there is no return until you remove the tumor at the same time you have to watch the blood loss 
you have to have coordinated movements and keep replacing the blood. So there are times when you can lose your cool and this is after the tumor removal, everything settles down. We had to put two drains because I didn't know how much this tumor had come out. You get lost sometimes and that's the post-op scan. This patient had a deficit on one side for whom we gave hyperbaric oxygen therapy. He had, if you see hemiplegia almost on one side. So we gave him five days of hyperbaric and he did improve after hyperbaric, after five doses of hyperbaric. And that is the post-op scan of, he's holding his own board now, which he could not do before. That's the post-op scan. So this tumor was some, uh, it, it, it came as a choroid plexus malignancy. We sent it to Tata, our, our people also could not figure out what it is. So they have said it is a choroid plexus malignancy and uh, we have sent him back to Tata, although the tumor is out. So let's see how he does. So these are the complications. These tumors are difficult tumors. You can get a lot of complications and the post-op recovery period is very, very slow and you have to be ready for that. And they are technically difficult tumors. You have to know the anatomy and you have to have the 3D anatomy, which is more important. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. So, it was a craft, craftsmanship that we saw now. Now, the, I think the lecture is open. If there are any questions, I think we have got three minutes for the questions. So, so no. you had any problem with uh, the ones, uh, the colloid cysts which you had operated following uh, endoscopic excision, whether it was difficult or uh, or you had so a good plane? It was not difficult at all. It was very easy, except for the uh, capsule. Sometimes the capsule gets adherent to the foramen of Monroe. If you have done endoscopy initially, mm -hmm. the posterior part. Otherwise, it was a straightforward case. You can just deliver it. No issue. Uh, Vernon, uh, that last case that you showed, uh, where you transfused 12 bottles of blood, uh, I mean, that's kudos to your blood bank and uh, your support team and your anesthesia team. Uh, you didn't have any post-op issues with that massive transfusion? Not exactly, because we saw to it that FFP was also given. You just don't give blood. You give mm. FFP, you do yeah. the hematocrit. Hematocrit is mm. very, very important. And yeah. you have to uh, also uh, do not over-infuse fluids. Just give yep. blood and FFP. That is what instructions were given during the surgery. Only blood, FFP, no colloids. Because mm -hmm. colloids make your life miserable. It uh, yep. causes coagulation problems. Yeah. So that, that's a great, this one for your anesthesia and your uh, intensive care team. I mean, the support. Yes, that is very important. Because when you are on the tumor, if they don't do their job, because this patient's BP went to 70 systolic during yep. the surgery. If they can't do a proper job, the patient would be dead on the table. Yeah. So the confidence yes, of those guys is important. Uh, can I explain about this hyperbaric oxygen? You said this patient uh, recovered with hyperbaric. How yes. often you use and what yeah, is your indication it, of yeah. giving this? We have we have it in our wards. And I got a large series of these uh, patients who develop momentary weakness and improve. And even in head injuries, we are having a lot of patients who are showing improvement. We have already published our work in the Journal of Neurotrauma. <coughs> okay, so uh, we move on to the next talk. So uh, thank you, Vernon, sir. And thank you, Santosh Lard, sir. So I would like to invite, I think, Dev Pujari, sir. Is he there or is... I think Dev Pujari sir has just left to board the flight. Oh, he's there, he's there. So, uh, Rishikesh, you have to excuse me. Okay. I'm okay. happy to introduce Manas, uh, hmm. who is a well-known neurosurgeon uh, from Hyderabad, currently head of the department at the Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences. And he is going to talk about uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring, helping excision of supratentorial gliomas. Uh, somehow the time has not matched and I will have to be away. So okay. I'm sorry, but I look forward to listening to your talk later on catch up. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, Dr. Pujari, for keeping you waiting. And uh, um, I, I could join, but I didn't want to.
in a be in a hurry um, because I, i joined little i was little uh, skeptical of joining in time that's why i requested dr varnan to give his lecture before me no no um, i i'm sorry my my problem actually okay, okay. go ahead please okay. um i like to thank uh, professor uh, varnan to to uh, to invite to participate in this operative session uh, my talk is on 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 excision of glioma uh, where uh, uh, because i have taken a, a topic which uh, probably will be uh, use, useful for residents and upcoming residents because the most common surgery what we do after head injury is glioma and uh, most of the time uh, we do not uh, read uh, about the common surgeries we uh, we concentrated on complex surgeries at dr varnan showed many complex intraventricular tumors as means a series of uh, uh, cases uh, different varieties uh, but here i'll be just telling uh, uh, taking an example of glioma and telling the principle of glioma surgery how it can be made safer by uh, intra neuro monitoring i mean both anatomical monitoring and electrophysiological monitoring Uh, so i have a few uh, uh, slides explaining the principle as well as some video on it and and planning a surgery for a glioma is especially more important when it's in the eloquent area uh, because excision in the um, we know that the final outcome of the patient depends on the extent of excision and many times people go for supra maximal excision but in eloquent area one has to be cautious and then decide uh, one has to do maximal safe resection with minimal morbidity and for that one has to integrate both anatomical and functional and physiological studies for a safe resection like this patient who has a lesion of the glioma in the sensory motor cortex uh, normally we assume that the uh, if the um, we assume that anatomically like uh, if you see in the mri the hand knob which is the the precentral cortex which is area for the hand area or the m sign in the inferior frontal gyrus on the left side we assume it is it is for broca area or speech area or for the hook sign for the paracentral lobule and uh, we can see the bracket sign again for the central sulcus but does all the time the anatomy correlate with the function of the area which we have predicted and this is published long ago in 2007 there is a normal allocation what uh, in uh, the, the area which uh, we have attributed anatomically changes in patients with long standing tumors like uh, low grade glioma's or avms or in patients with epilepsy uh, they may be shifted to a typical uh, to a non eloquent area so in the brain we cannot assume that there is not that this is non eloquent area and do the surgery without uh, properly analyzing whether that area is really non eloquent or not what they published in 2007 that 30% of the young patients had the primary motor area in the post central gyrus that is the sensory cortex rather than in the pre motor cortex so one has to be careful uh, if you have a tumor in the sensory cortex one cannot assume it will be safe and patient will not have to have have deficit is always better to uh, do a pre op functional mri or intraoperatively do stimulation to confirm that you are uh, uh, operating in a safe area similarly in language if you look at the variability in the language cortex in the language cortex also there is a force and uh, this is published in uh, jns in 1971 that there is a 4 cm variability in the intraoperative speech arrest so it's a 4 cm is a quite wide area and again one cannot assume that it is it is not in the broca area so i can go, go with excision uh, on the left side uh, with the general anesthesia so or uh, means or one has to do pre operatively a functional mapping of the speech area before planning a surgery uh, under awake or under general anesthesia as i explained that the motor cortex also is variable the motor cortex can extend to normally the motor cortex is 1 cm in 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 anteroposterior length but it can go up to up to 2 cm anterior to the central call sulcus and it can go 1 cm behind the central sulcus so it's a wide area so it, this uh, variability in the eloquent cortex has to be 
kept in mind and this happens in 30% of the patient which is a very higher incidence to have variability to assume and operate. Not only you have anatomical variability, but depending on the age because of myelination, also it differs. And also the right vein does not, is not all the time same out like on the left. 40% uh, people have asymmetry of the brain hemispheres. And this also is a factor for uh, no, inconsistency of the eloquence of the area. So what is important? So when, when you have a, a, a chronic lesion like low grade lima, there is reorganizations due to plasticity. So the, the motor area or the speech area may be shifted to other center. And, and, and this depends on the duration of the, of the disease, uh, whether it's a tumor or it's an AVM or uh, like a, uh, acquired AVM long-standing lesion. So it can be shifted. So many times shifting helps in planning surgery because though sometimes you're operating on the motor cortex, if it is shifted, patient will not have any deficit following surgery if we had done the proper planning of surgery. This is called neuroplasticity, which we had published as a case report. This was an interesting case of an intractable epilepsy with right hemispheric hemiatrophy. This patient, a hemispheric dysplasia with polymicrogia area. Patient had intractable seizures, had very minimal uh, left hemiparesis we were debating should we operate or not because if you operate this patient may patient may land up with the hemiplegia but fortunately when it did a functional mri we saw that both the sides both the right and left activity was uh, localized on the left side and there is no activity on the right this may made us made our life easier so we could go ahead with the surgery and patient also post-op did not have an, any uh, additional deficit so tumor invasion, especially low grade, this cortical reorganization uh, not only helps us in reducing deficit, but also can cause problem in assuming uh, that non-eloquent area, uh, assuming the non-eloquence of many areas. So if we do a pre-operative uh, neurophysiological physiological testing and intraoperative neurophysiological test, uh, testing and correlate with the anatomy, that will help us in reducing significantly morbidity in eloquent area. As it is difficult, many times in low-grade glioma, it is difficult to define the margin between the tumor and the normal brain, uh, unlike high-grade glioma. In low-grade glioma, diet like ala or fluorescence is not so helpful. So especially in low-grade glioma, um, it, as they carry a very high incidence of post-op deficit, using uh, intra-op monitoring is, is essential to, uh, to reduce the uh, post-op deficit. So neuromonitoring has it has two types. One is electrophysiological monitoring, the function, and anatomical. Anatomically, the localization can be done with a pre-op functional MRI, and the anatomical displacement of the tracts also can be done with a DTI. This and the monitoring differs when one is offering doing a surgery for tumors or non-tumorous lesion like uh, calcification of AVMs or focal cortical displacement. The the Stimulation parameters differs in tumors and non-tumors. I'll tell our experience in the stimulation parameters what we found in non-tumors and tumors uh, together. It's not only important to look at the cortical function because most of the time we only look at the Broca's area, the motor cortex, but it's also important to look at the afferent and the efferent tract. One has to look at the corticospinal tract as if you preserve the cortex, but then damage the tract, patient will still have hemiplegia. So one has to know the orientation of the tracts, corticospinal tract in relation to the tumor, as well as where cognition is very important nowadays. Uh, the, associate, the, the orientation of the long association fibers, the, the orientation of the commissural fibers to the tumors to preserve them, and the association of the optic radiation to, uh, in uh, occipital tumors to preserve optic uh, visual pathway is important uh, during surgery. So that has to be analyzed before surgery to decide the trajectory, a safe trajectory and reduce morbidity. Like a functional MRI for uh, identifying the motor cortex, and a language for speech uh, area localization with language mapping preoperatively. As well as it's important to uh, uh, do a tractography to see whether the tracts are displaced or compressed by the tumor like in this case, or it is infiltrated. Because tumors which are infiltrated, 
they uh, they are difficult to exercise totally and one can land up in some form of deficit cognitive deficit or if it's cortical hemiparesis or hemianopia if if it's infiltrated if one attempts a total excision so studying the pre op scan and doing the surgery uh, with planning the surgery, total excision or subtotal depends on the tractography. And when you when uh, and this also helps in doing the surgery in taking the tumor en masse. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Vandan was telling, an interventricular tumor is very difficult as the CSF goes, the brain shift happens and neural navigation doesn't work. Similarly, in gliomas, when one does an internal decompression, as we were taught all these days, the, there is a brain shift. So then all this tractography doesn't help even if even if it's fed in the navigation. But then if we take out the tumor end mass work between the tumor and the normal interface and go like this, then navigation will be helpful till the end of surgery. So the glioma surgery should be done like a meningioma rather than like uh, internal decompression and excision of the surrounding brain. So in when, when somebody is planning a surgery for glioma, so preoperatively to for cortex for the functional MR for subcortical DTI and for vascularity to do an MRA and MRV. Uh, the other most important thing to preserve is the vascularity, the venous drainage in the artery of the surrounding brain, surrounding viable brain. If we assume that uh, uh, earlier we used to do a corticectomy along with the vessel and the vein, and that was impeding the vascular supply of the surrounding normal tissue, hence the morbidity was higher. So when you're planning surgery, it's always important to do an intervascular dissection, preserve all the um, vessels which are going through the tumor. And these things can be used intraoperatively by cortical stimulation, subcortical stimulation, and use navigation to uh, make the surgery safer. Intra monitoring can be of two types. One is free running, what is done continuous EG, especially in tumor associated with, a, with intractable epilepsy. The low grade tumors with intractable epilepsy, just removing the tumor, patient may, will come with seizures and go back with seizures. Patient will be unhappy. But if the patient has intractable seizures, has not been controlled with anticonvulsants perioperatively, always do the surgery with the epilepsy product protocol, do corticography and exercise, do a supramaxial excision till there is an 80% reduction of spikes. Uh, whereas, whereas in an eloquent area where preservation of function is important, one can do a, a motor evoked potential, stimulate the cortex, place the electrodes in, in the muscle so that with the lower current one can elicit response. Uh, I'll explain what is a monopolar and a bipolar and how it helps. If, if it's the lesion is around an optic tract, then one can use a VEP. And uh, SCCP is can be done to see phase revolve for identifying the central sulcus, but we don't do use it regularly. What you use is EEG and uh, EMG, motor error potential, and and VEP in our cases. Uh, stimulation of the cortex has been uh, uh, done from 19th century itself. Penfield in 1937 laid the foundation of intraphysiological monitoring technique. It was later in 1990, Berger et al. described a modification of the bi bipolar technique. Uh, and, and then it has, from then on, it has become very popular. But unfortunately, this does not have, uh, this gives a qualitative analysis of the mass movement, but it's not a specific muscle. Hence, even though we stimulate, though still patients post-operatively, 20 to 25%, they develop temporary deficit and then they improve. I'll take examples from the cases we have done. This is a case of a gliosis in the motor area and the uh, functional MR is uh, revealed. A lesion, uh, just motor cortex, just in front of it. There's a lesion in the motor cortex and, the, and in the um, motor area was just behind the lesion. And this is a lesion in sensory motor cortex. There are two techniques of stimulation. One uh, is uh, the um, Bipolar stimulation with a pen pill stimulator. Here you use an intensity of one can go to 4 to 10 million. This patient cannot go beyond 10, 10 or sometimes 15. The frequency is 60, it can go till 100 and gives a five digit phase of 1 millisecond. But when you use monopolar stimulation by using NIM Eclipse, one uses usually uh, places electrodes in the muscle. So whenever you stimulate the cortex, it picks up the EMG electrode, uh, the stimulation of the muscle. So at the lower current 
one can uh, identify the motor cortex. And what we saw that when we use this, even at a higher current in tumor lesion, we could not elicit because this machine did not offer a very high current stimulation, but this machine could offer high current stimulation. But then because we had the EMG, it can detect at a very low stimulation. When you do the low stimulation, the chances of developing intra seizures are also lies, uh, less. So, intra, so there is a comfort to the patient. There is no uh, problem of edema because of seizures during surgery. So doing uh, with a monopolar stimulation is, uh, is is probably better than doing a bipolar stimulation. Now, depending on the area, um, uh, what you're interested, one can uh, um, stimulate the leg or the face area and place the electrode in the face, in the hand and the leg to depending on the site of the tumor. So electrodes are placed depending on the area of interest. And then motor cortex stimulation is done, either both monopolar and bipolar. In addition to stimulating the cortex, one can also stimulate the tracts also. Uh, uh, as we go to the depth of the tumor, to preserve the tract, one can keep on stimulating uh, both the corticobulbar tract and the corticospinal tract to preserve them and uh, elicit the response and preserve, like at the uh, base of the tumor, uh, to know at what point one is to stop the decompression, this uh, subcortical stimulation is very helpful. The one has to remember that uh, one millimeter equals to one millimeter distance. If you are getting stimulation of five milliampere, that means you can take out at least four mm more or five mm more. But uh, if you are getting a stimulation at 10 milliampere, then there is a thickness of uh, one centimeter which is safe, one can be removed. So that, that is the rough uh, estimate, uh, uh, a technical, this thing, uh, practical importance of knowing doing of subcortical stimulation. And this is how the subcortical stimulation law looks like. But then if, if the stimulation reduces by amplitude by 50% or it is lost, or you need, need higher threshold for stimulating, one has to be careful and to stop it because that is the area. If you go still continue to do it, you'll have deficits. To do a safe resection, one has to understand the growth pattern of glioma. Most of the glioma, what you see are juxtacortical. They arise. Uh, at the junction of the cortex and the white matter is called juxtacortical. It can be juxtacortical or it can be subcortical. In the subcortical, they involve the long tract fibers. Whereas the juxtacortical, they, they grow in along the U fibers as shown in the yellow. So if the tumor comes as if the red uh, here starts here, then it goes along the U fibers to one gyre to the other gyre. So in this, Normally, what we were as a resident, we were taught that remove the cortex. First, do a corticectomy along with the vessel and the uh, artery and the vein. But the present concept is do not do a corticectomy, do a gyrectomy. Remove gyri and remove this gyri, work between sulcus to sulcus, intercircle, do suppile resection to preserve the vein and the artery and connect the tumor subcortically in the subcortical plane. So the tumor has to be taken en masse like this from one gyre to one to the other gyre, do gyrectomy, not cortisectomy, and do subpile intervascular dissection. So there are a few principles of doing a glioma surgery is preserve a cortical, the cortical uh, vein, preserve the sulcal artery by doing subpile dissection, preserve the long tracts, which comes below that, and then dissect from one sulcus to the other sulcus, do an intervascular from, uh, intervascular subpile dissection and avoid internal decompression. I told do an N, N mass or N block starting at the junction of the tumor with the normal brain. Do not do an internal decompression so that your information fed in the navigation helps you till the end. There is no brain shift. So this is a video of, of a glioma surgery in the insular glioma, which is involving the upper column. So as I explained to you, we use fluorescent to identify the tumor. The tumor is involving both the gyri, this and both the gyri here and here. Just remove separate gyri separately. Do a inter sulcal subpile dissection. The vessels, the veins and the vessels in the sulcus is preserved.
as it was going into the insula subpile dissection towards the sylvian fissure till i didn't want to identify the mca and the lenticular stride then dissect below the subsulcus juxtacortical area then and join it by doing the adjacent gyrectomy the vein passing was uh, going between the sul gyri was preserved as it is drains to the not the normal surrounding cortex here again it is done inter sulcal subpile dissection and once it reach the base of the sulcus internal decompression is done to connect both the gyri while working at this plane one then again use have to use the navigation with image injection so that and stim cortical stimulation intermittently so that you do not breach the normal and abnormal uh, area this is the sylvian vessels the insula And the lenticular stride vessels are identified coming out of the MCA. and that was the end of the surgery so this was the insular glioma involving the frontal operculum the lamen insulae and lenticular tried branches of mca are seen here and finally fluorescein uh, again uh, was used to look at the residual tumor the tumor also was going into the temporal opercula again the temporal opercula was excised so we do a trans opercula not trans sylvian and and then go below the subpile below the mca vessels to connect the frontal and the temporal opercula keeping in mind the depth that we do not do not transgress the strats this is what i was explaining that we use the navigation we use image injection so that under wherever the microscope is focused and we are do decompression we know that we we are at the uh, at the junction we should not transgress that this plane as seen in the picture for residents whenever you do decompression always work along the track if you are working medially the cortical spinal tract is vertically oriented so decompress vertically from top to bottom if you are working the inferior all the tracks is anteroposterior so decompress anteroposteriorly so one has to have a 3d orientation of all the tracts all around and try to decompress in that direction with parallel to the track whichever one we want to preserve yeah this is uh, another case again doing subpile dissection preserving all the small vessels as you see here the small cortical vessels subpile intervascular and intercercal excision and this is how it looks at the end the 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 vein connecting the sylvian vein to the cortical veins are preserved you can see here the vein in continuity and all the small arteries uh, cortical arteries draining into the mca also are preserved only the tumor is removed and you cross check with the uh, with the with the microscope focusing at each point that whether we have excised totally or not and this is how it looks at the end of surgery the the tumor bed with all the vessels so uh, draining and uh, supplying the adjacent normal structures
in addition to doing the vascular preserving the vascularity it is also important the other principle is interfascicular the seventh principle is interfascicular when especially one is operating near optic tract or when is one is worried about the language and uh, worried about the cognitive function then working in between the uh, inferior front uh, ifof or doing when one is doing a femoral uh, femoral lobe surgery preserving the ifof or preserving the optic tract one has to do a interfascicular trajectory so here it is the reason is the paraspinal paraspinal area with the low grade glioma with intractable seizure patient did not have any deficit and the uh, tractography showed that the tumor was medial to the tracts and, tra and tracts are normal so we planned a trajectory uh, medial to sir, the tracts hello two minutes sir yeah two minutes yeah we are over okay and and this is uh, at the end uh, means uh, this again another case where we use a track to preserve the uh, to plan the track and in this kind of cases we use a vep uh, to Uh, help us in stimulating the in identifying the area the the next point uh, is when if we, if we uh, integrate the this data in the navigation then we don't have to keep on searching the important area we can save time by stimulating directly the area which is uh, uh, detected in the pre op functional mri so that we don't have to keep on searching which is the motor cortex or which is the speech area during the surgery and especially in tumor with surgery with intractable uh, uh, intractable seizures it's important to do eeg to look for reduction of spikes at least 80% so that patient do not have post op seizures and the next important is vein preservation one can also do a venogram integrate it and and then plan the project the venogram before doing a skull so while planning craniotomy one can avoid doing a craniotomy on the vein so that accidental damage of the veins can be uh, prevented if when plan if uh, if it's on the left side in the broca's area then one has to plan an awake craniotomy in awake craniotomy one can do stimulation and do a uh, and do uh, identify the area especially in, in the speech uh, i'll not show the video but what we found was whenever we had operated with the tumors or non tumorous lesion the the intensity of current strength which we needed by the tumor was higher in the tumor the displacement was higher and um, and because the intensity of stimulation was many times in tumors we could not do stimulate in the pendril bipolar one but once we acquired the monopolar we have been able to uh, elicit motor response with higher currents in non tumors uh, the lesion the eloquent area shifting was less than tumors A, the difference was in tumors the post op deficit was of 20% in non tumors the post op deficit was 30% but they were temporary and they recovered in conclusion tumors required stimulation parameters but immediate functional outcome was better in tumors because the deficit was 20% and they recovered faster but the non tumor like epilepsy they took time to recover and uh, total excision of the tumor can be possible with an acceptable uh, outcome if one does both anatomical and physiological uh, mapping during surgery thank you for your attention thank you thank you manas for a wonderful presentation it was very good for the uh, residents they should know exactly what to do and what not to do when operating on especially eloquent areas and you have highlighted that in a beautiful way we have shown the technical problems also and uh, any comments or uh, questions from the other faculty anybody wants to make a comment so if there is uh, if there is uh, no comment then we shall go to the next presentation thank you manas and it's my proud privilege mm -hmm. to uh, welcome professor anil karapurkar who is a very senior and a stalwart of neurosurgery as well as interventional neuro radiology in our country and in the world he was a professor of uh, neurosurgery at the KEM hospital and i could uh, i can say that he was one of the persons who started interventional neurosurgery in india and i would say interventional neurosurgery because it was he who started getting the catheters inside the vessels and uh, he's a very hardcore academic uh, academician 
and uh, always there for all the uh, workshops and always there to teach and also to be a part of all the programs. Welcome, sir. And over to you to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Varnan. Can you hear me? Thank you, Varnan. Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Thank you, Varnan. Go ahead. Uh, wonderful uh, videos. The quality of the videos that I have seen have been excellent. Very, very good quality videos. Thank you, sir. As uh, Santosh Lado was saying, the craftsmanship of all of you guys is wonderful. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Rishikesh uh, Farsekar. He's going to talk about reconstruction of metal subtle artery aneurysms. Actually, for me, even today, MCA aneurysm is a surgical aneurysm as far as possible. Only if the patient refuses or if the patient cannot uh, undergo for, for whatever reason, do I recommend uh, endovascular treatment? So, Rushikesh is Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and one of the co hosts of this meeting. So, welcome, Rushikesh, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Vernon, sir, for uh, giving the opportunity to present the special remodeling techniques. So, I'll just present the video. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Rishikesh Karosekar. I'm the Associate Professor in Department of Neurosurgery at Sir J.J. Hospital, Mumbai. And today I would like to uh, talk on or show videos of vessel remodeling techniques for MC aneurysms. So this is the institute where I work. So MC aneurysms uh, form 20 to 25% of all intracranial aneurysm, which require intervention. Surgical clipping is still feasible in MC aneurysm uh, because of uh, their superficial and easy loca accessible location. Over the last few decades, the management strategies for intracranial aneurysms have shifted from surgical intervention to endovascular management. But uh, because of their superficial and easily accessible location, MC aneurysms are still the ones where uh, surgical clipping is still feasible. Also, uh, the complex nature of the anatomy of these aneurysms, the complex sacs, multilobe sac, and the uh, unfavorable uh, dome-neck ratio makes endovascular management of these aneurysms difficult. So surgical clipping is still uh, favor uh, favorable in these aneurysms. In literature also, there, uh, you won't find much of the studies which are comparing the endovascular management with surgical clipping, and uh, there is no... Uh, unbiased study which shows uh, endovascular management is superior to surgical clipping. So in absence of these studies, high occlusion rate and low retreatment rate, my, microsurgical clipping still remains the treatment of choice in these aneurysms. But mind you, it is not that simple uh, clipping uh, in these MC aneurysms because of the complex anatomy. Each and every case requires proper 3D visualization and uh, identifying the uh, perforates or distal artery arising from the neck or the dome and then uh, planning the clipping technique for these aneurysms. So in MC aneurysm, there are different techniques of uh, clip application ranging from simple clipping or multiple clips or clip reconstruction of the uh, parent vessel and then uh, trapping the aneurysm with uh, bypass techniques. So I'll be showing some videos of uh, different uh, clip application techniques, or uh, you can say uh, vessel remodeling techniques to maintain the distal patency of the uh, MCA. So coming to first technique, that is the clip reconstruction technique of the vessel wall. So this is a case of giant uh, MC aneurysm on right side, uh, which we had done in our institute. So in uh, MC aneurysm, our first step is opening the sylvian, which is different compared to other aneurysm. Here you have to go from proximal to distal. So we have to go directly uh, and take control of the ICA, identify the ICA, and then gradually come back to define the MCA. So now we have identified here the internal carotid artery and then gradually coming back to identify the MCA. And once you see the aneurysm sac, most of these cases where there is an intraparanoid clot which guides us towards the aneurysm sac or towards the aneurysm. Once the sac is seen, first thing is to take a proximal control with a temporary clip 
as a dissection of aneurysm sac can lead to rupture of these aneurysms or damage to the other end vessels or the vessels which are arising from the dome or the neck of the aneurysms. And once the sac is completely defined, what we are doing is putting a permanent clip which is put right across the neck of the aneurysm. Once that is done, the other end vessel is being gradually separated from the sac. You remove the temporary clip, there is no filling of the aneurysm here. The other end vessel is dissected and then a reinforcement clip is, horizontal reinforcement clip is put again over the uh, permanent clip. You can see proximal and the distal vessel and then multiple perpendicular stack clips are put to completely obliterate the sac and maintain the distal patency of the vessel. It's a beautiful reconstruct and this is intraoperative ICG. You can see the proximal as well as the distal filling very well in this. So this is the clip reconstruction technique for large or giant MC aneurysm. Another case where we have done a clip reconstruction, a 40-year-old male, hypertensive male, who had come with a ruptured large right-sided MC aneurysm. You can see, and he had a con concurrent ACOM aneurysm also. So a right terrional craniotomy was planned uh, to treat both the aneurysms simultaneously. So first we went in for the ACOM aneurysm and then came back to clip reconstruct the MC aneurysm. So opening of the dura and then opening of the sylvian. Here we went distal to proximal and the ACOM is clipped here first. Then the MCA is identified. The sac, huge sac of the aneurysm can be seen. So we apply a proximal temporary clip. So the proximal control is taken and then we went to dissect the large sac. As it was the right side, some of the parenchyma can be sacrificed to uh, identify the sac. The sac is defined gradually, you can see the perforator arising from the dome, which is which makes the things very difficult in these aneurysms. You have to preserve all these perforators and then develop a plane between the sac and the brain parenchyma. Pressure has to be gentle not to rupture the sac. So after identifying the sac completely, and the neck is defined here, you can see it's a proximal and this is, these are the distal vessels which are arising. So we put temporary clips distally. So put the distal vessels which are arising in temporary clip and then we aspirated the sac so as to decompress the sac. The sac is completely decompressed with aspiration of the blood. It was not a thrombosis blood in here. Again, redefining the anatomy of the sac is very important. 3D anatomy has to be redefined. And then we removed the distal temporary clip and you can see that the sac is filling again. So the aneurysm was filling from the distal again. So we reapplied the temporary clip. We compress the sac again. And now we are defining the neck completely and put a temporary clip, which is right across the neck, permanent clip, sorry, right across the neck. It's a reinforcement clip over it. Is a horizontal reinforcement clip and then multiple horizontal stack clips to completely obliterate the sac. Stack is not still decompressed completely. You can see it is still filling. So then you have to put multiple clips here. So these are horizontal multiple clips, stack clips. Then 
perpendicular stack cliffs also put with preservation of the vessel which is arising from the dome of the sack, multiple clips perpendicular to the clip at the neck have been put here. So this is the clip reconstruction technique. This is another clip which is being put. This is a fenestrated clip going right across and preserving the vessel which was arising from the dome. So, a mini clip for a small residue. And this is the interoperative fluorescein angiography to see the complete filling of the vessel, exclusion of all ACOM as well as the MC aneurysm. Then the closing of the dura. The second type is multiple clip technique. So this is a large MC aneurysm. Sylvian dissection, going identifying the IC, the technique is same, coming distally. Now this is the aneurysm which can be seen, the sac of the aneurysm and multiple clips with a vessel adherent to the neck. So you have to completely define the sac gradually. And the clip right across the neck has been Line. And then we are dissecting the sac. You have to see if there is any vessel which is coming. So if the vessel is coming between, then you have to readjust the clip to preserve the other end vessels. And then we put mini clips so that this is the reinforcement clip which has been put, but still there are blips. So we have put multiple mini clips to obliterate these blips and preserve the proximal vessel. You cannot obliterate the proximal vessel. And then the sac is cut. So and this is the interoperative DSA, which is showing very well distal filling. You can see proximal as well as distal filling. So another case of large MC aneurysm with the ACOM aneurysm, just done recently in the opening of Dura, in the Sylvian, identifying the ICA. This is the ACOM aneurysm. The clipping of the ACOM first. And then coming back for the MC aneurysm, dissecting the sylvan distally, wide opening the sylvan is very important. So this is the middle cerebral artery which has been identified. And before dissecting the sac, you have to put a temporary clip application. Then you go for defining the permanent clip right across the neck. You can see the distal vessel. And this is the neck. So this is put right across the neck. And then we go to define the huge sac, which is aspirated to decompress it. The reinforcement clip has been put. Then gradually separating the sac from the brain panel. You can see the vessels which are at the end on the opposite side to the sac, which have to be preserved. You have to develop a plane between the sac and the brain parenchyma. You cannot compromise the vessel which are at the end as they are distally supplying the brain parenchyma. You have to separate them gradually. So, gradual dissection and the constant irrigation is very important here. Cut, uh, cutting the arachnoid adhesions. And once the aneurysm is completely defined. So, now we have put a fenestrated clip to obliterate this part of the sac, but there is a M3 branch which is arising at the neck. We have to preserve that. So, 
Use of an inserted clip is important in these AMC aneurysms. So this is going right across the, again, obliterating the sac distal to it. So this is the fenestrated clip. And this is the intraoperative fluorescein angiography. You can see the distal filling very well. See? And then this is a simple clip technique. So this is a moderate size left-sided MC aneurysm. Sylvian dissection. And then coming back to define the MCA gradually, opening the sylvian proximal to distal. Separating the arachnoid adhesions. This is the sac of the aneurysm. Gradually separate the adhesions of the sac with the brain parenchyma because of the bleed. And then putting a temporary clip proximally before completely defining the sac. Then we go remove the distal clip and see the filling. Completely define the aneurysm sac. Neck of the aneurysm is identified. And then you put a permanent clip right across the sac right across the neck of the aneurysm. Remove the temporary clip. This is the reinforcement clip. Just to be secure. Cutting of the sac from both sides of the aneurysm. So, another case of MC aneurysm where the wall uh, or neck was atheromatous. So, here the important is during application of uh, the clip, these aneurysms can rupture. So the pressure of the clip pressure can rupture these aneurysms. So you have to be very gradual when you clip these aneurysms. So you can see the aneurysm is completely calcified wall. The neck is also calcified as a sac is also calcified. It is completely defined here. And a curved clip right across the neck, simple clip. Simple curved clip is put across the aneurysm, but it has to be gradually closing, watching for any rupture. You have to gradually close it. So this is gonna. You know, Simple clipping technique, and this is another case of ACOM aneurysm with AMC aneurysm. First, the ACOM was clipped, and then we came back after clipping of the ACOM to just put a simple clip over this MC aneurysm. You can see a small MC aneurysm. Simple. Clip is applied, single clip. So these are various techniques of clip reconstruction or simple clipping of the MC aneurysm. To conclude, complex anatomy of these aneurysms, such as broad neck, complex multi-lobe sac, feeding arteries arising from the sac makes them difficult to manage endovascularly.
superficial, easily accessible location, wide sylvan fission make them favorable for microsurgical clipping. Yet, the tailored surgical approach is often required for each and every case. The aim of these cl uh, clipping these aneurysm is to prevent re-rupture and reconstruct the vessel caliber close to the parent vessel and to maintain the distal circulation. Thank you. Thank you, Ushikesh. A very nice presentation. Uh, have you had to, you have not shown any case where you had to excise the aneurysm and re-anastomose the cut segments of the middle cervical branches, M1, M2, M2 or M3. You haven't had anywhere you had to do that. No, no, no. Okay. Today we have a very good device called the contour and the web for bifurcation MCA aneurysm. This used to be very difficult for us. But yes. now with this, we are able to treat these aneurysms. But what you have shown are excellent examples where surgery is what is required. And all of these are ruptured aneurysms. So these are all uh, very well done. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I didn't see whether there were any questions in the chat box. Let me just see. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Of course. Word, uh, yes. Uh, no, I, I had only only two uh, comments. One, one means very good video and very good collection of uh, aneurysms. And you you have very high incidence of multiple aneurysms. So, what is the incidence of multiple aneurysm in in your hospital? And uh, the second question was uh, the first aneurysm. Uh, what you had shown, uh, you had put four clips. Uh, that was not a giant aneurysm. So uh, I want when there should be a reason why you had used four horizontal and two vertical clips in that the first uh, video. Uh, the and first the third, and uh -huh. let me I'll finish all the three questions. Okay, okay. The third was uh, whenever there's a giant, I saw that all the time you place a clip in the neck and then go for the dissection of the fundus. Uh -huh. uh, when you when you have a large uh, aneurysm and you place in the neck, yeah, and the fundus is not dissected, usually the clip slips on to the parent vessel. So uh, okay. initially I was doing that, and then now that is why now I change my technique. That I first I first dissect the fundus, start putting stacking clips from the fundus downwards. Instead of going from below up, I come from above down, so that I don't have to put temporary clip uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, means clip uh, slipping into the parent vessel and causing post op deficits are uh, less. So what you do it uh, for a ruptured aneurysm, Manas? Huh? These are ruptured aneurysms. I would not dare go for the fundus in a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, no, ruptured or un unruptured yeah, also. Ruptured, in, in ruptured, not, in a, uh, in ruptured means, as, as I saw, means you, when you take out the uh, subpile dissection of the cortex, you can you preserve still the You to go for the neck, do a tentative clipping first. Tentative clipping, if required, then readjust. It's I think it's easier rather than get into the fundus and, uh, you know, and land up in a soup. Yeah, no, most of the giant aneurysms are usually thick and partially thrombosed. Uh, yeah, if it's a they're, thin no, wall... They're even worse if they're partially thrombosed, in my opinion. In the, in the partially thrombosed, only it, it slips into the parent vessel. That is what uh, is my... Uh, means yeah, I have you can the readjust. You can, after excision, you can even readjust the clip. That's what we feel. Because coming from the fundus would be slightly difficult in a thrombosed aneurysm. Because you will find that most of the aneurysm is thrombus. Unless you excise it or remove the thrombus, you won't be able to get to the clips on the fundus. That's good. Anyway, uh, it's your may I say one thing? Yeah. Actually, I, I think he's not using a temporary clip on M1. That is what makes life difficult. If you put a temporary clip on M1, yeah. the aneurysm becomes soft and much easier to put a clip on at the neck, even in a giant aneurysm. So, probably Manas does yeah. not use a temporary clip. Uh, no, because many times in the atherosclerotic uh, uh, plaque in the neck and it's a thick wall, uh, I I try to avoid putting a clip in the neck uh, and, and thick wall aneurysms, so this slips on, onto the parent vessel. That is true. Very thick walls, the aneurysm, yeah. the clip does slip down onto the parent vessel. That's true. But going with the fundus in a ruptured aneurysm may be difficult as Norman is saying because if you rupture the aneurysm and you have no control, then you don't she will be in big trouble. Yeah, even if you go through the brain, even if you go through the brain, you still would have a very uh, big trouble trying to control the brain. Yeah, if 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 you rupture like it collapses, you can always put a clip on the where it is ruptured and it stops. 
Yeah, but it become messy. Yeah. Yeah, both of them. Ah, uh, interestingly, we thought the giant might be thrombus, but both of them were not thrombus. Both are both are better because you can see the blood in the. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are not thrombus. The vertical clip manas is to reinforce the other two clips. The vertical clip it acts as a reinforcing the, the closing pressure of the other two horizontal clips. Sometimes the horizontal clip is not more more than enough. If you see, that so means after ICG, even if it the aneurysm doesn't fill, do you put the clip on? Yes. Means how do you decide? Like was it was it filling after ICG? Yes. If, if there is a partial, it? if there is a partial dog here which you see, then it is better to put in the vertical clip. One more suggestion would be to do a post-operative CT or a post-operative DSA, CTA, or a DSA to confirm that you have actually clipped the aneurysm and all the branches are visible. Yeah. yeah, Doppler also is helpful, which is hardly any expense, two lakhs or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rishikesh, over to you. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Manas sir, and thank you, Karapurka sir. So we move on to the next talk. And for that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rahul Malli, sir, the consultant neurosurgeon, NMC Super Speciality Hospital in Abu Dhabi, UAE, and uh, our own ex-associate professor in JJ also. So over to you, Malli, sir. Yeah. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for previous uh, talk was one of the very interesting talks, uh, Rishikesh, I should say. And thank you, Dr. Vernon, for uh, organizing uh, such a good uh, uh, operative session. Uh, really, really thrilling session, I should say that. So now I would like to call uh, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, Lakshmikant Bopley. He is an assistant professor uh, when uh, Georgia Hospital. Presently, he is working as an, a consultant neurosurgeon in Adar Hospital in Nanded. Uh, he is going to be talking on uh, surgery of ACOM aneurysm, another complex aneurysm uh, which uh, needs uh, uh, planned uh, 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 pre-operative uh, approach. So, Lakshmi Khan Bopre, floor is yours and enlighten us with the ACOM aneurysm surgeries. Dr. Lakshmikan, the floor is yours. Yeah, Lakshmikan, you can start. You are not audible, Lakshmikan. Lakshmikan, the floor is yours. Lakshmikan? I think there are some problems in the uh, period. Lakshmikant, you are uh, you're still muted. Yeah, Harish, uh, Rahul. Yeah. There is some problem in Nanded and there's some net problem. So what we are doing is we are running the presentation from here. Okay. Lakshmikant, can you hear us? We can't hear you. I can see he is muted. No, I was has... muted. Unmute yourself. He has muted himself. Hmm. You can so send a chat message. You can write something in the chat chat box. Click click on the audio. Mute. Go towards mute and see. I uh, you uh, you can see that. Ah uh, no, I don't know whether he can hear me. That there's a microphone. Uh, no, it's so hey, can I mute chat it again? Mute chat it arrow at the clicker.
can the host unmute his uh, audio? We are trying to run the presentation from here. Uh, no, but uh, he is still muted. He's, so I'm just yeah, wondering he, whether the. Yeah, I don't know whether his internet is working, but he's uh, seen. No, he's. His, you can see his video, so the, the seeing an audio shouldn't be a problem then. Can the host unmute him? Mm, actually, is, he is not uh, mute, sir. It, basically, his audio is not been properly selected. His system audio is not selected. That is his problem. Okay. Uh, uh, you let him run the presentation, no? हाँ, तो वो प्रेजेंटेशन रन कर जम्स एनकॉर्डेड न्यूरोसिटिकल कैक्टर्स एंड अकाउंट्स पर प्रेजेंटेशन नहीं है तेरे प्रेजेंटेशन शेयर करना प्रेजेंटेशन शेयर कर शेयर द प्रेजेंटेशन शेयर योर स्क्रीन देस ऑप्शन ऑफ शेयर एट द बॉटम या ओके या Okay, sir. Yes. I mean, put the other device off. Put the put the other device off if you are using one device. Rishikesh. Yes. Tell him to put the other device off. This one person or microphone should be on. So the aim of the surgery is total occlusion of the aneurysm site. Uh, please uh, use the other device that you have next to you. The disturbance is because of that. Can you can you stop the audio of the other device and, and start the slide show? show. Yeah, uh, that's right. Hello. We can't hear him. Hmm, I hear that, na. Ah, Rishikesh. Yeah, yes. Ah, uh, you do one thing. You sh sh take a screenshot of your screen and show him exactly which button he needs to unmute. Okay. Okay. Anyway, what is showing uh, is the right-sided approach, Rahul. Yeah. It's a right terrional craniotomy. Basically, these are all ruptured aneurysms which normally come to our department. And uh, here we are dissecting the sylvian. The brain is pretty tight if you see most so of these aneurysms. So how do you decide the which side to approach? Yeah, it depends upon the dominant A1. Mm -hmm. If the A1 is dominant on the right side, then it's better. To go from the right side. If the A1 is hypoplastic, then we go on the opposite side. So because that would be the feeding uh, vessel. Okay. So here we are identifying the optic nerve. Then I, what we do is first we go for the lamina terminalis. If it is you know too tense, open the lamina terminalis. And here we, we are taking our temporary control first on the A1 of the opposite side. Okay. So these are all ruptured aneurysms. So we do a temporary control before dissecting the neck and the sac. So if you see here, we 
do a temporary control on both side and then go for a dissection of the sac because if it ruptures it is a problem so here we are then moving up you see the a1 a2 junction now we do not use retractors because counter traction can uh, rupture the aneurysm so here you are seeing the a1 a2 junction and that is the dissected neck there you see the a2 almost kissing the aneurysm it is important to dissect the complete edge and sometimes what i do is i go behind the a1 a2 to see whether the aneurysm is going down also sometimes goes down so this is a straightforward clipping at the base of the acom with the two a2s preserved so i'm just we are using a silicon paddy again no retractors fixed retractors so now once you do that you can dissect the whole fundus can shrink the fundus also sort of a reinforcement clip here so important thing is to since it's a ruptured aneurysm it is better to have temporary clipping then we open the lamina terminalis because there are always these patients land up with hydrocephalus later on so open it and uh, remove the clots in the optico carotid cistern also to clear the clots and uh, important for acom is to do a complete dissection you cannot do a half dissection you see the a1 is pretty much in spasm and the a1 on the right side is a bit in spasm on the left side it is okay so one can use papaverin that is what we do after at the end of the procedure and then we close that's the post op scan it's a post op angio and that's the patient So this is another patient, 68 year old male, hypertension, smoker, sudden headache. So this is quite a large aneurysm there. You see on the CT angio. So here we we'll have to sort of reconstruct that neck. because it is the wide and broad neck that's the position since uh, the right the left one was dominant we decided to go from the left side left side it comes slightly difficult because you need to retract with your we don't use retractor so we use the forceps because the forceps if you are right handed is in your right hand and you we use the silicon paddy again so clearing the blood of the sylvian here then getting to the optico carotid cistern and then identifying the optic nerves on both sides and one has to dissect on both sides so you have to even it might if it, it might be hypoplastic on the other side you should be able to see both the a1s so that's the trick of acom surgery you have to identify and see the whole edge both a1s both a2s and uh, it helps you also to plan how to put your clip now if you see this aneurysm it cannot be seen that's the a1 of the opposite side 
still I'm taking a temporary clip there, although it's hypoplastic. Because it's a large aneurysm, I will have to dissect this aneurysm. So that's the artery of Hugna, which has to be preserved, especially on the left side. Temporary clip application. And then gyrus excision. And uh, you have to then move towards dissecting the A1, A2 junction. This aneurysm is almost kissing the A1, A2 junction on both sides. So you have to preserve all this vasculature. Here I had to go for the A2 also because I could not see the upper limit of the aneurysm. So just to be safer and prevent any rupture while dissecting because there is a good cross filling. And then here we are going below. That's what I, you have to sometimes go below the A1 and A2. You see the opposite side A2 also. So the important thing in ACOM aneurysm is to see all the vessels around. If you cannot identify, then you might take some perforators in the clip and then life becomes difficult. So I'm just trying to see whether you can get the clip around here because it's a wide neck aneurysm. So trying to gauge whether we can clip it around and you can do a suction decompression once the temporary clips are applied so that you can collapse the aneurysm and see. Here we are using a fenestrated clip now because you have to preserve the A1, A2 junction. So you can't get a straight clip across here. You will end up taking one of the vessels maybe the A2. So fenestrated clip, ring clip is a good option here to preserve the ACOM as well as the A1, A2 junction. And uh, the Hubna artery is seen well feeling on the left side. Sometimes you have to readjust this clip because it uh, creates a little bit of traction on the A2. And we are uh, aspirating the aneurysm to see if it is filling. So we are removing the distal Temporary clips. And then you can dissect the aneurysm sac. You can also see the ruptured area there. That's the ruptured area. So a reinforcement clip, because this is quite a big aneurysm. Sometimes one clip might not work as well. We are putting it between the two A2s. This can be a straight clip now because you have already protected the A1, A2 junction. Sometimes removal of the clip is difficult, left side. So we have to use your left hand instead of your right hand to remove the clip. And we are not using any retractors. So you can you have to train the left hand also to be used simultaneously. And removing of all these clots, because these clots create a lot of problems. They give rise to spasm. So move the clots around, move the spasm. If you see any vessel does not like to be touched, the moment you touch the vessel, it goes into spasm. So that's the fluorescein angiography. Always do the fluorescein angiography before you clip and after. to see the dynamics. Opening of the lamina terminalis.
as the post op scan. That's the angio, showing a good filling even from the other side. This is the patient post operatively taken for a round in the wards, and that was before discharge. He doesn't want to be filmed. <laughs> this is the third case, another aneurysm, ACOM. If you see, it's a brista aneurysm. These aneurysms are tricky. Brista aneurysms are tricky because you don't get a neck to clip. So, again, dissecting the edge of the aneurysm uh, of the complex, ACOM complex, going all around. Here we could see the aneurysm first, so we decided and tried to see whether we could do it without putting a temporary clip. So we went in straight for the aneurysm blister. But here we did a vertical clipping to reconstruct the ACOM because otherwise we would have taken the ACOM down. So that's the blister. So you have to take a little bit of the ACOM along with this blister, otherwise it will rupture. And there is a small blister on the ACOM A2 junction on that side which we use the mini to reconstruct. And the post-op DSA is seen on the side. So here you, it's a sort of a multiple clipping technique. If it's a blister aneurysm, you might need a multiple clipping technique. One clip does not take the whole uh, neck opening of the lamina terminalis. This patient had an MCA also was taken. So we had to clip the MCA also along that ACOM. So as Manas said, uh, we are seeing more of these, uh, you know, dual aneurysms. I don't know why. This guy was a smoker. It is known to be uh, common in smokers. Uh, more in males than in females in our series. So... Of the aneurysm which we are seeing, we are seeing uh, uh, anterior circulation, posterior circulation, means dual aneurysms. It is happening more because I think, I don't know why exactly. This is another patient, a downward based ACOM aneurysm. So here we are doing a gyrus rectus excision. Here it is slightly deep, the A1 is slightly deep, so one has to open the sylvian completely to get to this A1 for control. It's a right-sided approach. And uh, when you see this, you have to be a bit worried. There could be, you know, an impeding rupture. When you see something red there at the base, always be worried and preferably be ready with a temporary clip. Ask the staff nurse to be ready with a temporary clip. And this is what happens sometimes. So this is when you try to dissect close to the fundus and the uh, aneurysm goes boom. So you got to get the bearings back and you have to go for a temporary clip first. So here, we're trying to get the temporary clip, but it is not, you know, sort of helping. So the mistake here is that uh, the A1 was not properly dissected first. Okay. And now we are dissecting the A1. There we have kept a temporary clip on the 
SAC and now we are dissecting the A1 and the A2 junction, trying to figure out what is happening. And uh, also trying to get the A1 of the opposite side. So once an aneurysm ruptures, first of all, you lose your bearings. You have to get oriented again. And then this was a blister aneurysm again. So you have to get your bearings right. So that's the aneurysm which is seen. So once you have the temporary clip, then you are in control a bit. And if you see here, it is going close to the ACOM behind also. So here we can take a sort of a curved clip and uh, take the aneurysm neck. That's the post-op ICG intra-op and the post-op angio. So this is the patient which we did by supra uh, orbital small craniotomy. So one can do this procedure if the brain is not too tight and if there's not much of SH and if the patient comes later <coughs> after the rupture and is well preserved, then you can do it supraorbital, straightforward clipping by dissecting one side. It's the left-sided approach. I use a temporary clip though. Removal of the temporary clip and then checking with an ICG. So the ICG and the fluorescein dive comes in very handy while operating on ACOM aneurysm. So here, another fenestrated clip is being used because it is coming from the base of the ACOM. <clears throat> Temporary clip is put already. Sometimes you don't get the right size of the fenestrated clip and that becomes very difficult. Here we are trying to get the fenestrated clip down That is showing the aneurysm occluded. You can see the perforators below also preserved. So fenestrated clip is very, very useful when you are working around the A1 and A2 junction. If the aneurysm is having a little bit of neck in the A1, A2 junction. Another case, right-sided approach. You can already see that aneurysm 
pointing out there but you have to go on the other side also so a complete dissection is very very important both sides as far as acomus go <clears throat> this is a sort of a blister aneurysm again <clears throat> We prefer to use this dissecting forceps with irrigation. <clears throat> this is a forceps, a fine dissecting forceps, rather than using the ball dissector, because it uh, keeps the aneurysm wet with irrigation. Again, clip reconstruction of the acom, multiple clips because the neck is very close to the A1 A2 junction. Sometimes you cannot get the A1 A2 junction, and this is a multiple clip <coughs> application and reconstruction of the ACOM. <coughs> and that's the A2 it's on both sides, opening of the lamina terminalis. <laughs> So the important thing is to have a lax brain at the end. Although initially you do not get a lax brain, you have to open the cisterns widely, drain the CSF, and then work on an ACOM aneurysm. So that, and uh, sometimes permanent <coughs> retractors produce a lot of counter traction and can, uh, you know, initiate the rupture of the aneurysm. Here, if you see, we are using the silicon paddy just to retract with the suction, dynamic retraction. So that there is no tension on the vessels. There is no uh, tension of uh, retraction on the vessels. So that sometimes when you dissect, you can rupture the aneurysm. So that is the ICG. So to conclude, aneurysm at the ACOM area, you need uh, to study the angiograms very well. You need to plan your trajectory and you have to expose the whole a complex of ACOM. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I should say a nice treasure trove of ACOM aneurysms. I have two questions. <clears throat> One is, do you still see any role for an interhemispheric approach in ACOM aneurysms? Uh, and not, the second, yeah. yeah, 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 tell me please. Not exactly, Rahul. Interhemispheric hmm. approaches would be if they are more towards the A2, okay. going upwards. And if it was, uh, we use it only for DACA aneurysms now. Okay, that's what I said. So you, at the moment, you don't see any role no. for, it's almost like. If second, it's a frank ACOM, no. And uh, which direction you find the most difficult to handle? The direction of the aneurysm? Inferior, of the four. yeah. Inferior. Posterior inferior is the most difficult because you have to go under. I had shown one case. Yeah. So you have to go under the A1, A2. Otherwise, you will be in a, a, you know, fool's paradise. You will think you yeah. have clipped the aneurysm and it, you won't get the whole neck. Any reason why the uh, asymmetry of A1 is more often seen in aneurysms compared to other stop, patients? Stop, stop, stop. Sorry? Why do you, what is the reason you think the ACOM asymmetry is more common seen among aneurysm patients compared to a normal uh, uh, patients of uh, other pathology. Yeah, I think it is the uh, anomaly of that circulation dynamics which causes the aneurysm. If you have a hypoplastic A1, mm. then there are high chances Hello. that the flow dynamics will change and produce an aneurysm. The same as system is real take real take. Second option. Rishikesh, Rishikesh. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vernon. A yeah. wonderful yeah. explanation. Yeah. Great video. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Any Karan questions Gupta, from please. other panelists? Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, please, sir. Go ahead. We are talking about multiple aneurysms. Yes, sir. So when you have A1 
Acom and MCA, which is the one which has ruptured most often? Acom. Yeah, that's what we have been always teaching that it is the Acom which always ruptures mm. when there are multiple animals. Yeah. And we have more females than males. And you seem to be having more multiple annuals. That is true. Yeah. We don't have so many multiple. We do have multiple annuals, but perhaps about 20%, not more than that. And if it is on the same side, you treat both in the yes. same side. Yeah. But supposing you have bilateral MCA and ACOM, then what do you do? <laughs> yeah, or we'll go for the ruptured one first. Sir. I'll go for the ruptured one first. Depending upon where the SAH lies, if the SAH is more in the frontal area, go for the ruptured one. And uh, uh, if we can access, normally it is difficult to access an MCA and aneurysm from the other side. ICA, yes, ICA we have done, accessing it from both sides, one side, and then uh, dissecting till the other side. Uh, we, we have done 22 cases of contralateral aneurysms, uh, either in ICA paraclinate or till M1 segment, not in the MCA bifurcation. Oops. Yeah. But the incidence of multiple aneurysm varies depending on what is the methodology the hospital does. I think Dr. Vernon does uh, angio for all his cases. Yeah. Uh, that is why, means in the literature also, it varies from 15 to 30 uh, percent. People who uh, operate with CT angio, their incidence is, is less than 10 percent. So probably they miss, I think. Yes, we have to do a DSA. It's quite high. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Vernon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, is Dr. Nitin Dange there? So, for the last uh, <laughs> presenter today, I'd like to invite Dr. Nitin Dange. Is he around? Nitin, are you there? If you're not there, then I will uh, call upon uh, Dr. Mayuresh Hinduja, who is also the co organizer of today's program, to talk about the most favorite thing of the neurosurgeon. We had left it for the last. CP angle surgery. So over to you, Mayur. Good evening, everyone. Uh, myself, Mayur Shinduja. I will be presenting surgery for CP angle schwannomas, a noble position design. Uh, this is the institute where I work, JJ Hospital. Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, traditional uh, lateral position, but there were some difficulties like continuous suction, aspiration of the blood, and CSA was required. Patient shoulder was coming in the surgeon's way, so we have designed a lateral semi-sitting position. In this position, there is more working space and the shoulder is away from the surgeon. It does not come in the way. In this position, the, uh, play, play, the patient is placed in lateral tilt position with back flex to 45 degrees up and head is tilted towards the opposite shoulder by 20 degrees. In the video below, we can see the patient is strapped and uh, we can tilt the patient sideways intraoperatively as well as the backup is given. Plus, we can uh, take the back down in this way intraoperatively if we require. So this patient is uh, this position is more comfortable to the surgeon while operating as compared to a lateral position as in our experience. Now these were the tools: endoscope, microscope, and obviously neuromonitoring was used in our cases. This was a uh, male with right-sided hearing loss who came with tinnitus and imbalance while walking for last one year. That was the incision marks, transverse and sigmoid sinus was marked, a retromastoid uh, S-shaped incision was marked, and that was the position given for patient. Uh, this is a video with full demonstration starting from the exposure. A lazy S-shaped incision was taken, muscles were dissected, exposing up to the foramen magnum. High-speed drill was used, three burrows were made after craniotomy, that is the transverse sigmoid uh, junction, sinus junction was exposed. After opening the dura, first of all, we have to decrep, uh, decompress the opening cisterna magna, releasing as much as CSF possible so that the cerebellum falls and we don't have to retract too much. 
facing silicon patty as we have seen in the uh, tumor the tumor was cystic decompressing the cystic component first after this next we will go for the lower portion of the tumor that is uh, adjacent to the lower cranial nerve we separate the tumor from the lower cranial nerve first Mr. Magna, releasing as much as CS as possible so that the cerebellum falls and we don't have to retract too much. Facing silicon patty, as we have seen in the uh, tumor, the tumor was cystic, decompressing the cystic component first. After this, next we will go for the lower portion of the tumor that is uh, adjacent to the lower cranial nerve. And that is the upper portion of the tumor adjacent to the fifth nerve, that the um, nerve which is broadest and broader, that is the fifth nerve at the upper end of the tumor. After separating the lower cranial nerves, then we will separate the tumor with sharp dissection of arachnoid towards the upper end, that is fifth nerve separated from the tumor. After separating uh, after fifth nerve, decompression of the nerve is done with the help of the tumor is done with the help of QSA. We can see here with uh, good release of CSF, there is minimal retraction required. That is opening of dura near the pitreous bone, uh, near the internal acoustic meatus. Dural flap is elevated. <laughs> High speed diamond drill is used to drill bone near the uh, meatus. Uh, here continuous irrigation is very important. Removal of tumor from the meatus is done. Next, next step will be to search for the facial nerve. Again, QSA is used for the decompression of tumor. Piecemeal excision of tumor from the after separating from the cerebellar surface. Coagulation and piecemeal excision of the tumor from the cerebellum surface to decompress the tumor. Separating the tumor from the brainstem anteriorly. Again, piecemeal excision. Gradual separation from the brainstem and piecemeal excision so that there is minimal traction on the brainstem. Minimal traction and again piecemeal excision of the tumor. And that's the uh, brain stem separated from the tumor. That's basilar uh, um, uh, artery. Behind we can see the ICA loop. So this is final uh, resection that is seventh now separated from the tumor. Completely bare basilar artery over the brainstem. That is fifth now, sixth now, and down we will see the seventh now. Next step is to pack the exposed area with fat and glue 
uh, muscle and glue achieving hemostasis with flow seal Over the drill meatus, we usually put, and this is enhanced with glue. After this primary dural closure with intermittent rolling, and bone is kept back. That's the patient post-op and post-op MRI. Next is a 43-year female who came with right-sided weakness and imbalance while walking for eight months. In this case, uh, we had used uh, neuro monitoring, opening dura, see. In these videos, actually, we have shown all steps. Opening cisterna magna and release of CSF. After CSF drainage, the cerebellum falls back, so that minimal retraction is required using silicon patty for retraction. This is neuro monitoring used uh, first uh, to localize the lower cranial nerves. Decompression of tumor. Intracapsular decompression of the tumor was done. No retractors were used in this case. The Suction tip covered with silicon tubing was used as retraction, which was placed to a silicon patty. Then fascia nerves were localized over the anterior capsule with the help of neuro monitoring. These were the lower cranial nerves. In which we got, uh, we confirmed it with the electrodes, and the patty was kept to preserve them, to keep them separate. Again, piecemeal excision was done up. There was some bleeding near the meatus, near the internal arcuate artery, which was coagulated. That is uh, separating tumors from the lower cranial nerves. Using neuro monitoring for localizing seven now. After this, retracting and uh, separating tumor from cerebellum Malala, was used for decompression of the tumor. Kitten Kari that happening? How would I know? It's a bill over now. The bullet. Working at the lower end of the tumor. Huh? Separating tumor from the brainstem. QSA is very helpful tool in this. It prevents the uh, 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 it prevents the deficit, post of deficit with minimal retraction.
separating tumor from the brain stem with 15 number plate opening dura near the internocostal meatus over the petrous bone elevating dural flap using high speed diamond drill to remove the part of tumor which is inside the meatus removing part of tumor which was inside the meatus with the help of sharp scissors we have to take care not to injure seventh nerve in this case again piece me the excision of the tumor with minimal retraction removing the tumor with sharp dissection sharp dissection of the arachnoid and uh, that is uh, separating tumor from the seven now again piece me excision of the tumor and separation from the brain stem separating tumor from the cerebellar surface you should not try to remove the tumor uh, and block so it is always advisable to take piecemeal excision uh, do piecemeal excision and use qsa that is fifth now that one is sixth now going to the dorela spina and seventh now So all three nerves are intact. We can see fifth, sixth, seventh placement of uh, muscle and pad over the meatus and placement of glue over there. Primary dura closure, and then bone was placed after this. That's the post of MRI. post of patient and this is a 35 year male who came with hearing loss for one year and tinnitus was stopped for last 6 months we can see a fairly large tumor over the right cp angle region that was free of city contrast city size actual coronal images these are mri images so craniotomy was done 
CSF was released from the system of Magna first. A pika can be seen. Pika was mobilized to prevent injury, and then lower kidney nerves were separated from the tumor. That's the correct places. Sharp dissection of arachnoid. After this capsule was opened, an internal decompression of the tumor was done. Here we have used silicon patty for retraction. This mean excision of the tumor was done intracapsular decompression over over the upper end we first we have to identify the trigeminal nerve and after elevating the dural flap removal of the tumor from the meatus is done i speed drill with continuous irrigation part of tumor going inside the meatus is removed in this case uh, seventh nerve was going anterior superiorly so we first localized it near the meatus and then we went towards the brain stem and saw that the nerve was going from brain stem towards the fifth nerve and then entering inside the meatus piecemeal excision and gallbladder decompression was done separating tumor from the brain stem that's the fission now going anterior superiorly that's the fission now attached to the brain stem then we trace fission now near the meatus it is over the anterior superior part of the cap tumor capsule that is broad white uh, fifth now over the upper end of tumor 